Chapter One of the Masserines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Christine Rutger. The Masserines by Uida. One. Mouse, said her husband to Lady Kenilworth one morning at Homburg. Do you see that large, pale woman over there, with a face like a crumpled, whitey-brown paper bag? Lady Kenilworth looked. Yes, she said impatiently. Yes, well, what? Why? Well, she rolls. She absolutely rolls, wallows. Biggest pile ever made out west. His wife looked again, with a little more attention, at the large figure of a lady, superbly clothed, who sat alone under a tree, and had that desolate air of not being in it, which betrays the unelect. Nobody discovered her. Nobody taken her up, she asked, still looking through her eyeglass. Well, old Chris a little, but Chris can't get anybody on now. He does him more harm than good. He's dead broke, his wife smiled. They must be new indeed, if they don't know that. Would they be rich enough to buy Vale Royal of Gerald? Lord, yes, rich enough to buy a hundred Jerry's and Vale's Royal. I know it for a fact from men in the city. They are astonishing. Biggest income in the United States after Vanderbilt and Pullman. American, then. No, made their stiff there, and come home to spend it. Name? Mazarin. Cotton to her if you can. There's money to be made. Hush, somebody will hear. Her lord chuckled. Does anybody know these dear souls and their kind for any other reason than the flimsy? She's looking your way. You'll have to introduce yourself, for she don't know anybody here. Make Boo fall down and break her nose in front of her. Boo was a four-year-old angel with lovely black eyes and bright yellow hair, the second child of the Kenilworth family. Accompanied by one of her nurses, she was playing near them with a big rosy bladder tied to a string. I don't think the matter so difficult that Boo's nose need be sacrificed. At what hotel is this person staying? At ours. Oh, then the thing's very easy. She nodded and dismissed him. She was on fairly good terms with her husband and would make common cause with him when it suited her, but she could not stand much of his society. She took another prolonged stare through her eyeglass at the large pale woman, so splendidly attired, sitting in solitude under the tree, then rose and walked away in her graceful and nonchalant fashion, with her knot of young men around her. She was followed by the dreary, envious gaze of the lonely lady whose countenance had been likened to a large, whitey-brown paper bag. If one could but get to know her, all the rest would come easy, thought that solitary and unhappy outsider, looking longingly after that pliant and perfect figure with its incomparable air of youth, of sovereignty, and of indifference. What was the use of having an income second only to Vanderbilt's and Pullman's? These are the things which cannot be purchased. Manor is chief amongst them. Margaret Mazarin was very lonely indeed, as she sat under the big tree watching the gay, many-colored, animated crowd amongst which there was not a creature with whom she had even a bowing acquaintance. Her lord and master, of whom she stood in much awe, was away on business in Frankfurt. Her daughter, her only living child, was in India. She was here because it was the proper place for an aspirant to society to be in at that season. But of all this multitude of royal people, titled people, pretty people, idle people, who thronged the alleys and crowded hotels, she did not know a single creature. 
She envied her own maid, who had many acquaintances with other maids and couriers and smart German sergeants and corporals of cavalry. On the previous day, she had made also a fatal mistake. She had crossed the hall of her own hotel. She had seen a fair small woman, insignificantly dressed in a deerstalker's hat and a gray ulster, who was arguing with the cashier about an item in her bill which she refused to pay. So many kreutzer for ice. Ice was always given gratis, she averred, and she occupied the whole window of the cashier's bureau as she spoke, having laid down an umbrella, a packet of newspapers, and a Macintosh on the shelf. Indignant at being made to wait by such a shabby little person, Mrs. Mazarin pushed her aside. Folks as has to count pence shouldn't come to grand hotels, she muttered, with more reason than politeness, elbowing away the shabby fair woman. The shabby fair woman turned round and stared, then laughed. The cashier and the clerk were confounded and lost their presence of mind. To the shabby fair woman, a man in plain clothes, obviously her servant, approached, and bowing low said, If you please, madame, his imperial majesty is at the door. And the lady who quarreled with a clerk, for half a kreutzer, went out of the hall and mounted besides a gentleman who was driving himself, one of those gentlemen to whom all the world doff their hats, yet who by a singular contradiction, are always guarded by policemen. The Mazarin courier, who was always hovering near his mistress in vain effort to preserve her from wrongdoing, took her aside. It's Mrs. Cecil Kersey, madame, he murmured. There's nobody so chic as Mrs. Cecil Kersey. She's hand and glove with all them royalties, pinching and screwing. Oh, yes, that she do. But then you see, madame, she can do it. You won't tell your master, Gregson, said Mrs. Mazarin in an agony of penitence. Gregson winced at the word master, but he answered sincerely, No, madame, I won't tell Mr. Mazarin, but if you think that because they're high, they're large, you're very much mistaken. Lord, ma'am, they'll pocket the maroons glaces at the table d'hôte and take the matches away from their bedrooms. But then, you see, ma'am, them as our swagger can do them things. Mrs. Cecil Kersey might steal the spoons if she had a mind to do it. Mrs. Mazarin gasped. A great name covering a multitude of small thefts appalled her simple mind. You can't mean it, Gregson, she said with breathless amaze. Indeed, ma'am, I do, said the courier, and that's why, madame, I won't ever go into service with gentlefolks. They've got such a lot to keep up, and so precious little to do it with, that they're obliged to pinch and to screw and get three sixpences out of a shilling, as I tell you, madame. Mrs. Mazarin was sad and silent. It was painful to hear one's own courier say that he would never take service with gentlefolk. One never likes to see oneself as others see us. The poignant horror of that moment as she had seen the imperial wheels flash and rotate through the flying dust was still fresh in her mind and should have prevented her from ever trusting to her own judgment or forming that judgment from mere appearances. She could still hear the echo of the mocking voice of that prince, whom Kenilworth had described as dead broke, saying to her, as he had said more than once in England, Not often do you make a mistake. Ah, no, not often. My very dear madame, not often. But when you do make one, eh bien, vous la faites belle. Mrs. Mazarin sighed heavily as she sat alone under her tree, her large hands folded on her lap. The lessons of society seemed to her of an overwhelming difficulty and intricacy. 
How could she possibly have guessed that the great Mrs. Cecil Kersey, who gave tea and bread and butter to kings and sang duets with their consorts, was a little shabby, pale-faced being in a deerstalker's hat and a worn gray ulster, who had disputed in propria persona at the cashier's office the charge of half a kreutzer on her bill for some iced water? As she was thinking these melancholy thoughts and meditating on the isolation of her greatness, a big rose-colored bladder struck her a sharp blow on the cheek, and her involuntary cry of pain and surprise, a little child's voice said pleadingly, Oh, beg you pardon, we must. The rosebud face of Lady Kenilworth's little daughter was at her knee and its prettiness and penitence touched to the quick her warm maternal heart. My dear, tis nothing at all, she said, stooping to kiss the child under its white lace coal scuttle bonnet. Boo submitted to the caress, though she longed to rub the place kissed by the stranger. It ain't hurt you, it it? she asked solicitously. Then she added in a whisper, has you dot any sweeties? For she saw that the lady was kind and thought her pretty, and in her four-year-old mind decided to utilize the situation. As it chanced, Mrs. Mazarin, being fond of sweeties herself, had some caramels in a gold bonbon box, and she pressed them, box and all, into the little hands in their tiny tan gloves. Boo's beautiful sleepy black eyes grew wide awake with pleasure. That's real dold box, she said with the fine instincts proper to one who will have her womanhood in the 20th century. And slipping it in her little bosom, she ran off with it to regain her nurse. Her mother was walking past at the moment with the King of Greece on one side of her and the Duc de Lyons on the other, Wise little Boo kept aloof with her prize, but she knew not or forgot that her mother's eyes were as the optic organs of the fly, which can see all round at once and possess 12,000 facets. Ten minutes later, when the king had gone to drink his glasses of water and Prince Gamel had gone to breakfast, Lady Kenilworth, leading her sulky and unwilling Boo by the hand, approached the tree where the lone lady sat. "'You have been too kind to my naughty little girl,' she said with her sweetest smile. "'She must not keep this bon bonheur. The contents are more than enough for a careless little trot who knocks people about with her balloon.' Mrs. Mazarin, agitated almost out of speech and sense at the sight of this radiant apparition, which spoke with such condescension to her, stammered thanks, excuses, protestations in an unintelligible hotchpot of confused phrases and let the gold box fall neglected to the ground. The dear pretty baby, she said entreatingly, oh pray, ma'am, oh pray, my lady, do let her have it such a trifle as it is. Oh, no, indeed I cannot, said Lady Kenilworth firmly, but still with her most winning smile, and she added with that graceful abruptness natural to her, do tell me, I am not quite sure, but wasn't it to you who snubbed Phyllis Courcy so delightfully at the hotel bureau yesterday morning? Mrs. Mazarin's pallid face became purple. Oh, my lady, she said faintly, I shall never get over it. Such a mistake as I made. When Mr. Mazarin comes to hear of it, he'll be ready to kill me. It was quite delightful, said Lady Kenilworth with decision. Nobody ever dares pull her up for her cheese-pairing ways. We were all enchanted. She is a detestable cat. And if she hadn't that mezzo-soprano voice, she wouldn't be petted and cosseted at Balmoral and Berlin and Bernstorff as she is. She is my aunt by marriage, but I hate her. Dear me, my lady, murmured Mrs. Mazarin, doubtful if her ears could hear aright. 
I was ready to sink into my shoes, she added, when I saw her drive away with the emperor. Lady Kenilworth laughed, a genuine laugh, which meant a great number of things, unexplained to her auditor. Then she nodded, a little pleasant, familiar nod of farewell. We shall meet again. We are at the same hotel. Thanks so much for your kindness to my naughty pet. And with the enchanting smile she used when she wanted to turn people's heads, she nodded again and went on her way, dragging the reluctant Boo away from the tree and the golden box. When she consigned her little daughter to the nurse, Boo's big black eyes looked up at her in eloquent reproach. The big black eyes said what the baby lips did not dare to say. I did what you told me. I hit the lady very cleverly, as if it was an accident. And then you wouldn't let me have the pretty box, and you called me naughty. Later in the nursery, Boo poured out her sorrows to her brother Jack, who exactly resembled herself, with his yellow hair, his big dark eyes, and his rosebud of a mouth. She told me to hit the old woman, and then she said I was naughty cause I did it, and she took away my dolt box. Never mind, Boo. Mammy always lets one in for it. What'd you tell her of the box for? Don't never tell Mammy nothing, said Jack in the superior wisdom of the masculine sex and ten months greater age. Boo sobbed afresh. I didn't tell her. She seed it through my frock, Jack kissed her. Let's find old woman, Boo, if we can get out all by ourselves and we'll ask her for the box. Boo's face cleared. And we'll tell her mommy told me to hit her. Jack's cherub face grew grave. No, we won't do that, Boo. Mammy's a bad un to split on. Jack had once overheard this said on the staircase by Lord Kenilworth, and his own experiences had convinced him of the truth of it. Mammy can be cruel nasty, he added, with great solemnity of aspect and many painful personal recollections. Mrs. Mazarin had remained under the tree digesting the water she had drunk and the memory of the blunder she had made with regard to Mrs. Kersey. She ought to have known that there is nothing more perilous than to judge by appearances, for this is a fact to be learned in kitchens as well as palaces. But she had not known it, and by not knowing it had offended a person who went on in team to Balmoral and Berlin and Bernsdorf. Half an hour later, when she slowly and sorrowfully walked back through the gardens of her hotel to go in to luncheon, two bright cherubic apparitions came toward her over the grass, walking demurely hand in hand, looking the pictures of innocent infancy. Jack and Boo, having had their twelve o'clock dinner, dedicated their united genius to the finding and besieging of the old fat woman. How's you do? said Boo very affably, whilst her brother, leaving her the initiative, pulled his sky-blue tam shanter cap off his golden curls with his best possible manner. Their victim was enchanted by their overtures and forgot that she was hungry, as these radiant little Gainsborough figures blocked her path. They were welcome to her as children, but as living portions of the peerage, they were divinities. What's your name, my pretty dears? She said, much flattered and embarrassed. You're Lord Kelsterholm, aren't you, sir? I'm Kersalm, yes, but I'm Jack, said the boy with the big black eyes and the yellow locks cut short over his forehead and falling long on his shoulders. And your dear little sister, she's Lady Beatrix Orme, said Mrs. Mazarin, who had read their names and dates of birth a score of times in her burke. She's Boo, said Jack. 
Boo herself stood with her little nose and chin in the air, and her mouth pursed contemptuously. She was ready to discharge herself of scathing ironies on the personal appearance of the questioner, but she resisted the impulse because to indulge it might endanger the restoration of the gold box. I am sure you are very fond of your pretty mamma, my dears, said Mrs. Mazarin, wondering why they thus honored her by standing in her path. Boo shut up her rosy mouth and her big eyes till they were three straight lines of cruel scorn and was silent. Jack hesitated. We're very fond of Harry, he said by way of compromise and as an allusion to the substitute. Who's Harry? said Mrs. Mazarin, surprised. The children were puzzled. Who was Harry? They were used to seeing him perpetually to playing with him, to teasing him, to getting everything they wanted out of him, but as to who he was, of that they had never thought. He's in the guards, said Jack at last, the guards that have the white tails on their heads, you know, and ride down Portland Place of a morning. He belongs to Miami, said Boo by way of additional identification. She was a lovely little fresh dewdrop of childhood, only just four years old, but she had a sparkle of malice and meaning in her tone and her eyes, of which her brother was innocent. Oh, indeed, murmured Mrs. Mazarin, more and more embarrassed, for aught she knew, it might be the habit for ladies in the great world to have an officer of the guards attached to their service. Jack looked critically at the strange lady. Don't you know people? he asked. This poor old fat woman seemed to him very forlorn and friendless. I don't know many people as yet, my lord, murmured their victim humbly. Is you a cook or nurse? said Jack, with his head on one side, surveying her with puzzled compassion. My dear little sir, cried Mrs. Mazarin, horrified. Why, gracious me, I'm a lady. Jack burst out laughing. Oh, no, isn't, he said decidedly. Ladies don't say these ladies. Boo twitched his hand to remind him of the ultimate object of their mission. Mrs. Mazarin had never more cruelly felt how utterly she was nobody at her first drawing room than she felt it now under the merciless eyes of these chicks. Boo pulled Jack's sleeve. She won't give us nothing else if oo tease her so, she whispered in his rosy ear. Jack shook her off. Perhaps we're rude, he said remorsefully to his victim. We're sorry if we've vexed oo. And does oo want the little box Mammy gave back to oo? Said Bo desperately, perceiving that her brother would never attack this main question. Over the plain, broad, flat face of the poor plebeian there passed a gleam of intelligence and a shadow of disappointment. It was only for the sake of the golden box that these little angels had smilingly blocked her road. She brought out the bonbonniere at once from her pocket. Pray take it and keep it, my little lady, she said to Boo, who required no second bidding. And after a moment's hesitation, Mrs. Mazarin took out of her purse a new Napoleon. Would you please, my lord, she murmured, pushing the bright coin into Jack's fingers. Jack colored. He was tempted to take the money. He had spent his last money two days before, and then Napoleon would buy a little cannon for which his heart pined. A real cannon which would load with real little shells but something indefinite in his mind frank from taking a stranger's money. He put his hands behind his back. Thanks very much, he said resolutely, but please no, I'd rather not. She pressed it on him warmly, but he was obstinate. No, thanks, he said twice. Oo's very kind. He added courteously, but I don't know oo, and I'd rather not. And he adhered to his refusal. He could not have put his sentiments into words, but he had a temper which his sister had not. Oo's very kind, 
he said again to soften his refusal. Who's very kind, repeated Boo sarcastically with a little grin and a mocking curtsy. And Jack's a great big ghost. Ta-ta. She pulled her brother away, being afraid of the arrival of governess, nurse, or somebody who might yet again snatch the gold box away from her. Why didn't you take the money, Jack? She said as they ran hand in hand down the path. I don't know, said Jack truthfully. Something inside me told me not. Their forsaken admirer looked after them wistfully. Fine feathers don't make a fine bird of me, she thought sorrowfully. Even those babies see I ain't a lady. I always told William as how it wouldn't be no use. I dare say in time they'll come to us for sake of what they'll get, but they won't never think us aught except the rinsons of the biler. Lord Kenilworth had been looking idly out of a window of the hotel across the evergreens after his breakfast of brandy and seltzer and had seen the little scene in the garden and chuckled as he saw. Shrewd little beggars getting things out of the fat old woman, he thought with approval. How like they look to their mother, and what a blessing it is that there's never any doubts as to the maternity of anybody. He, although not a student of Burke, like Mrs. Mazarin, had opened that majestic volume once on a rainy day in the library of a country house, and had looked at his own family record in it, and had seen underneath his own title and his father's the names of four little children. Sons. 1. John Cecil Victor, Lord Kersterholm. 2. Gerald George. 3. Francis Lionel Desmond Edward. Daughter. Beatrix Cecily. Dear little duckies, he had murmured, biting a cigarette. Sweet little babes, precious little puppets, damn em, the whole blooming lot. He had been quite alone when he had said this. For a man who drank so much as he did, he was always remarkably discreet. What he drank did not make him garrulous. It made him suspicious and mute. No one had ever known him allow a word to escape his lips, which he would, being sober, have regretted to have said. How many abstemious persons amongst us can boast as much? End of chapter 1 Section 2 of Matarines This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Masterines by Ouida. Chapter 2 It was four o'clock on a misty and dark afternoon in the month of March in London. The reception rooms of a fine house facing Grosvenor Gate were all lighted by the last modern perfection of rose-shaded electricity. There were rooms of unusually admirable proportions and size for the city in which they were situated, and were decorated and filled with all that modern resources, both in art and in wealth, can obtain. Harrendon House, as it was called, had been designed for a rich and eccentric duke of that name, and occupied by him for a few years, at the end of which time he had tired of it, had carried all its treasures elsewhere, and put it up for sale. It had remained unsold and unlet for a very long period, the price asked being too large even for millionaires. At last, in the autumn of the previous year, it had been taken by a person who was much more than a millionaire, though he had been born in a workhouse and had begun life as a cowboy. The great mansion had nothing whatever of the parvenu about it, except its new owner. Its interior had been arranged in perfect taste by an unerring master's hand. The square hall had ancient Italian tapestries, Italian marbles, Italian mosaics, all of genuine age and extreme beauty, whilst from its domed cupola a mellowed light streamed down through painted glass of the 15th century, taken from the private chapel of a Flemish castle. The two-winged staircase, broad and massive, 
had balustrades of oak which had once been the choir railings of a cathedral in Corinthia. The silver lamps which hung above these stairs had once illuminated religious services in the Kremlin, and above the central balustrade leaned, lovely as adolescence, a nude youth with a hawk on his wrist, the work of Clodion. The rest of the mansion was in the same proportions and perfection. No false note jarred on its harmonies. No doubtful thing intruded a coarse or common chord. The household were not pushed away into dark cell-like corners, but had comfortable and airy sleeping chambers. It was a palace fit for a queen of loves. It was a home made for a young Caesar in the full flush of his dreams of Cleopatra. And it belonged actually to William Masserine, late of Kerosene City, North Dakota, USA. Miner, miller, meat salesman, cattle exporter, railway contractor, owner of gambling saloons and opium dens for the heathen Chinese, and one of the richest and hardiest-headed men in either hemisphere. Nothing was wanting which money could buy. Tapestries, ivories, marbles, bronzes, porcelains, potteries, orchids, palms, roses, silks, satins and velvets were all there in profusion. Powdered lackeys lolled in the anteroom. Dignified men in black stole noiselessly over carpets, soft and elastic as moss. In the tea room, the china was Sevres of 1770, and the water boiled in what had once been a gold water vase of Leo X. In the delicious little oval boudoir, the walls were entirely covered with old sax plates and sax shepherds and shepherdesses made groups in all the corners, while a watteau formed the ceiling. And yet, amidst these gay and smiling porcelain people of Meissen, who were a century and a half old, and yet kept the roses on their cheeks and the laugh on their lips, Margaret Masserine, the mistress of it all, sat in solitary state and melancholy meditation, a heavy hopelessness staring in her pale grey eyes, a dreary dejection expressed in the loose clasp of her fat hands folded on her knee, the fingers now and then beating a nervous tattoo. What use was it to have the most beautiful dwelling house in all London if no one ever beheld its beauties from one week's end to another? What use was it to have a regiment of polished and disdainful servants if there were no visitors of rank for them to receive? Many things are hard in this world, but nothing is harder than to be ready to prostrate yourself and be forbidden to do it, to be ready to eat the bitter pastry which is called humble pie, and yet find no table at which so much even as this will be offered you. The great world did not affront them. It did worse. It did not seem to know they existed. Take a big townhouse. Buy a big country place. Ask people. The rest will all follow of itself had said their counsellor and confidant at the baths of Homburg. They had bought the townhouse and the country place, but as yet they had found no people to invite to either of them, and not a soul as yet, called at the magnificent mansion by Gloucester Gate, although for fifteen days and more its porter had sat behind open gates, gates of bronze and gold with a masserine arms, which the Herald's College had lately furnished, emblazoned above on their scrollwork, awaiting the coronet, which a grateful nation and a benign sovereign would no doubt, ere many years should have passed, added to them. People, of course, there were by hundreds and thousands who would have been only too glad to be bidden to their doors, but they were people of that common clay with which the Massarines had finished for ever and I. There were many families, rich, if not as rich as themselves, and living in splendour on Clapham Common, near Epping Forest, or out by Sydenham and Dulwich, who would have willingly been intimate with Mrs. Masserine, as their husbands were with hers in the city. She would have been content with their fine houses, their good dinners, their solid wealth, their cordial company. She would have been much more at ease in their suburban villas, amidst their homelier comforts, hearing and sharing their candid boastfulness of their rise in life. But these were not the acquaintances which her husband desired. 
He did not want commerce, however enriched. He wanted the great world, or what now represents it, the smart world. And he intended to have that, or none. And Lady Kenilworth, their Hamburg friend, had written a tiny three-cornered note ten days before, with a mouse in silver on its paper, which said, I am in town, and I'm coming to see you. Jack and Boo send love. And on this familiar epistle, they had built up an eyeful tower of prodigious hope and expectation. But ten days and more had passed, and their correspondent had not yet fulfilled her promise. Therefore, amidst all the beauty and splendour of it, the mistress of the house sat, pale, sullen, despondent, melancholy. She had sat thus for fifteen days, ever since Parliament had met, and it was all in vain, in vain. The gold urn bubbled, the shepherd smiled, the orchids bloomed, the men in black and the men in powder waited in vain, and the splendid and spacious mansion warmed itself, lighted itself, perfumed itself in vain. Nobody came. She had dropped all her old friends, and the new ones were faithless and few. She had been forced by her lord and master to seize her acquaintance with the wives of aldermen and city magnates and magistrates, good-natured wealthy women who had been willing to make her one of themselves, and the desired successors, the women of the world, were only conspicuous by their absence. She was dressed admirably by a great authority on clothes, but the dull Venetian red, embroidered with gold thread and slashed with tawny colour, was suited to a Vittoria Acrombona or a Lucretia Borgia, and did not suit at all the large, loose form and the pallid, insignificant features of their present wearer. When the head cutter of the great Paris house, which had turned out that magnificent gown, had ventured to suggest to its chief that such a tie was thrown away on such a face and figure as these, that oracle had answered with withering contempt. Rien ne va aux gens de leur espèce, excepté le tablier d'ouvrière, et le tablier on ne veut plus porter. His scorn was unutterable for all gens de leur espèce. But he did what he could for them. He let them have exquisite attire and sent them very long bills. It was not his fault that they never knew how to wear their clothes. He could not teach them that secret, which only comes by the magic of nature and breeding. The present wearer of his beautiful Venetian red and gold gown was laced in until she could scarcely breathe. Her fat hands were covered with beautiful rings. Her grey hair had been washed with gold-coloured dye. Her broad big feet, which had stood so many years before cooking stoves and washtubs, were encased in Venetian red hose of silk and black satin shoes with gold buckles. The maid had assured her that she looked like a picture, but she felt like a guy, and was made nervous by the Medusa-like gaze of the men in black who occasionally flitted across her boudoir to attend to a lamp, contract the valve of the calorifère, or lay the afternoon papers, cut and aired by her chair. If only they wouldn't look at me so, she thought piteously. What must they think of her sitting alone like this, day after day, week after week, when the dreary two hours' drive in the park was over, behind the high-stepping horses, which were the envy of all beholders, but to their owners seemed strange, terrible, and dangerous creatures. London was full, not with a suffocating fullness, indeed, of July, but with the comparative animation which comes into the street with the meeting of Parliament. Not a soul had passed those gates as yet, at least not one as human souls had of late become classified in the estimation of the dwellers within them. The beautiful rooms seemed to yawn like persons whose mind and whose time are vacant. The men in black and the men in powder yawned also, and bore upon their faces the visible expression of that depression and discontent which were in their bosoms at the sense, ever increasing in them, that every additional day in the house of people whom nobody knew robbed them of caste, injured their prestige, and ruined their future. The mistress of the palace only did not yawn because she was too agitated, too nervous and disappointed and unhappy to be capable of such a minor suffering, a ennui, 
She was not dull because she was strung up to a high state of anxious expectation, gradually subsiding as day after day went on to a complete despair. They had done all that could be done in the way of getting into society. They had neglected no means, shunned no humiliation, spared no expense, refused no subscription, avoided no insult which could possibly, directly or indirectly, have helped them to enter its charmed circle, and yet nothing had succeeded. Nobody came, nobody at least out of that mystic and magical sphere into which they pined and slaved to force or to insinuate themselves, not one of those, the dust of whose feet they were ready to kiss, would come up the staircase under the smiling gaze of Clodion's young falconer. But on this second day of the month of March, when the clock showed five of the afternoon, there was a slight movement, perceptible in the rooms of which the suite was visible from the door of the boudoir. The groom of the chambers, a slender, solemn, erect personage, by name Winter, came forward with a shade of genuine respect, for the first time shown in his expression and demeanour. Lady Kenilworth asks if you receive, madam. Why, Lord, man, ain't I in a purpose? said his mistress in her agitation and surprise reverting to her natural vernacular, while she rose in vast excitement and unspeakable trepidation, and tumbled against a stool in her nervousness. I was sure that I should find you at home, so I followed on the heels of your man, said a sweet, silvery, impertinent voice, as the fair young mother of Jack and Boo entered the boudoir, looking at everything about her in a bird-like way and with an eyeglass which she did not want lifted to the bridge of her small, delicate nose. "'So kind, so kind, so honoured, murmured Mrs. Masserine, with bewilderment and enthusiasm, her pale, flaccid cheeks warm with pleasure, and her voice tremulous with timidity. "'Not at all,' murmured Lady Kenilworth, absently and vaguely, occupied with her inspection of the objects around her. She seated herself on a low chair, and let her glance wander over the walls, the ceiling, the mice and china, the Watteau ceiling, and her hostess's gown. "'How's your dear little children, ma'am?' said Mrs. Masserine humbly. "'Oh, they're all right, thanks,' said their mother carelessly, her head thrown back as she gazed up at the Watto. "'It seems very well done,' she said at last. "'Who did it for you? The Bond Street people?' "'Did what?' said her hostess, falteringly drawing in her breath with a sudden little gasp to prevent herself from saying, My lady. The whole thing, explained her guest, pointing with the handle of her eyeglass towards the vista of the rooms. The, the house, said Mrs. Masserine hesitatingly, still not understanding. We bought it, that is, Mr. Masserine bought it, and Prince Christophe of Karstein was so good as to see to the decorations and the furniture. The Duke had left a many fixtures. Prin and Chris, repeated Lady Kenilworth, hearing imperfectly through indifference to the subject and attention to the old sacks around her. I never heard of them. Are they a London firm? Prince Christophe of Karstein, repeated Mrs. Masserine, distressed to find the name misunderstood. He is a great friend of ours. I think your ladyship saw him with us in Paris last autumn. Lady Kenilworth opened wide her pretty, innocent, impertinent, forget-me-not coloured eyes. What? Old Chris? Chris Carr? Did he do it all for you? Oh, I must run about and look at it all if he did, she said, as she jumped from her seat, and without any premise or permission, began a tour of the rooms, sweeping swiftly from one thing to another, lingering momentarily here and there, agile and restless as a squirrel, yet soft in movement as a swan. She did run about, flitting from one room to another, studying, appraising, censuring, admiring, all in a rapid and cursory way. But with that familiarity with what she saw, and that accurate eye for what was good in it, which the mistress of all these excellent and beautiful things would live to the end of her years without acquiring. She put up her eyeglass at the pictures, fingered the tapestries, turned the porcelains upside down to see their marks, flitted from one thing to another, view every orchid, an odontoglossum by its seven-league name, and only look disapproval before a mantegna, exceedingly archaic and black, and a Pietro di Cortona ceiling which seemed to her florid and doubtful. 
She went from reception rooms to library, dining room, conservatories, with drawing rooms, morning rooms, studies, bedchambers, galleries, bathrooms, as swift as a swallow and as keen of glance as a falcon, touching a stuff, eyeing a bit of china, taking up a bibelot, with just the same pretty pecking action as a chaffinch has in an orchard, or a pigeon in a bean field. Everything was really admirable and genuine. All the while she paid not the slightest attention to the owner of the house, who followed her anxiously and humbly, not daring to ask a question, and panting in her tight corset at the speed of her going, but basking in the scent of her visitor's rank as a cat basks in the light and warmth of a coal fire and a fur-lined basket. Not a syllable did Lady Kenilworth deign to cast to her in her breathless scamper through the house. She had some solid knowledge of value in matters of art, and she begrudged these delicious things to the woman with the face like a large unbaked loaf and the fat big hands, as her four-year-old boo had begrudged the gold box. Really, they say there is a providence above us, but I can't think there is when I am pestered to death by bills and this creature owns Harrendon House, she thought, with those doubts as to the existence of a deity which always assail people, when deity is, as it were, in the betting against them. She had read an article that morning by Jules Simon in which he argued that if the anarchists could be only persuaded to believe in a future life, they would turn their bombs into bottles of kid reviver and cheerfully black the boots of the bourgeoisie. But she felt herself that there was something utterly wrong in a scheme of creation which could bestow Harrington House on a Margaret Masserine and in a divine judge who could look on at such discrepancies of property without disapproval. She scarcely said a syllable in her breathless progress over the building, although the unhappy mistress of Harrington House pined in trembling for her verdict, as a poor captain of a company longs for a word from some great general inspecting his quarters. But when she had finished her tour of inspection and consented to take a cup of tea and a caviar biscuit in the tea room, where the Leo the Tenth Urn was purring, and Mr. Winter and two of his subordinates were looking on in benign condescension. She said briskly, Eh bien, il ne vous a pas volé. Mrs. Masserine had not the remote idea what she meant, but smiled vaguely and anxiously, hoping the phrase meant praise. He's given you the value of your money, Lady Kenilworth explained. It's the finest house in London, and nearly everything in it is good. The Mantegna is rubbish, as I told you, and if I had been asked, I shouldn't have put up that Pietro di Cortona. What did Chris make you pay for it? I don't know, I'm sure, ma'am, replied the mistress of the Mantegna meekly. William, Mr. Masserine never tells me the figure of anything. The Cortona was painted last year in the Avenue de Villiers, I suspect, continued Lady Kenilworth. All the rest, or nearly all, is admirable. It's a very grand house, replied its mistress meekly, but it's mighty lonesome like to be in it, with no company. If all the great folks you promised, my lady. I never promised, I never do promise, said her visitor sharply. I can't take people by their petticoats and coat tails and drag them up your stairs. You must get yourself known for something, then they'll come. What? Oh, I have no idea. Something. A cook, or a wine, or a surprise. People like surprises under their dinner napkins, or a specialty, any specialty. I knew a person who entirely got into society by white hairs, civet de lèvres, you know, but white, Siberian. Mrs. Masserine gasped. She had a feeling, then, she was being talked to in Sanskrit or Welsh and expected to understand it. Why white hairs should be better than brown hairs, she could not imagine. Nobody ate the fur. But you was so good as to say when we were in Paris, ma'am. Never remind me of anything I said. I can't endure it. I believe you want to get in the swim, don't you? Please, I don't quite understand, ma'am. A visitor was silently finishing nibbling at a caviar biscuit and reflecting what a goose she had been to go to Egypt instead of utilising this masserine vein. She must certainly, she thought, do all she could for these people. You're Catholic, aren't you? she said abruptly. The horror of an Ulster woman spread itself over the flaccid and pallid clay in which the features of her hostess were moulded. Oh no, my lady, 
We were never Romans, she said, so aghast that she was carried out of herself into the phraseology of her earlier years. We were never Romans. How could you think it of us? It would be better for you if you were, said Lady Kenilworth, unfeelingly and irreverently. Catholics are chic, and then all the great Catholic families push a convert unanimously. They'd get a sweep to all the best houses if he only went often enough to the oratory. We've always been loyal people, murmured Mrs. Masserine piteously. Always orange, as orange could be. Loyalty is nothing, said Lady Kenilworth contemptuously, eyeing the beautiful gold urn with the envious appreciation of a dealer's glance. Loyalty don't take the cake. Nobody is afraid of it. It's all fear now that we go by. And gain, she was about to add, but checked the words and uttered. I wish you were a Catholic, she said instead. It would make everything so much smoother for you. I suppose you couldn't change. They'd make it very easy for you. Margaret Masserine gasped. Life had unfolded many possibilities to her, of which she had never dreamed, but never such a possibility as this. Couldn't you? said her guest sharply. After all, it's nothing to do. The Archbishop would see to it all for you. They make it very easy where there is plenty of money. I don't think I could, my lady. It would be eternal punishment for me in the world to come, said Mrs. Masserine faintly whilst her groom of the chambers restrained a violent inclination to box her on the ears for the vulgarity of her last two words. He had been long trained in the necessary art of banishing from his countenance every ray of expression, every shadow of indication that he overheard what was said around him. But nature for once prevailed over training. Deep and unutterable disgust was spoken on his bland yet austere features. Eternal punishment. Did the creature think that Harrington House was a Methody chapel? As for Lady Kenilworth, she went into a long and joyous peal of laughter, laughed till the tears brimmed over in her pretty, ingenious, turquoise-coloured eyes. Oh, my good woman, she said as soon as she could speak, good-humouredly and contemptuously. You don't mean to say that you believe in eternal punishment? What is the use of getting old Chris to furnish for you and ask me to show you the way about if you weigh yourself down with such an old-fashioned, funny packful of antiquated ideas as that? You must not say such things, really. You will never get on amongst us if you do. The countenance of Margaret Masserine grew piteous to behold. She was a feeble woman, but obstinate. She was ready to sell her soul to get on, but the ghastly terrors inculcated to her in her childhood were too strongly embedded in her timid and apprehensive nature to leave her a free agent. Anything else, ma'am, anything else, she murmured wretchedly. But not Romanism, not papistry. You don't know what it means to me. You don't, indeed. Lady Kenilworth shrugged her shoulders and got up from the tea table. I always said, she observed slightingly, that the orange people were the real difficulty in Ireland. There would never have been any trouble without them. But you're not a papist yourself, my lady, asked Mrs. Masserine with trembling accents. Oh, I? No, said the pretty young woman, with the same contemptuous and indifferent tone. We can't change. We must stick to the mast, fall with the colours, die in the breach, all that kind of thing. We can't turn and twist about. But you new people can, and you are geese if you don't. You want to get in the swim? Well, if you're wise, you'll take the first swimming belt that you can get. But do just as you like. It doesn't matter to me. I'm afraid I must go now. I have half a hundred things to do. She glanced at the watch in her bracelet and drew up her feather boa to her throat. Tears rose to the pale grey eyes of her hostess. Pray don't be offended with me, my lady, she said timidly. I hoped, I thought, perhaps you'd be so very kind and condescending as to tell me what to do. Things bewilder me and nobody comes. Couldn't you spare me a minute more in the boudoir yonder where these men won't hear us? She added in a whisper. She could not emulate her guest's patrician indifference to the presence of the men in black. It seemed to her quite frightful to discuss religious and social matters beneath the stony glare of Mr. Winter and his colleagues. But Lady Kenilworth could not share or indulge such sentiments nor would she consent to take any such precautions. She seated herself where she had been before by the tea-table, 
her eyes always fascinated by the Lee of the Tenth Urn. She took a bonbon and nibbled it prettily, as a squirrel may nibble a filbert. Tell me what you want, she said bluntly. She was often blunt, and she was always graceful. Margaret Massering glanced uneasily at Winter and his subordinates, and wished that she could have dared to order them out of earshot, as she would have done with a red-armed and red-haired maid of all work, who had marked her first stage on the steep slopes of gentility. You told us at Homburg, my lady, she began timidly. Don't say my lady, whatever you do. I beg your pardon. My, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, I beg pardon. You were so good as to tell William and me at the baths that you would help us to get on in London if we took a big house and bought that place in Walshire. We've done both them things, but we don't get on. Nobody comes nigh us here or nor there. She heaved a heartbroken sigh which lifted and depressed the gold embroideries on her ample bosom. Lady Kenilworth smiled and sympathetically. What can you expect, my good woman, she murmured. People don't call on people whom they don't know, and you don't know anybody except my husband and old Chris and myself. It was only too true, and Mrs. Masserine sighed. But I thought as how you le- as how you would be so very, very good as to... I am not a bear leader, said Lady Kenilworth with hauteur. Mrs. Masserine was as helpless and as flurried as a fish landing on a grassy bank with a barbed hook through its gills. There was a long, and to her, torturing silence. The water hissed, gently, like a purring cat, in the vase of Leo X, and Mouse Kenilworth looked at it as a woman of Egypt may have gazed at the statue of Pasht. It seemed a visible symbol of the immense wealth of these Masserine people, of all the advantages which she herself might derive therefrom, of the unwisdom of allowing their tutelage to lapse into other hands than theirs. If she did not launch them on the tide of fashion, others would do so, and others would gain by it all that she would lose by not doing it. She was a woman well-born and well-bred, and proud by temperament and by habit, and the part she was moved to play was disagreeable to her, even odious, but it was yet one which in a way allured her, which drew her by her necessities against her will, and the golden water vase seemed to say to her with a voice of a deity, gold is the only power left in life. She herself commanded all other charms and sorceries, but she did not command that. She was silent some moments while the pale eyes of her hostess watched her piteously and pleadingly. She felt she had made a mistake, but she did not know what it was nor how to rectify it. I beg pardon, ma'am, she said humbly. I understood you to say, as how you would introduce me to your family and friends in town and in the country. I didn't mean any offence. Indeed, indeed, I didn't. And none is taken, said Lady Kenilworth graciously, thinking to herself. One must suit oneself to one's company. That's how they talk, I believe, in the servants' hall, where she ought to be. Aloud, she continued, You see, whatever one says at Homburg, or indeed anywhere at all out of England, does not count in England. That is understood everywhere by everybody. Really, murmured Mrs. Masserine, confused and crestfallen, for it has been on the faith of this fair lady's promises and predictions in the past summer that Harrington House and Vale Royal had been purchased. Of course, said Lady Kenilworth rather tartly, still looking at the gold water vase, which exercised a strange fascination over her, as if it were a fetish, which she was compelled, volens volens, to worship. Only imagine what a mob we should have around us at home, if every one we were civil to in Nice and Florence and Homburg and Ostend and all the other places could take us seriously and expect to be invited by us here. It would be frightful. Margaret Masserine sighed. Existence seemed to her complicated and difficult to an extent which she could never have credited in the days when she had carried her milking pails to and from the rich grass meadows of her old home in Ulster. In those remote and simple days, I'll be glad to see you, meant. I shall be glad. And when you ate out at your neighbour's potato bowl, your neighbour had a natural right to eat in return out of yours, a right never disavowed. 
that in the great world these rules of veracity and reciprocity seemed unknown. Lady Kenilworth sat lost in thoughts and moments, playing with the ends of her feather boa and thinking whether the game were worth the candle. It would be such a dreadful ball. Then there came before her mind's eye the sum total of many unpaid bills and the vision of that infinite sweetness which lies in renewed and unlimited credit. You want to be lancé, she said at last, in her brusque yet graceful manner, suddenly, as she withdrew her gaze from the tea table. Well, sometimes to succeed socially is very easy, and sometimes it is very difficult. For new people, very difficult. Society is always uncertain. It acts on no fixed principles. It keeps out A, it lets in B, and couldn't possibly say why it does either. Your money alone won't help you. There are such swarms of rich persons, and everybody who gets rich wants the same thing. You are, I believe, enormously rich, but there are a good many enormously rich. The world is in a queer state. Ninety out of a hundred have nothing but debts. The other ten are gorged on money. Gorged. It is very queer. Something is wrong. The sense of proportion has gone out of life altogether. You want, you say, to know people. Well, I can let you see them. You can come and meet them at my house. But I can't make them take you up if they won't do it. Mrs. Masserine sighed. She dared not say so, but she thought, of what use had been all the sums flung away at this lovely lady's bidding in the previous autumn. It is no use to waste time on the idiot, reflected her visitor. She don't understand a word one says. And she thinks they can buy society as if it were a penny bun. Old Billy's sharper. I wonder he had not the sense to divorce her in the state or wherever they come from. Where's your man? she said impatiently. William's in the city, my lady, answered Mrs. Masserine proudly. William, ma'am, is very much thought of in the city. He's on lots of things, I suppose. After some moments puzzled reflection, his wife replied. Meaning boards, ma'am? Yes, he is. They seem they can't do without him. William had always a wonderful head for business. Ah, said Lady Kenilworth, he must put cocky on some good things. My husband, you know, everything is done by companies nowadays. Even the Derby favourite is owned by a syndicate. Tell him to put Lord Kenilworth on all his good things, and not to mind if he's unpunctual. Lord Kenilworth never can understand why half past two isn't the same hour as twelve. That won't do in business, my lady, said Mrs. Masserine boldly, for here she was sure of her ground. Five minutes late. Writes ruined sometimes. Does it indeed? I suppose that's what makes it so fetching. I'm sure it would do cock the worlds of good. Wake him up. Give him things to think of. Is my lord a business man, ma'am? said Mrs. Masserine, with great doubt in her tone. Oh, they all are now, you know. Cock is very lazy, but he's very clever. My lord don't want to be clever. He'll be duke, said Mrs. Masserine, intending no sarcasm. I can't think, ma'am as your noble husband would like to toil and moil in the city. No, no, but to be on things, you know, answered her visitor vaguely. You send Mr. Masserine to me and we'll talk about it. He mustn't mind if Lord Kenilworth only gives his name and never shows. Mrs. Masserine's was a slow brain, and a dull one. But she was not really stupid. In some matters she was shrewd, and she began dimly to perceive what was expected of her and William and what quid pro quo would be demanded by this lovely lady who had the keys of society if she used any of these keys in her favour. She had had glimmerings of this before, but it had never presented itself before her so clearly as now. She had sense enough, however, to keep the discovery to herself. I'll tell Mr. Masserine, ma'am, she said meekly, and I know he'll be very proud to wait on you. Shall it be tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow, before luncheon. About half past twelve. I won't forget, ma'am. And I'll come and dine with you next week. I'll bring some people. My sisters. They won't mind. Carrie certainly won't. Lady Wisbeach, you know. What day? Oh, I don't know. I must go home and look at my book. I think there is something of no importance I can throw over next week. And how many will be there at dinner, ma'am? Asked Mrs. Masserine, feeling hot all over, as if she would have expressed it at the prospect of this banquet. Oh, well, I can't say. I'll see who will come. You have a very good chef, haven't you? If not, I could get you Van Holstein's. 
You know, when people are well fed once, they'll come to be fed again, and they tell others. Just like fowls, murmured Mrs. Masserine, her mind reverting to the poultry yard of her youth, with the hens running over and upsetting each other in their haste to get to the meal pan. She was sensible of an awakening interest in a warmer tinge in the manner of her protectress, since the subject of good things in the city had been broached. You mustn't want to go too fast at once, continued that fair lady. It's like cycling. You'll wobble about and get a good many falls at first. But you've begun well. You've a beautiful house, and you have my cousin's place in the heart of her hunting county. Several of the county people have asked me about the purchaser of Vale Royal, and I've always said something nice about you both. You know, I have been four months on the Nile, and one sees the whole world there. Such a climate as this is to return to after Egypt. Why weren't you in Egypt? Oh, I forgot. Your man's member for Limehouse, isn't he? I wonder the party hasn't done more for you. But you see, money alone, unless there is tact, well, I dare say, I can't make you understand if I talk till doomsday. I have two or three people the night after tomorrow. I will send you a card. And by the way, you had better tell Chris to call on me if he be in town. I will talk over with him what we can do for you. Mr. Winter, standing within earshot at a discreet distance, to all appearance as bereft of sight and hearing and impervious as a statue, to all sight and sound, lost not a syllable uttered by Lady Kenilworth, and approved of it all. It is clever of her, he thought, to be ready to go halves in the spoils with that old prince. Meet him halfway, she does. Mighty clever, that. She'll cut his claws and draw his teeth. She's a lady of the right sort, she is. If she weren't quite so clever, she'd have him jealous of him and have made an enemy of him at the onset. His employer, meantime, was exhausting her somewhat limited vocabulary in agitated thanks and protestations of undying gratitude, which Lady Kenilworth nipped in the bud by giving her two fingers chillily and hurrying away, her farewell glance being cast at the gold water vase. Chris, a house decorator, and I a tout. How very dreadful it is. But hard times make strange trades, thought the young mother of Jack and Boo, as she sank down on the soft seat of a little brougham, and was borne swiftly away to other houses, as the lamps began to shine <coughs> through the foggy evening air. End of section two. Read by Bertha Mason. 2023. Chapter 3 of the Mazarines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sarah Hill. The Mazarines by Ouida. Chapter 3. Mrs. Mazarine had conducted her visitor with great obsequiousness to the head of the staircase, and would have gone down the stairs with her had not Lady Kenilworth prevented such a demonstration. "'My dear creature, pray don't. "'One only does that for royalty,' she had said, "'while a repressed grin was visible "'through the impassive masks of all of the footmen's faces, "'where they stood above and below. "'However is one to know what's right and what's wrong?' "'thought the mistress of Harrenden House, "'resting her hands for a moment upon the carved rail of the balustrade "'and eyeing nervously the naked boy of Clodion.' That statue was very terrible to her. To set a lad without any scrap of clothes on a beckoning with a bird to everybody as come upstairs? I can't think as it's decent or proper, she said constantly to her husband. But a master hand had indicated the top of the staircase as the proper place for that nude young falconer to stand. In all his mingled realism and idealization, Therefore, no one could be bold enough to move him elsewhere. And he leaned airily against the old choir carving, and wore a fawn-like smile as he tossed his hawk above his head and stretched his hand outward as though to beckon the crowds, which would not come up that silent stair. But the crowds were coming now, for where Lady Kenilworth pointed, the world would surely follow, and the heart of simple Margaret Mazarine, late Margaret Hogan, Dairymaid of Kilrathy, County Down, beat high in her breast under the red and gold of her gorgeous bodice. 
It's mighty hard work being a lady, she thought, but since I've got to be one, I'd like to go the whole hog and show Kathleen when she comes back to us that we are as smart, gentle folks as any of her friends. When Mr. Mazarin came home to dinner that evening, his wife felt that she had great news to give him. I think she'll take us up, William, she said, almost under her breath, but I think she'll want a lot of palm grease. She was a simple woman of coarse views and expressions. Whatever my lady wants, she shall have, reflected her husband, but his heavy brows frowned, for he was a man who did not like even the wife of his bosom to see into his intentions, and if he were going to buy his way into that society where his shooting irons were of no use to him, he did not care for even the old ooman to know it. But the next day, at one o'clock precisely, he presented himself at the house in Stanhope Street, which the Kenilworths honored by residence. He looked like an eminently respectable grazier, or cheesemonger clothed in the best that money could buy. A hat, which was oppressively lustrous and new, was carried in his hand with a pair of new gloves. In his shirt sleeves and butcher boots, with a brace of revolvers in his belt, as he had sworn at his plate layers or his diggers or his puddlers in the hard bright light of the Dakotan sun. He had been a formidable and manly figure in keeping with the giant rocks and the seething streams and the rough boulder-strewn roads of the country round him. But standing in the hall of a London house, clad in London clothes, made by the first tailors, he looked clumsy and absurd, and he knew it. He was a stoiled, sensible, and very bold man. When a railway train in the early days of the Pacific Road had been held up by a native gang, those desperate robbers had found more than their match in him. And the whole convoy, with the million-odd dollars he was carrying in his breast pocket, had been saved by his own ready and pitiless courage. But as he mounted the staircase in Stanhope Street, his knees shook and his tongue clove to his teeth he felt what actors describe as stage fright. Lady Kenilworth had deigned to know him at Homburg, had put him in the way of buying Vale Royale of her cousin Roxhall, had dined more than once at his expense with a noisy gay party who scarcely said good day to him, and likewise at his expense had picnicked in the woods and drunk much more of the best Rhinish wines than were good for them, and on a smooth stretch of green sward under the pines, that lovely lady had imitated the dancing of Nini Patin La of the Eden Theatre, until the few last sad gray hairs upon his head had stood erect in scandalized amazement. She had also dined and supped at his expense several times with various friends of her own in Paris, in the November following on the July at Homburg, and she had let him take boxes for her at the operas and theatres, and had generally used his purse without seeming to see that it was open for her. But he had exchanged very few words with her, though he had already through her inspiration spent a good deal of money, and his stout squat figure shook like a leaf as he was ushered into her presence, while her two blunums flew at his trousers with a fugue of barks. What a dazzling vision she was, as she smiled on him across the flower-filled and perfumed space which divided them. She had smiled like that when she had first spoken to him of buying Val Royale in the early days of his acquaintance with her. William Mazarin was no fool, and he knew that he would have to pay its full price for that enchanting smile. But though he was not its dupe, he was its victim. He was nervous as he had never been when he had heard the order, Hands up! in the solitude of a mountain gorge at midnight amongst the Rockies. The smile was encouraging, but the rest of the attitude was serene, almost severe, as pure as a virgin in a triptych of Vandergos. She was at work on some embroidery. She had Boo on a stool at her feet. She looked an exquisite picture of youthful maternity. He could scarcely believe that he had seen her cutting those mad capers on the sward of the German forest, or heard her scream with laughter at the supper table of Bignon's. Boo got up on her little black stockinged legs, ran to him, and looked at him from under her golden cloud of hair. What has oo brought me? 
said the true child of modernity. Do you remember the sweeties at the baths, my lovely darling? stammered Mr. Mazarine, immensely touched and gratified at the child's recollection of him, and full of remorse that he had not rifled Regent Street. Boo always remembers her friends, said Boo's mother very pleasantly, as she delivered him from the Blanums and made him seat himself beside her. All the fat man's come, as was at Umbo, but he didn't bring nothing for us, said Boo to Jack at the nursery dinner ten minutes later. Mammy's going to get something cause she was so civil to him. Ooh, are always thinking of getting, Boo, said Jack with his rosy mouth full of mashed potato. What's the ooze of people's else, said his sister solemnly picking up the roast mutton which her nurse had cut up into little dice on her plate. Jack pondered a while upon this question. I likes peoples cause I like em, he replied at last. You're a boy, returned his sister with withering contempt. A week later, Boo's mother, with a very gay and hilarious round dozen of friends, including her eldest sister, Lady Wisebeach, dined at Herondon House and the gentleman known as Harry took in Mrs. Mazarine. Two weeks later, the Mazarines breakfasted in Stanhope Street expressly to meet an imperial grand duchess, who at the time was running about London, and the grand duchess was very smiling and good-natured, and chatted volubly, and invited herself to dinner at Harrenden House. They do tell me, she said graciously, that you have such a wonderful Claudian. Three weeks later, William Mazarin allowed himself to be led into the purchase of a great Scotch estate, of Moore, Seashore, and Morris, in the extreme northwest of Scotland, which had come to Branspeth through his late maternal grandmother, and which had been always considered as absolutely unsaleable on account of certain conditions attached to its purchase, and of the fact that it had been for many years ill-preserved and its sport ruined the deer having been destroyed by crofters. Branspeth, who was primitive and simple in many of his ideas, had demurred to the transaction. This beggar don't know anything about sport, he said to the intermediary, Mouse. Cause he's buying a deer forest he takes for granted he'll find deer. Tisn't fair, you know. One ought to tell him that he'll get no more stock in there than he'd get on Woolwich Common. Why should we tell him anything? said his friend. He can ask a factor, can't he? Well, but it would only be honest, you know. You are odiously ungrateful, said Mouse, with much heat. I might have made the man buy Black Elder of us, and I chose to get him to buy your place instead. Branspeth made a droll face, very like what Jack would make when he kept in a naughty word for fear of his nurse. He thought to himself that the fair lady who was rating him knew very well that her share in the purchase money of Black Elder, which belonged to her lord, would have been remarkably small, whilst her share of that of Blairian. But there are some retorts a man who is a gentleman cannot make, however obvious and merited they may be. Get em to buy em both, he said, tossing cakes to the Blenheims. You do what you like with the cad. Turn him round your little finger. One's just as much a white elephant as tis other, and it's no use no one sweeps unless you make em clean your chimneys. Mr. Mazarine is not a cad or a sweep, said his friend in a tone of reproof. He is a very clever man of business. He must be, to have to think of buying Blair Arion. Probably he will make it productive, or if he wants big game, he'll import it from the Rockies, or, or from somewhere. What he wants is Scottish land. Well, the land is there, isn't it? She invariably glossed over to herself these transactions, which she knew very well were discreditable, and she was always extremely angry with those who failed to keep up the glamour of fiction in which she arrayed them. Conscience she had not, in the full sense of the word, but she had certain instincts of breeding, which made some of her own actions disagreeable to her and only supportable if they were disguised, as a courtly chemist silvered for her the tonic pills, which, as courtly a physician, prescribed when she 
who could ride all day and dance all night, desired her nervous system to be found in jeopardy. He buys with his eyes open. No one has misrepresented anything, she added calmly. He can send an army of factors to look at the estate if he pleases. Pray don't be a fool, Harry. And when your bread is buttered for you, don't quarrel with it. Harry did as he was bid. His principles were not very fine or very strong, but they were the instincts of a gentleman. They were smothered under the unscrupulousness of a woman who had influence over him, as so many of the best feelings and qualities of men often are. Blair Arian was sold to William Mazarin, and at the same period many tradesmen in Paris and London, who dealt in toilets, perfumes, jewelry, fans, and lingerie, were agreeably surprised by receiving large installments of what was due to them from their customer, Lady Kenilworth. To what better use could barren rocks and dreary sands and a dull rambling old house, which dated from James the Fourth and stood in the full teeth of the north wind facing the Orkneys, have possibly been put, than to be thus transmuted into gossamer body linen, and petticoats covered with real lace? and exquisite essences, and fairy-like shoes, with jewels worked into their kid and court trains, with hand-woven embroideries in gold and silver on their velvet. If William Mazarin discovered that he had bought a white elephant, he never said so to anyone, and no one ventured to say so to him. All new men have a mania for buying Scotch shootings, and if there was little or nothing to shoot at Blairian, the fact served for a laugh at the clubs when the purchaser was not present. The purchaser, however, knew well that there were no deer, and that there was scarce fur or feather on the barren soil. He had not bought without first prospecting. He was too old a hand at such matters. But he had turned a deaf ear to those in his interests, who had drawn his attention to the fact and he had signed and sealed the transfer of the estate to himself without a protest. Nobody in North Dakota, it is true, could ever have cheated him out of a red deer or a red scent, but then nobody in North Dakota had ever held that magic key to the entrance of good society, which he so ardently coveted. He was prepared to pay very liberally to obtain that key. He was far from generous by nature, but he could be generous to extravagance when it suited him to be so. William Mazarin was a short, broad, heavily built man, like his wife in feature and having, like her, a muddy pale complexion, which the Sierra Suns had had no force to warm, and the cold blasts of the North Pacific no power to bleach. His close-shut, thin long lips, his square jaw, and his intent gray eyes showed, however, in his countenance, a degree of volition and of intelligence, which were his portion alone, and with which hers had no likeness. He was a silent and seemed a dull man, but he had a clear brain and a ruthless will, and he had in its full strength that genius for making money, which is independent of education and scornful of culture, yet is the only original offspring of that modern life in which education is an institution and culture is a creed. When he had been only eighteen years of age, he had married Margaret Hogan, because she was a stout, strong, hard-working wench, and had at once taken a steerage ticket to New York. When he reached the United States, he had gone straight away to the new settlements in North Dakota, where cities consisted of plank walks and shingle-roof shanties, and where the inhabitants of those cities were rougher and ruder even than himself. He had scent for wealth, as a thirsty steer for distant water springs, and he said to himself, I won't leave off till I'm second to Jay Gould. He began very modestly by employing himself as a pig stickler and opening a pork shop in a town called Kerosene. His wife made and fried sausages to perfection, the shop became a popular resort, and in the back room, miners, diggers, cattlemen, and all the roughs for miles around came to eat sausages, and found drinks hot as flame, and play ad libitum. Sometimes they staked nuggets and lost them. William Mazarin never played. He only watched the gamblers, and when they wanted money, lent it to them, or if they sold a nugget, bought it. 
They were a wild lot who cared neither for man nor devil, but he knew how to keep them in order with his cold gray eyes and his good six-shooter. Many swore that they would kill him or rob him, but nobody ever did either, though several tried to do both. His wife was liked. Hard-worked as she was, she found time to do a good turn to sick neighbors unknown to him, and more than one rough fellow spared him because she had been kind to his kids, or had brought some broth to his girl. The sausage shop in dreary, dirty, plank-made Kerosene City was the foundation of his fortune. How the place had stunk, and how it had reeked with tobacco stench, and echoed with foul outcries, and the blows and shots of ruined and reckless men. Margaret Mazarine often dreamt of it, and when she did so dream, woke bathed in sweat and filled with nameless terror. Her husband never dreamed, except when wide awake and of his own glories. Kerosene City had long outgrown its infancy of planks and shingles, and had expanded into a huge town crammed with factories and tall houses, tramways and elevators, and churches, skyscraping roofs, electric railways, chemical works, fire-belching foundries, hissing, screaming, vomiting machinery, and all the many joys of modern and American civilization. But Kerosene City, most of it Mr. Mazarine's property, was but an item in the Mazarine property. He had been in many trades and many speculations. He owned railway plant and cattle ranches and steamboats and grain depots and docks and tramways and manufactories, and men and women and children labored for him day and night by thousands, harder than the Israelites toiled for the pharaohs. Everything turned to gold that he touched. He bought for little with prodigious insight and sold for much with the same intuition. No foolish scruples hampered his acquisitiveness. No weak-minded compassion ever arrested him on any road which led to his own advantage. He had never been known to relent or to regret, to give except in ostentation, or to stir a step unless self-interest suggested, and self-recompense awaited it. Herbert Spencer has said that kindness and courtesy are indispensable to success. William Mazarine knew better than that philosopher. He had lived amongst men and not amongst books. In the land of his adoption, his fellows feared him as they feared no one else. His few short, hard words cut them like the knotted lash of an overseer's whip. He was dreaded, obeyed, hated. That was all the feeling he cared to excite. Whilst he remained in that country, he never lived like a man of any means. He never spent a dollar on personal ease or comfort. But it was known far and wide that after Vanderbilt and Pullman, the biggest pile in the States was his. His wife alone did not know it. To the day that she sailed past Sandy Hook on her way home, Margaret Mazarine had never ceased to work hard and to save any red cent she could. She knew nothing of his business, of his ambitions, of his hoarded wealth. When he took a first-class cabin on a cunnard steamer and bade her get a sealskin cloak for the voyage and buy herself a handsome outfit, she was astounded. We'll come back, great folks, and buy out the old uns, he had said to her thirty-five years earlier, as they had meekly set down their bundles and umbrellas amongst the steerage passengers of the emigrant ship, and seen the shores of Ireland fade from their sight as the day had waned. All through the thirty-five years, which he had spent on alien soil, he had never forgotten his object. He had lived miserably, saving and screwing, paring and hoarding, happy in the knowledge that his pile grew and grew and grew, a little bigger, a little broader, with every day which dawned. And when it was big enough and broad enough for him to sit on it, monarch of all which he might choose to survey, he said to his wife, Margaret, woman, it's time to shut up the store. We'll be going home. I'm thinking and buying the old uns out. I said as I'd do it, didn't I? Five and thirty year agone and his wife, being only a woman and therefore foolish, burst out crying and threw her apron over her head. But the dear old folk, they be dead, William, and dead be my poor babies, too. Then her William smiled. A very rare thing to see was a smile on his tight, straight lips. Tisn't those old folks I'm meanin'. 
and you've your daughter, surely, to comfort you. We'll marry her to a lord, duke. Margaret Mazarine had dried her tears, knowing that weeping would not bring her back her old parents, whose bones lay under the rich grass in Kilrathi, nor her little lost boys who had been killed, two in a blizzard on the cruel central plains, and one in a forest fire by a rushing herd of terrified cattle. She had dried her tears, bought her sealskins and velvets as she was bidden to do, and come eastward with her lord in all the pomp and plenty, which can be purchased on a first-class ocean streamer. And when the distant line of the low green shore of Cork became visible to her, she had turned round the rings on her large fingers and patted the heavy bracelets on her wrists to make sure that both were real, and said in her own heart if only the old people had been living, if only her three boys had been there beside her, if only she could go once more a buxom girl in a cotton frock through the sweet wet grass with her milking stool. But William Mazarine, as he looked at the low green shores, had no such fond and futile regrets. He set his legs wide apart and crossed his hands on the handle of his stick, and said only to himself, with a pride which was fairly legitimate, if its sources were foul, I did as I said I'd do. I've come back as I said I'd come back. For him, the herdsman who had tramped to and fro the pastures in the falling rain, carrying a newly dropped calf after its mother, or driving a heifer to meet the butcher's knife, had been dead and gone for five and thirty years. There was only alive now William Mazarine, millionaire, ten times over, who had the power of the purse in his pocket and meant to buy Great Britain and Ireland with it. As yet, he had, in his own ambitious sense of the words, failed to buy them. He remained one of the obscure rich, who are unknown to fame and to princes. It was not for lack of expenditure that he had hitherto failed to gratify his social ambitions. He had not understood how to set about the matter. He had been timid and awkward. His wife had been a drag on him, and his daughter, on whom he had counted for the best of assistance, had declined to accept the office which he assigned to her. He had lost time, missed occasions, failed to advance to his goal in a manner which intensely irritated a man who had never before this been foiled or balked in any of his plans. He had learned that the great world was not a drinking den to be entered by bluff with a nugget in one hand and a revolver in the other, and in this stage of chagrin and disappointment, Lady Kenilworth held out her hand to him. He had done all that he knew how to do. He had been returned for a metropolitan division and elected to the Carlton. He and his wife had been presented at court almost as soon as they had arrived in England. They had been invited to a few political houses. They had gone where everybody went in summer, winter, spring, and autumn. His subscriptions were many and large. His financial value was recognized by conservative leaders. But there he remained. He was an outsider. And in this period of perplexity, disappointment, and futile aspirations to the smart world, Lady Kenilworth, the high priestess of smartness, held out her hand to him. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of the Mazarines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Sarah Hill. The Mazarines by Ouida. Chapter 4. Lady Kenilworth was the prettiest woman in England. Her family, the Courcys of Falden, was renowned for physical charms, and she was the loveliest of them all exactly reproducing a famous Romney, which portrayed the features of her great-great-grandmother. She had eyes like forget-me-nots, a brilliantly fair skin, a purely classical profile, a mass of sunny, shining hair, which needed no arts to brighten or to ripple it, and a carriage, which for airy grace and supreme distinction had its equal nowhere among her contemporaries. Her baptismal name of Clare had been almost entirely abandoned by her relatives and friends, and she was always called by them Mouse. 
a nickname given her in nursery days when she pillaged her elder sister's bonbons and made raids on the early strawberry beds, and which had gained in the course of time many variations, such as surset, petite rat, tapanita, fine ears, and liba mousse, and any other derivatives which came to the lips of her associates. She had a mouse painted on the panels of her village cart, stamped in silver on her note paper, mounted in gold on her riding whip, cut in chrysoprase as a charm, and made of diamonds as a locket. And many and various were the forms in which the little rodent was offered to her by her adorers on New Year's Day and at Easter. She had, indeed, so identified herself with the nickname that when she signed her name in a royal album or to a ceremonious letter, she had great difficulty in remembering to write herself down. Claire Kenilworth When she had been brought out at eighteen years old, she had been the idol of the season. People had stood on chairs and benches in the park to see her drive to her first drawing room. It was not only her physical charms which were great, but her manner, her scornful grace, her airy hauteur, and the mixture in her expression of daredevil audacity and childlike innocence, were fascinations all her own. The way she wore her clothes, the way she moved, the things she said, the challenge of her sapphire eyes, were all enchanting and indescribable. She fetched the town, as soon as she was out, in an amazing manner, and it was thought that she had thrown away her chances in an astonishing degree when it was known that she had accepted the hand of a little mauvais sujet, known as cocky to all London and half Europe, who passed his time in the lowest company he could find, and was without stamina, principles, or credit. But she knew what she was about, and without giving any explanation to her people, she dismissed the best men and decided to select the worst she could find. The worst, at least physically and morally. True, he always looked a gentleman, even when he was soaked in brandy and gin, as the wick of a tea kettle is soaked in spirits of wine. Kaki's hands, Kaki's profile, Kaki's slow, soft voice, had always proclaimed his race, even whilst he chaffed a cabman who he could not pay. True, he was, by courtesy, Earl of Kenilworth, and would certainly be, if he outlived his father, Duke of Otterborne. But then he was besides that, and beyond that to all his world, cocky. And a more disreputable little sinner than cocky it would have been hard to find in the peerage or out of it. But cocky suited her book, and to the horror of her own family and the amazement of his, this radiant debutante selected as her partner for life this little drunkard, who had one lung already gone, and who formed the whipping boy and stocking horse of every radical newspaper in Great Britain. At a garden party on the river, Lord Kenilworth showed himself for once in decent society, and unfuddled by pick-me-ups and eye-openers. He walked alone with the beauty of the year under an elm avenue by the waterside, and this was their conversation. "'You won't expect much of me,' he said with his glass in his eye, looking vaguely down the river. "'My wretched health, you know, er, there's one good thing about it for you. I may kick over the bucket any day. One lung gone, you know?' "'Yes,' replied his companion. "'I've always heard so, but you'll let me hang on my own hook. Drive my own team, won't you?' Cocky nodded. He perfectly understood the allegorical phrases. Oh, Lord, yes, he made answer. I'm a very easygoing fellow. Take my own way and let other people take theirs. I warn you, I shall take mine, said the young beauty. She looked him full in the eyes. Cocky's own pale, drowsy eyes looked back into hers, with so cynical a smile in them that for once she was disconcerted. Lord! What'll that matter to me? He responded candidly. I only marry to make the patter come down with the flimsy. We shall have to agree over financial questions, you and I. That's all. 
Most married people only meet over the accounts, you know. The young lady laughed. Very well, then. If you see it in that sensible light, we'll say it's concluded. Kaki had a gleam of conscience in his brandy-soaked soul. You might do better, you know, he said slowly. You're awfully fetching, and you're very young. And I'm, well, I'm a bad lot. And, and wretched health, you know? I know, but you suit me, said his companion with brevity. I shall have the jewels, shan't I? Yes, I've spoken to the potter. He'll let you have them. Toffle donc, she said frankly, and she held out her pretty gloved right hand. Cocky respectfully kissed the tips of her fingers. Then he grinned. Let's go and ask the potter's blessing. He's over there with the princess. The devil take her if she hasn't got some card up her sleeve that she don't show me, he thought as he continued to walk on beside her. But she's awfully fetching, and she'll be great fun. And the potter will think I'm reforming, and he'll come down with the blunt, and what a wax Barrack will be in. Barrack was his next brother, Alberic Orm. Meantime, the lovely and youthful creature, who brushed the grass with her bronze kid boots beside him, pursued similar reflections. He don't look as if he'd live a year, and he's too far gone to bother me much. And such a cretin as that Harry won't mind. And the vulture's egg is worth a little worry. Her relatives, and especially her eldest brother, were horrified by her decision. But their persuasions and their entreaties were as ineffectual as their condemnation. He will let me do as I like, and I shall have the vulture's egg, she invariably answered. The vulture's egg was a great diamond, so called, which while it had been in the possession of each succeeding Duchess of Otterborn, had rendered her the envied of all her sex. One of the family, present at the Battle of Plossy, as a volunteer, had taken it from the turban of a native prince, who he had slain. It was a yellow diamond of great size and effulgence, and if she married Cocky, she could, she hoped, wear it at once, as his mother had been dead many years. You marry that little wretch for the sake of that looted jewel, said her brother, her smonsu, furious. Many people don't marry anything half as nice as a jewel, she replied calmly. And she persisted and did give her hand to the sickly little man with a classic profile and a ruined constitution, of whom his own father was ashamed. Kaki was a slight, pale, feminine-looking person, with very light eyes, which were usually without any expression at all in them, but now and then at rare intervals could flash with a steely sharpness. His wife knew those electric flashes of those colorless orbs and was as afraid of them as it was possible to the intrepid nature of a Corsi of Falden to be ever afraid. Kaki, however, possessed some excellent qualities— other men were garrulous and confidential after drinking, but the more cocky drank, the more wary and the more silent he became. That tacit compact they made on that day of their betrothal, when they had walked besides the Thames together, was never broken on her side or his. They never interfered with each other, and they were at times almost cordial allies, when it was a question of playing into each other's hands against some detested third person or of deriving some mutual advantage from some mutual concessions. He usually let her have her own way as she had stipulated, for it was the easiest and most profitable way for himself. He was very lazy and wholly unscrupulous. Many thousands of pounds of good money had been spent on his education. Tutors of the best intellect and the best morals had trained him from seven to twenty-one. His father, though a vain man, was of immaculate honor. Every kind of inducement and pressure was put on him to be a worthy representative of a noble name, and nature had given him plenty of brains. Yet, so pig-headed is human nature, or so faulty is the English system of patrician education, that Cocky, for all practical result to his bringing up, might have been reared in a taproom and have matriculated in a thieves' quarter. Queer, monstrous queer, 
thought his father often, with an agony of irritation and regret. Train a child in the way he should go, and hang me if he won't go just the other way to spite you. Cocky was a very old child at the time of his marriage. He was thirty-seven years of age, with his thin, fair hair turning very gray, and one lung nearly gone as he had declared. But he did not evince the slightest desire to reform, and he took money in all ways, good, bad, and indifferent, in which it offered itself to him. What a man to leave behind one, thought Otterborn very often, with real shame and sorrow at his heart. He was himself a very good man, and a gentleman to the marrow of his bones. His vanities were harmless, and his little airs of youth were not ridiculous, because he was still very handsome and well-preserved. By what horrible fatality, he often asked himself, was Cocky the heir of his dukedom? He had three other sons, all men of admirable conduct and health, both moral and physical. By what extraordinary irony and brutality of fate had his eldest son, who had enjoyed every possible benefit from early training and good influences, become what he was? His wife had been a saint, and for the first ten years of his life, Cocky had been as pretty and promising a boy as ever rejoiced the heart of parents. She had given birth to the four charming little children, whose names were recorded in Burke, and who were admired by all the women they met when they toddle along the sunny side of the park, or drove in their basket carriage behind their two sleek donkeys, with Jack holding the reins and a groom walking at the asses' heads. They were pretty babies, dear little men and women, with big black eyes and golden masses of hair, and skins as soft and as fair as blush roses. She was fond of them, but they could not have much space in her life, it had been already so very full when they had come into it. She had never a moment to herself, unless it were the time of meditation which her bath gave her, or the minutes in which, alone in her little brougham, she rushed from one house to another. Cocky went about with his wife quite often enough to set a good example. Not into society, indeed. Cocky had a society of his own, to which he was faithful. But he was always there when wanted, in the London house, in the country houses, in the Paris hotel, at the German bath. He was always there in the background, a shadowy presence letting himself in and out with noiseless and discreet footsteps, a permanent sanction and an indisputable guarantee that all was as it should be, and that Lady Kenilworth, with the big diamond of his house on her fair bosom, could attend a drawing room or a state ball whenever she chose. He really kept his part of the compact, with a loyalty which better men might have not shown. For better men would not have had his inducements or his patience to do so. Their financial embarrassments were chronic, but never interfered with their expenditure. Money was always got somehow for anything that they really wished to do. They were at all places in their due season, and their own houses never saw them, except when there was a house party to be entertained, or a royal visit to be received. True, Cocky on such occasions was usually indisposed and unseen, but that fact did not greatly matter to anyone. It was an understood thing in society that he had had motor ataxy, a very capricious disease, as everyone knows, putting you in purgatory one day and letting you sup with ballet girls the next, and Cocky had this useful faculty of the well-born and naturally well-bred man that he could, when he chose, pull himself out of the slough, remember his manners, and behave as became his race. But it bored him excruciatingly, and the effort was brief. The marriage, on a whole, if they had not been continually in difficulties about money, might fairly have been called as happy as most marriages are. When they quarreled, it was in private, and when they combined, they were dangerous to their families. She knew that she was never likely ever again to find anyone quite so reasonable, quite so useful as he. He had, immediately on their marriage, been on very good terms with her friend Harry, and when there was later on question of other friends besides Harry, 
he did not feel half so much irritation at the fact, as did Harry himself. He had learned what card it had been, which she had kept up her sleeve when she had spoken with such apparent frankness as she had walked along the grass path by the Thames. But he had never made a fuss about it. He really thought Harry a very good fellow, though. Deuced poor, deuced poor, he said sometimes shaking his head. Harry, too, was useful and unobtrusive, always ready to get theater stalls or make up a supper party or row the stableman if the horses got out of form, or go on beforehand to see the right rooms were taken at Homburg, or Biarritz, or Nice. A good-natured fellow, too, was Harry, sort of fellow who would pawn his last shirt for you if he liked you. Cocky always nodded to him and used his cigar case, and sauntered with him for appearance sake down Paul Mall or Piccadilly, in the most amicable manner possible. Kaki was a nursery nickname which had gone with him to Eton, and from Eton into the world, and Kenny was an abbreviation of his courtesy title, which was unfortunately in use even amongst the cabmen, policemen, crossing sweepers, and match sellers of that district of Mayfair, where he dwelt whilst awaiting the inheritance of Otterbourne House. "'Jump in, boy,' said the driver of a hansom to a telegraph lad, who had hailed him at the same time as Lord Kenilworth. Jump in. A growler's good enough for Kenny. He wants to get slow over the ground, to give my lady time with her fancy man. There was something about him which made all manly men, of whatever class, from cab drivers to his own brothers and brother-in-law, perpetually desire to kick him. He knew that men wished to kick him, and he did not try to kick them in return. He wore his degradation smiling, as if it were in order. That is the utterly hopeless thing about him, said his father once. The Orams had always been great people, true, staunch, polished gentlemen, holding a great stake in the country, and holding it worthily, riding straight and living honorably. By what caprice of a chance, what irony of fate, had this stalwart, and high-principled race produced such a depraved and degenerate being as Kaki. There must be something very wrong in our social system that so many of our men of position are no sounder than rotten apples, the Duke said once to a person, who replied that there were black sheep in all countries. Yes, but our black sheep are labeled prize rams, replied Otterbourne. The four little children in the nurseries did not give him much consolation. The gossip of society hung over them like a cloud in his sight, and there were none of those dark sleepy eyes in his family portraits at Staghurst. There are no black-eyed orms in our family portraits, he said once to his eldest son, and Cocky's face wore for an instant a droll expression, and his left eye winked, but it was only for an instant. There's a legend he said, rolling a cigarette. Richard Orme married a gypsy in William Rufus's time. Lord, who shall say to where the brats throw back? Who indeed, said the duke with a significance which penetrated even the cognac-sodden brain of his heir. But the legend did really exist, and when the children's mother heard of the gypsy of William Rufus's time, she thought the legend a very interesting one and very useful. But who could blame Cocky's wife for anything? Besides, the Duke was of that old English temper, now grown so rare, which thought dishonor carried into a law court, was only made much worse by the process, and was painfully conscious that Kenilworth, although he looked like a gentleman, spoke like one, moved like one, and wore his clothes like one, was in many sorrowful respects a cad. But a clever cad. Yes, Cocky was clever by nature, if not by study. That was perhaps the very worst part of the whole matter. He could play the fool. Did play it almost perpetually, but he had not been born a fool. There was not even that excuse for him. He was a man of considerable intelligence, whom indolence, depravity, and disinclination to take trouble had made approach very nearly to an idiot. But, as his mind had odd nooks and corners in it, 
which contained out-of-the-way scraps of learning, sometimes profound. So his character had, occasionally, spasms in it of resolve and of volition, which showed that he might have been a different person to the mere nonentity and lounger that he was, if he had been forced to work for his living. As it was, he was the butt of his friends, the torture of his father, the ridicule of his wife, and the favorite whipping boy of the press and public. When they wanted indirectly to slay a prince, or directly to pillory an order, as a gun loaded to the muzzle, which could at any moment be discharged with deadly effect at the upper house, he was unspeakably dear to the radicals. One day, in a Hyde Park meeting, met to howl against the lords, Kaki, who was riding his cob down the road past the Achilles, heard his own name spoken, and his fitness for an hereditary legislator irreverently denied. He stopped to listen, putting his glass in his eye to see his adversaries. "'My good people, you are all wrong,' he called to them at a pause in the oration. "'I'm a commoner, plain John Orham, without a shilling to bless myself with. Don't suppose I shall ever live to get into the Lord's. The potter's lungs are much sounder than mine, and his politics too.' for he'd trounce you all around and give each of you a horse drench. So oddly constituted our mobs, that this one laughed and cheered him for the speech, and Cocky, much diverted, got off his cob in Hamilton Place, at the Bachelor's Club, and went to refresh his throat with a glass of brandy. It was his sole appearance in public life. Told him you'd give him each of them a horse's drench, he said with a faint chuckle the next time he saw his father. "'Thanks,' said Otterborn. "'And if they break my windows the next time they're out, "'will you pay for the glazier?' "'Never pay for anything,' said Cocky, solemnly and truthfully, "'and it was probably the only truthful word "'that he had spoken for many years. "'End of chapter 4 "'Section 5 of the Masserines this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Masserines by Ouida, Section 5 Ronnie, said Mouse to her elder brother one morning, I don't think I've ever told you about those new people to whom Gerald sold Vale Royale. "'To whom you sold Vale Royale,' said Lord Hurst Manso with curt significance. She colored. She did not like her brother's rough and blunt ways of putting things, though it was a coursey habit into which she herself lapsed in cynical and imprudent moments. She let the subject pass, however, and continued as if she had not heard the correction. They are such fun. You can't imagine how delightful they are, and they have made Harrenden House a paradise. When I came from Cairo, they were already in it. Old Prince Chris has done it all. There are a good many such dollar-lined paradises in London, said Hurst Manso. I'd rather you didn't go into them, but of course do as you like. Of course I do. Old Chris arranged the house for them. Hurst Manso laughed. Oh, Chris and you, they will be warm people indeed if they have even a pear pool of swaff left for themselves between you two. Poor devils, I think I'll go and give them the lay of the course. My dear Ronnie, how absurd you are. If anybody heard you, they might think you were in earnest. Hurst Manso looked at his sister with a shrewd, appreciative scorn in his eyes. They might, he said gravely. I am usually in earnest, my dear. I know you are, and it is a horrid thing to be, she replied with petulance. Earnest people are always such bores. Then... 
Remembering that she would not produce the effect she desired by abusing him, she changed her tone. Dearest Ronald, these persons are coming here tomorrow night. Let me present them to you, and if you would but say a good word for them in the world. He was silent. I think, you know, she murmured softly, that as they bought Gerald's place, they naturally rather looked to us all to make things pleasant for them. Hurst Manceau put the white small ringed finger off his coat with a gesture which had sternness in it. My dear child, you are Delilah to all men born of Adam, but not to me, not to me, my child, because you are my sister. The Lord be praised for his mercies. If you had not been my sister, I should have had no strength against you, probably. As it is, I won't keep bad company, my dear, even to please you. Bad company? They are most estimable people. I am happy to hear so, since you led them in here. But everybody is going to know them. Then why should you care about my knowing them, too? That is just... began his sister and paused, scanning the little mouse embroidered on her handkerchief. Take your eyes off that bit of gossamer and look at me, said Hurst Manso severely. You do this kind of thing. Cocky does it. You make Gerald do it. But I'll be damned, my dear, if you make me. She was mute, distressed, irritated, not seeing very well what to say or resent. Get up a firm with old Chris continued her brother. Chris and Kenilworth, it will run very nicely and take the town like wildfire. I'm convinced that it will, but Hurst Manceau as co? No thank you. You don't even hear me, said his sister rather piteously. I know all you're going to say, he replied. You mean to float these people, and you'll do it. You'll get em to state concerts, and you'll get em to Marlborough House garden parties, and you'll get them to political houses, and you'll ram em down all our throats, and take the princes to dine with em. I know all that. It's always the same program, and the he-beast will get a baronetcy, and the she-beast will get to Hatfield, and you'll run them just as Barnum used to run his giants and dwarfs, and you'll make a pot by it as Barnum did. Only leave me out of the thing, if you please. Why shouldn't you be the sleeping partner? Said his sister jestingly, but with a side glance of her lovely eyes which had a timid and keen interrogation in it. Nobody'd be the wiser, and your word has such weight. Don't make that sort of suggestion, my dear, even in joke. Gerald has helped you. I am not Gerald. You've made him dance to your tune through a lot of mud, but you won't make me. There are enough of the family in this shabby kind of business as it is. Oh, Ronald! You see, Surisset, he added, you're always telling me that I wear my clothes too long. You've often seen me in an old coat, in a shockingly old coat, but you never saw me in an ill-cut one. Well, I like my acquaintances to be like my clothes. They may be out at elbows, but I must have them well cut. Lady Kenilworth gazed at her pocket handkerchief for a few minutes in disturbed silence. Is that the tone you mean to take about my new people? she asked at last. My dearest Surisette, I don't take any tone. These Richard from the northwest are nothing to me. You are taking them up and getting Carrie to take them up because you mean to get lots of good things out of them. No one can possibly know a bulldozing boss from North Dakota for any other reason than to plunder him. Oh, Ronald, what coarse and odious things you say! 
Her exclamation was beseeching and indignant. A little flush of color went over her fair cheeks. You shouldn't be so hard upon one, she added. Some poet has said that poverty gives us strange bedfellows. We need never lie down on the bed. We can lie in our own straw. But if we've used up all our straw, then we can go out of doors and sleep a la belle étoile. And the rural constable will pass by his lanthorn and wake us up and run us in. Oh, my dear Ronald, you don't know what it is to want a sovereign every moment. You're unmarried, and you shoot with a keeper's gun, and you yacht in an old wooden tub, and you lounge about all over the world with your places shut up and your townhouse let. What can you tell, what can you dream, of the straits Cocky and I are put to every single minute of our lives? "'Because you won't pull up and lead sensible lives,' said Hurst Manso. "'You must always be in the swim, always at the most ruinously expensive places. "'Can't you exist without tearing over Europe and bits of Africa every year? "'Did our forefathers want Kyrene winters? "'Couldn't they fish and shoot and dance and flirt without Norway and the Riviera? "'Wasn't their own county town enough for them?' Weren't their lungs capable of breathing without Biskra? Weren't they quite as good sportsmen as we are, with only their fouling pieces? Quite as fine ladies as you are, though they saw to their still rooms. Their women look very nice in the Romneys and Reynolds, said Mouse. But you might as well ask why we don't go from Derby to Bath in a coach and six. Autre temps, autre mœurs. There is nothing else to be said. Would you yourself use your grandfather's gun? Why should I see to my still room? I do wish, she continued, that you would talk about what you understand. I will send you the bill for the children's boots and shoes, just to show you what it costs one merely to have them properly shod. Poor little sods! said Hurst Manso, with his smile, which people called cynical. I don't think they are the heaviest of your expenses. I believe you could live with the whole lot of them in a cottage at Broadstairs or Hearn Bay all the year round for about what your hunting mares cost you in one season. Don't be an ass, Ronald, said his sister crossly. What is the use of talking of things that nobody can do any more than they can wear their fustian clothes or wooden shoes? You will know what I mean some day when you're married. We are worse off than the match sellers and the crossing sweepers. They can do as they like, but we can't. Life isn't all skittles and swipes, observed Hurst Manso. You always seem to think it is. But she disregarding him, went on in her wrath. It is a thousand times worse to be poor in our world than to be beggars on the high road. If they keep in with the police, they're all right, but our police are all round us every minute of our lives, spying to see if we have a man less in the ante-rooms, a hoof less in the stables, if we have the same gown on, or the same houses open. If we've given up any club, any habit, any moors, any shooting, if the prince talks as much to us as usual, or the princess asks us to drive with her, if we go away for the winter to shut up a place, or make lungs an excuse for getting away to avoid Scotland, they are eternally staring, commenting, annotating, whispering over all we do. We can never get away from them, and we daren't retrench a half penny's worth, because if we did, the tradespeople would think we were ruined and all the pack would be down on us. There is some truth in that, my poor mouse, I must allow, said her brother with a shade of unwilling sympathy in his tone. But it's a beggarly rotten system to live your lives out on, and I think Broadstairs would be the better part if you could only make up your mind to it. It would be only one effort instead of a series of efforts, and the cheap trippers wouldn't be worse than the mastodons, 
At least you wouldn't have to do so much for them. Masserines, said his sister with an impatient dive for the silver poker, and another dive with it at the fire. The name isn't such a bad name. It might have been Healy. It might have been Murphy. It might have even been Bigger, replied Hurst so amused. Possibilities in the ways of horror are infinite when we once begin opening our doors to people whom nobody knows. Practically, there need be no end to it. Mouse, leaning softly against her brother, with her hand caressing the lapel of his coat, said sweetly and insidiously, There is an only daughter, Ronald, an only child. Indeed? She will be an immense heiress, sighed his sister. Everybody will be after her. Everybody bar one, said her brother. And why bar one? His face darkened. Don't talk nonsense, he said curtly. I don't like when you are impertinent. It is a pity Cocky ever saw you. The Masserine Alliance would have suited him down to the ground. She would have been millions of miles too good for him, said Cocky's wife with boundless contempt. They don't want merely rank, they want character. My dear Mouse, said Hurst Manceau, the other day a young fellow went into a café in Paris, had a good soup, fish and roti, and three cups of coffee. An unfeeling landlord arrested him as he was about to go off without paying. The people in the streets pitied him on the whole, but they thought the three cups of coffee too much. Ça, c'est trop fort de café, said a workman in a blouse to me. In a similar manner, allow me to remark that if your new friends, in addition to the smart dinner of rank, require the strong coffee of character, they are too exacting. The people in the streets won't let them have both. Lady Kenilworth felt very angry at this impudent anecdote and pulled to pieces some narcissus standing near her in an old china bowl. The analogy don't run on all fours, she said petulantly. My people can pay. You have a right to anything if you only pay enough for it. Most things, not everything quite, said her brother indolently, as he took up his hat and cane and whistled his collie dog, who was playing with the Blenheims. Not everything quite, yet, he repeated, as if the declaration refreshed him. You have not the smallest effect upon me, and you will not present your protégés to me. Remember that once for all. Adieu. Then he touched her lightly and affectionately on her fair hair, shook himself like a dog who has been in dirty water, and left her. Mouse, who was not a patient or resigned woman by nature, flashed a furious glance after him from the soft shade of her dark eyelashes, and her white teeth gnawed restlessly and angrily the red and lovely underlip beneath them. He could have done so much if he would. His opinion was always listened to, and his recommendation was so rarely given that it always carried great weight. He would have told her that they were so respected precisely because he did not do such things as this which she wanted him to do. He was a very tall and extremely handsome man, with a debonair and careless aspect, and a distinguished way of wearing his clothes which made their frequent shabbiness look ultra-chic. The coursey beauty had been a thing of note for many generations, and he had as full a share of it as his sister, whom he strongly resembled. He was fourteen years older than she, and she had long been accustomed to regard him as the head of her house, for he had succeeded to the earldom when a schoolboy, and she had never known her father. 
He had tried his best to alter the ways of the Kenilworth establishment, but he had failed. If he talked seriously to his sister, it always ended in his paying some bill. If he talked seriously to his brother-in-law, it always ended in his being asked to settle some affair about an actress or a dispute in a pothouse. They both used him, used him incessantly, but they never attended to his counsels or his censure. They both considered that, as he was unmarried, spent little, and was esteemed stingy, they really only did him a service in making him bleed occasionally. "'He's such a close-fisted prig,' said Lord Kenilworth, and his wife agreed to the opinion. "'Ronnie is a bore,' she said. "'He's always asking questions. If anybody wants to do any good, they should do it with their eyes shut and their mouths shut.' A kindness is no kindness at all if it is made the occasion for an inquisitorial sermon. Ronnie does not often refuse one in the end, but he is always asking why and how and what and wanting to go to the bottom of the thing, and it is never anything that concerns him. If he would just do what one wants and say nothing, it would be so much nicer so much more delicate. I cannot endure indelicacy. The Kenilworths, like many other wedded people, had no common bond whatever, except when they were united against somebody else. They bickered, sneered, and quarreled whenever they were by any rare chance alone, but when it was a question of attacking any third person, their solidarity was admirable. Hearst Manceau seemed to them both to have been created by nature and law to be of use to them, to carry them over troublesome places, and to lend them the aegis of his unblemished name. But of any gratitude to him, neither even dreamed. It always seemed to them that he did next to nothing for them, though if the little folks upstairs had roast mutton and sago pudding, and if the servant in Stanhope Street got their wages with any regularity, it was usually wholly due to his intervention. He had succeeded to heavily encumbered estates, and the years of his minority, though they had done something, had not done much towards lessening the burden which lay on the title. And he had always been a poor man. But now, when he was nearing forty years of age, he could say that he was a free one. To obtain such freedom, it had required much self-denial and philosophy, and he had incurred much abuse in his family and out of it, and as he was by nature careless and generous, the restraint upon his inclinations had been at times irksome and well-nigh unendurable. But he had adhered to the plan of retrenchment when he had cut out for himself, and it had been successful in releasing him from all obligations without selling a rood of land on any estate or cutting any more timber than was necessary to the health of the woods themselves. He was called the miser, commonly amongst his own people, but he did not mind the nickname. He kept his hands clean and his name high, which was more than do all his contemporaries and compeers. When he had left his sister this morning, and had got as far as the head of the staircase, his heart misgave him. Poor Mousie! Had he been too rough on her? Did she really want money? He turned back and entered the little room again, where Lady Kenilworth was sitting before the hearth, her elbow on her knee, her cheek on her hand, her blue eyes gazing absently on the fire. He came up to her and laid his hand on her shoulder. 
My dear Surizette, are you troubled about money? You know I always am, Ronnie, she said impatiently. It is chronic with us. It will always be. Even when the poodle goes to glory, it will be hardly any better. You know that. The poodle was the irreverent nickname given to the Duke of Otterborne by his eldest son and that son's wife on account of his fleecy white hair and his bland ceremonious manners of the old school at which they saw fit to laugh irreverently. My poor child, if you have no more solid resource than to decant poodle's demise, your prospects look blue. I always tell you so. Poodle means living and loving on into the twentieth century. Never doubt that. I don't doubt it, said Mouse very angrily. He will always do everything which can by any possibility most annoy us. But are you in any especial difficulty at this moment, Surizette? asked her brother in a very kind and tender tone intended to invite her confidence. What is especial with other people is chronic with me, she replied pettishly. My worries and miseries are as eternal as Poodle's youth and courtships. But do you want money? Well, more than usual? I always want it, replied Mouse. Everybody always wants it except you. I know you always say that. I want it very much just now, but if it's anything for the children, you are a model uncle out of the fairy book. No, it is not for the mites. They get their bread and milk and mutton chops as yet. It is, it is. Well, if you really care to know, these people are horribly rude and pressing, and I haven't even a hundred pounds to throw them as a sop. She leaned back towards her writing-table, which stood beside the hearth, and, tossing its litter of paper to and fro, took from the chaos a letter from a famous firm of Bond Street tradesmen, and gave it to her brother. As he is in the mood, he may as well pay something, she thought. It would be a pity not to bleed the miser when one can. Lord Hurst Manso ran his eyes quickly over the letter, and a pained look passed over his face, an expression of annoyance and regret. She was Kenilworth's wife, and had been long out of her brother's guardianship, but it hurt him to think that she had exposed herself to these insults, these importunities, these humiliations. "'My dear Claire,' Why will you lay yourself open to be addressed in this manner? He said gravely, and when he called her Claire, she knew that he was very greatly displeased. Why will you not pull your life together into some degree of order? Why descend to the level on which it is possible for your tradesmen to write to you in such terms as these? Lady Kenilworth who was the most colleen and coaxing of women when she chose, as she could be the most autocratic and brusque when she was with people she despised, rose, looked up in her brother's face, and stroked the lappet of his coat with her pretty slender hand sparkling with its many rings. "'Write me a little check, Ronnie,' she said, "'and don't put my name. Make it payable to bearer.' He shook his head. Little checks or big checks, Mousie, don't find their way to your tradesmen. You have played me that trick more than once. I will go to these people myself and pay them the whole account, but— Oh, don't pay them the whole, said Mouse uneasily. That would be great waste of money. If you can really spare me as much as this, give it to me. I will find a thousand better uses for it than paying a bill. I dare say Sheridan was of your opinion, and when he was dying they sold his bed from under him. They won't sell mine, because my brother will be by my bedside, said Mouse with a sunny yet plaintive smile in her forget-me-not-like eyes. 
Don't trust too much to that, my dear. I am mortal and a good many years older than you, he answered gravely as he folded up the Bond Street tradesman's threatening letter and put it in his coat pocket. You had better write a check for me, Ronald, indeed, said his sister coaxingly. It will look odd if you pay this, or if your people pay it, and I could do a great deal with all that money. You would do everything except pay the account. I don't think you would do much with the riches of all the world except run through them, said Hearst Manso curtly, and taking no notice of the appeal. Past experience had taught him that money which passed through his sister's fingers had a knack of never reaching its destination. "'I won't compromise you,' he added. "'Don't be afraid. I shall tell them that they have lost your custom.' "'You need not say that,' said Mouse uneasily. She was very fond of this particular Bond Street shop, and what was the use of paying an account if you did not avail yourself of the advantage so gained by opening another one instantly? I certainly shall say it, said Hurstman so decidedly, and he once more left the room. Mouse looked after him with regret and uneasiness, regret that she had turned his generous impulse to such small account and uneasiness lest he should suspect more of her affairs than it would be well for him to learn. He's a good fellow sometimes, but so stiff-necked and mule-headed, she thought as she hastily calculated in her rapidly working brain how much percentage she might have got off the Bond Street account if she had dealt with the matter herself. She was extravagant, but she was very keen about money and at the same time at once prodigal and parsimonious, which is a more general combination than most people suppose. Hurst Manso looked back at her wistfully from between the cream-colored, rose-embroidered curtains of the doorway. It was on his lips to ask her not to pursue her patronage of Herndon House. But as he had just promised to do her a service, he could not seem to dictate to her an obedience as a return payment to him. He went away in silence. Besides, whatever she were to promise, she would always do as she liked, he reflected, previous experiences having told him that neither threats nor persuasions ever had the slightest effect upon his sister's actions. As he went out of the vestibule into the street, he passed a tall, very good-looking young man who was about to enter, and who nodded to him familiarly, as one brother may nod to another. Hurst Manso said a curt good day without a smile. The other man passed in without the preliminary of inquiring whether the lady of the house was at home, and the footman of the antechamber took off his great coat and laid his hat and cane on the table as a matter of course. A person who had known no better might have concluded that the visitor was Kenilworth himself, but to Kenny, as they called him behind his back, the anteroom lackeys were much less attentive than they were to this young man. "'My real brother-in-law,' said Hurst Manso to himself, with a vexed frown upon his brows and a little laugh, which people would have called cynical upon his lips. He did not love Kenilworth, but young Lord Branspeth he abhorred. End of section 5. Read by Henry K. Noble in Washington, D.C. on February 19, 2023. Section 6 of The Mazarines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
read by april six zero nine zero the mazarines by kita chapter six i met the miser how has he been to-day reading you eh said lord brentspeth when he had ten minutes or more ensconced in the coziest corner by the boudoir fire he was a very well-featured and well-built young man with a dark oval face pensive brows and great dreamy dark brown eyes his physiognomy which was poetic and melancholy did not accord with his conversation which was slipshod and slangy or his life which was idiotic after the manner of his generation mouse was standing behind him leaning over his shoulder to look at an ancient british coin newly attached to his watch chain her own eyes were soft with a fullness of admiration which would have been doubtless delightful to him if he had not been so terribly used to it the miser was out of humour as usual she replied ronald should really live amongst some primitive sect of shakers or quakers or ranters or roarers whatever they are called he has all the early christian virtues and he thinks nobody should live upon credit he certainly shouldn't live amongst us said Branspeth, with a self-satisfied laugh as if chronic debt were a source of especial of felicitation how he hates me by the way mousy you are not a primitive virtue said his friend with her hands lying lightly on his shoulders and her breath stirring like a soft balmy south wind amongst his close curling dark hair Bransbeth had ceased to be a worshipper and he had ceased even to like being the worshipped but habit is second nature and it was his habit to be wherever lady kenilworth was and that kind of habit becomes second nature to lazy and good-hearted men he was a young man who was so constantly almost universally adored that it bored him and he often reflected that he should never be lastingly attached except to a woman who should detest him he had not found that woman at the date at which he was allowing his friend mouse to hang over his shoulder and admire the ancient british coin he always told people that he was very fond of cocky cocky and he were constantly to be seen walking together or driving together or playing games together outdoors and indoors they were even sometimes seen together in the nursery of those charming little blond-haired black-eyed children who were taught by their nurses to pray for cocky as papa the miser will marry some day said Branspeth now and then he won't be so easy to bleed i'm sure he will never marry alan is sure he never will alan was her second brother stuff said Branspeth. alan will be out in his calculations you will marry some day too i am sure harry whispered mouse as she leaned over his chair her tone was the tone of a woman who says what she does not think to enjoy the pleasure of being told that what she says is absurd and impossible Branspeth gave a little laugh and kissed the hand which was resting on the back of his chair when cocky goes to glory he answered cocky said cocky's wife with fierce contempt he will never die men like him never do die they drink like ducks and never show it they eat like pigs and never feel it they cut their own throats every hour and are all the better for it they destroy their lives their lungs their stomachs and their brains and live on just as if they had all four in perfection nothing ever hurts them though their blood is brandy their flesh is absinthe and their minds are a sink emptied into a bladder they look like cripples and like corpses but they never die the hard-working railway men die the hard-working curates die the pretty little children die the men who do good all day long and have thousands weeping for them they die but men like cocky live and like to live and if by any chance they ever fall ill they get well just because everybody is passionately wishing them dead she spoke with unusual intensity of expression her transparent nostrils dilated her red lips curled her turquoise eyes gleamed and glittered Branspeth looked at her in alarm on my word sir Asset, he murmured when you look like that you frighten a fellow i wouldn't be in cocky's shoes not for a kingdom i thought you were longing to replace cocky well yes of course yes said Branspeth. only you positively alarm me when you talk like this 
I'm not such an over and above correct living fellow myself, and Cocky isn't so out and out bad as all that, you know. After all, he's got some excuse. Some excuse, she repeated, her delicate complexion flushing red. Some excuse? You, you, Harry, you dare to say that to me? Well, it's the truth, murmured Bransbeth sulkily. And don't make a scene, Mouse. My nerves can't stand it. I'm taking cocaine, and I ought to keep quiet. I ought indeed. Why do you take cocaine? asked Lady Kenilworth, changing to inquietude and interrogating his countenance anxiously. All sorts of reasons, said her friend, sulkily still. Oh, yes, I look well enough, I dare say. People often look well when they are half dead. Don't make me scenes, Topinetta. I can't bear them. I never make you scenes, darling, not even when you give me reason. Hump said Brownspeth very doubtfully. When do I give you reason? There never was anybody who stood your bullying as I stand it. Bullying? Oh, Harry. Yes, bullying. Cocky don't stand it. He licks you. I cave in. With those unpoetic words, Lord Brownspeth laid his poetic head back on the cushions of his chair and closed his eyelids till their long, thick lashes rested on his cheeks. With an air of martyrdom and exhaustion, she looked at him anxiously. You really do not look well, love, she whispered, as she hung over his chair. It is, is it, that you care for another woman? I would rather know the truth, Harry. Women be hanged, said Branspeth, with a sigh, his eyes still closed. It's the cocaine, cures a fellow, you know, but kills him. That's what all the new medicines do. End of section six. Section 7 of The Massarines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Massarines by Ouida. Section 7. By the way, said the young man, still with his eyes closed and indisposed to follow his companion's lead into the domain of sentiment. I saw the most beautiful woman last night that I ever saw in my life, the most glorious creature. Such eyes! You can't imagine such eyes. What color? asked Mouse, with a glance at her own eyes in an adjacent mirror and a displeased severity on her mouth. Black, black as night. At least, you know, perhaps they weren't really black. They were like that stone. What do you call it? Opal? No, onyx. Yes, onyx. Such a woman. I'm a bad un to please, but on my honor. You are very enthusiastic said Mouse, with the lines of her lips more scornful and displeased. Where did you see this miracle? Bransbeth smiled. Lord, how soon they are jealous, he thought. Take far like toe. Aloud, he answered. Yesterday my sister got me to go to Complines at the Oratory. It was some swell saint or another, and some of the cracks were singing there. This woman was close to where I was. She was all in black, and seemed very much gone on the service. Her eyes got full of tears at part of it. Well, I don't mind telling you she fetched me, so that I asked the Duke d'Arcy to see my sister safe home, and I followed the lady with the eyes. She got into the little dark coupé, and my handsome bowed after it. I ran her to earth at a private hotel, quite solemn sort of place called Brown's, and there they told she was the Countess Zulinar. Countess Zulinar? Then one can soon see who she is, said Mouse, as she went and got an almanac de Gotha of the year from her writing table. Oh, I looked there last night, said Bransbeth. She isn't in there, but the porter told me she used to be the wife of that awfully rich banker, Vandalin. Mouse looked up astonished and momentarily interested. Are you quite sure? Positive. Then she can't be young now, said Lady Kenilworth with relief and satisfaction. 
Oh, yes, she is at least quite young enough, said Branspeth vaguely. Oh, I know all about her, continued his friend. She is not in society. We stand a good deal in London, but at present we don't receive divorced women. Branspeth laughed softly with vast amusement and did not offer any explanation of his laughter. Such eyes, he murmured dreamily. His friend was silent. After a while, Oh, Lord, such eyes. My dear Harry, said Mouse with cold dignity, pray spare me your lyrics and go and write them in the porter's book at the private hotel. You could probably approach the lady without the formula of introduction. A bouquet would do it for you. Bransbeth shook his head mournfully. Not that sort, he said gloomily. And you needn't be in such a wax about it, Mouse. She's gone back to the continent this morning. They told me so at the hotel just now. And you did not go to Dover instead of coming here? Said his friend sarcastically. I'm amazed that old acquaintance had such a hold remaining on you as to make you resist the seductions of the tidal train. You can be nasty about it if you like said the handsome youth with sullen resignation. You make the mistake which all women make. You fly at a man when he tells you the truth, and then you are astonished another time that he tells you a lie. If there had been anything in it, of course, I shouldn't have told you anything. An admirable confession. I shall remember it another time. Women always make fellows lie. You bite our noses off if we ever happen to tell a word of truth. But it breaks my heart to think that you even see that other women exist, Harry. Oh, bother, said Bransbeth roughly. Don't be a fool, Mousie. You see other men exist fast enough yourself. She was silent. She was conscious that she did do so. Happily for the preservation of peace... There was at that moment announced Prince Christoph of Karstein. Her father, murmured Mousy in a swift whisper, but Branspeth was too obtuse to understand. He only stared, conscious that he had missed a tip. Prince Christoph was a bland, gracious person, who had been very fair in youth and early manhood and still preserved a delicate, clear complexion and eyes as blue and serene as Claire Kenilworth's. His hair was white and silken, his form slender and stately, his carriage elegant, and alas, there was not a good club in all the world into which he could take his charming presence. When the century was young, he had been born the seventh son of a then reigning duke in a small principality of green pasture and glacier-fed stream and pretty towns like magnified toys and many square leagues of resinous scented pine forest. The century had seen the principality absorbed, the dukedom mediatized, the towns ruined, and the pine woods leased to javish banks. As in many other cases, the gain of the empire had been the ruin of the province. Prince Christoph's elder brother still abode in his toy city, and hats were lifted as he passed, but he reigned no more. And Prince Christoph himself, who had been a colonel of cuirassiers in his cradle, and at ten years old had seen a sentinel flogged for omitting to carry arms when he had passed, was glad to furnish a mansion for Mr. Masserine and take forty per cent from decorators and dealers who, under his patronage, furnished the admirable Clodion and other rarities, beauties and luxuries to the adornment of Harrenden House. He felt it hard that when he had permitted his daughter to marry into finance, the misalliance had so little profited himself that he was driven to such expedients. But so it was, and though the descent had been gradual, it had been one which ended in Avernus, 
and royal and patrician society had shut all its great gates upon him, leaving him only its side entrances and back staircases. The man who could remember when he had been a child in his nurse's arms, seeing guards carry arms to salute him as he was borne past them, suffered acutely from his degradation. But he was beyond all things a philosopher, and thought that fine tobaccos and delicate wines soothe, if they do not cure, many wounds, even when you can only enjoy such things at the expense of your inferiors. This old beggar ought to know, thought Bransbeth, occupied with his new idea, and to whom Germans meant every nationality from Schleswig-Holstein to Moldavia, and he addressed the newcomer point-blank. "'Do you know a Countess Linar, sir?' "'I know a great many Linars,' replied the prince. "'It is a very general name. Can you add anything more definite?' "'She's the woman whom that Jew fellow, Vandalin, divorced,' replied Bransbeth. The prince smiled and coughed. <laughs> "'Olga Zulina! I know her, yes. She is my only daughter. Vandalin is a banker, but he is not a Jew.' Bransbeth grew very red. "'I, I beg you ten thousand pardons,' he muttered. I didn't know, you know. I'm always blundering. There is nothing to pardon, said Prince Chris sweetly. Englishmen are so insular. They never know anything about their neighbours across the water. It is perfectly well known everywhere out of England that my daughter was separated from Vanderlyn, but that you, my lord Brinsbeth, should not know is tout ce qu'il y a de plus naturel. He takes it uncommonly coolly, thought Bransbeth, still under the spell of his astonishment, and still distressed as an Englishman always is at having made a stupid mistake and wounded an acquaintance. But is she married again? he asked anxiously. How does she come to be Lenar? Dear youth, you are not discreet thought the prince as he replied frankly that her mother had been a Countess Linar, and that his daughter had taken her mother's name, he was himself never very sure why. But she was always a little self-willed and fanciful. She was a woman, femme très femme. When she had married into la haute finance, she had of course forfeited her place in the Hofkalenda. But her maiden name is there. He turned over the leaves of the Almanac de Gotha and pointed to the entry of the birth of his daughter, the Countess Olga Marie Valeria. Why does she call herself Countess Linar? said Bransbeth with curiosity, conscious of his own bad manners. Prince Chris pointed to the page. It was her mother's name, you see, and more than that, in the property which my daughter possesses, there is a little Schloss Linar, hardly more than a ruin, hidden under woods in Swabia, which gives that title to whoever owns it. Were you to purchase it, you would have the right to write yourself Graf zu Linar. I would rather own the lady than the castle, said Bransbeth too stupid and too careless to note the deepening offense in the eyes of Mouse. Prince Chris smiled meaningly. The lady might give you the more trouble of the two. How he hates her, thought Bransbeth. I suppose she keeps a tight rein on the property. Bransbeth's experiences, which had been extensive in range, though brief in years, had told him that these family dislikes and disagreements usually had their roots in the auri sacra famis, and the fact was well known all over Europe that this serene, courtly, distinguished-looking gentleman, whose name was recorded in the Hofkalenda, lived very nearly, if not entirely, by his wits. 
High play is one thing, cheating is another. If you ruin yourself, it is your own affair. But if you try to ruin others by unfair means, it is the affair of your neighbors. Prince Christoph's mind was so made that he had never been able to perceive or comprehend the difference. Of late years, the meaning of that difference had been enforced on him disagreeably. I suspect he is the devil and all to have anything to do with at close quarters, reflected Bransbeth, who was a very cautious young man. And what a mess he's made of his life, good lord, with all his cleverness and position. Why, a decent croupier's ten thousand times better fellow. He'll rook you like winking if he can get you down at Ecarté. And she came over here to see you, I suppose, inquired Bransbeth still curious. Scarcely, said the prince with a fleeting smile. Wouldn't you give me a word of introduction? said Bransbeth hurriedly and conscious of his own temerity. To my daughter? said the prince blandly. My dear lord, I should of course be delighted to do so. Delighted, but I am not on speaking terms with her. I don't call her on myself. How can I send anybody else to call? What did you quarrel about? asked Harry bluntly. Who was right? Prince Chris looked at him with amusement. It was so droll to find people who asked questions like children, instead of finding out things quietly for themselves. To his finer and more philosophic intelligence, such a primitive question as right could not seriously affect anything. He thought the young Englishman a fool, an impertinent and dense fool. But he was never impatient of fools. They were so useful to him in the long run. What wise man would be able to play écarté unless there were fools with whom to play it? Of course, the divorce was all Vandalin's fault said Bransbeth with clumsy curiosity. It is always the man's fault in such cases that is well known. Prince Chris smiled as he spoke. There was something sardonic and suggestive about the smile which made it almost a grin, and which seemed singularly ugly to Bransbeth, considering that the person concerned was the grinner's only daughter. No one could more completely or more cruelly have expressed the speaker's conviction that Vanderlyn was entirely blameless in this matter. Mouse listened in extreme irritation. It seemed to be beyond even her Harry's usual obtuseness to continue the theme of a woman's indiscretions to that woman's own father. Besides, she hated women who were divorced. They made it so difficult and unpleasant for the wiser members of their sex. My daughter seems to have impressed you, Lord Bransbeth, continued the prince. Where is it that you have seen her? At the oratory, said Bransbeth, and in the street. She is so awfully fetching, you know. She is a woman who makes people look at her, replied Prince Christoph indifferently. Did you hear her sing at the oratory? She has a voice, ah, such a voice, the most flexible mezzo-soprano. She could have made her fortune on the stage. No, she didn't sing, said Bransbeth, greatly interested. She seemed to pray to no end, and she cried. But she cried so beautifully, not as most of them do who make such figures of themselves, but the tears just brimming in her eyes and falling, like what do you call em, you know, the Magdalens in the picture galleries. The prince laughed outright. For felicitous illusion, your Englishman has never an equal, he thought, whilst he said aloud, My dear lord, what did I tell you? Olga is femme très femme. If I wanted to weep, I should not go to the oratory myself. But a woman does go. It is a consolation to her to be admired and pitied. 
and I have no doubt she observed that you did both. She didn't even see me, said the younger man, on whose not oversensitive nerves something in the elder's tone grated. Her father don't do much to save her character, he thought. It's an ill bird fouls its own nest. Meanwhile, Mouse had listened with scarcely concealed impatience to all these questions and answers. She sat apparently engrossed in the pages of the Almanac de Gotha, but in reality losing nothing of her friend's interrogations and implications. At last, out of patience, she closed the little red book and said imperiously to Bransbeth, "'Surely it is time you went on, guard. "'Have you any idea what time it is? "'Besides, if you don't mind my saying so, "'I want to talk about something to the prince "'before I go for my drive. "'I aren't on guard today, but I'll go, of course, "'if you want me to go,' murmured Bransbeth sulkily, "'raising his lazy long limbs out of his comfortable resting place "'with a sense of regret.' for he would willingly have gone on talking about the lady of the oratory for another hour. "'Such a dear good boy, but always wanting intact,' said Lady Kenilworth as the door of the morning room closed on him. "'Wanting in reason, too, to talk of an other woman when he is in the presence of Lady Kenilworth. What obtuseness, what blindness!' said Prince Chris with graceful gallantry. But Englishmen are always like that. They go all round the world and see nothing but their own umbrellas. They keep on their heads in St. Peter's and set up their codex at the Taj Mahal. I have always said that a people who could conquer India and yet clothe their viceroy in a red cloth tunic are a people without perception. They travel, but they remain islanders. Their minds are enfolded in their bath towels and sanitary flannels. They do not see beyond the rim of their tubs. But I believe you did me the honor to wish to speak to me. I need not say that if there be the smallest thing in which I can be of service, you commend my devotion." Mouse sat, dreamily and irritably opening and shutting the almanac de Gotha. Prince Christoph wore a wholly altered aspect to her, now that she saw him as the father of a woman whom Harry admired and had followed. "'Do you know, such is my insularity, that I never knew you had a daughter or had had a wife,' she said abruptly, as she pushed the book away. "'Dear madame, you surely have not sent for me to speak of these two ladies,' he said, picking up the little red book. "'My deceased wife's name is here, if you choose to look for it. My daughter's is not because she exiled herself into the haute finance. I once had the entire collection of this almanac since its beginning in 1760.' If we want to know how despicably modern editions fall below the standard of all work of the last century, nothing will show us that fact more completely and conclusively than this almanac. Contrast the commonplace portraits of today's Gotha with the exquisite designs of the 18th century calendars. Yes, said Mouse shortly. Yes, no doubt. You are always right in matters of art. "'My dear Prince, how very admirably you have housed those people at Harrington House. "'If only the birds were worthy the nest.' "'Aha! It was for this, was it, that you wanted to see me?' he thought, as he said aloud. "'I suggest it. I merely suggest it. I am delighted the result meets your approval. "'They are excellent people, those good Masserines.' You remember that I told you so in Paris. Des bons gens, de très bons gens. A little uncouth, but the world likes what is simple and fresh. She looked at him to see if he could really say all this with a serious countenance. She saw that he could. His handsome fair features were without the ghost of a smile, and his whole expression was grave, sincere, 
attuned to admiring candor. If he takes it like that, I had best take it so too, thought Mouse, who was aware that she was but a mere beginner and baby beside him in the delicate arts of dissimulation. But nature had made her proud, inclined to be blunt and sarcastic, and occasionally unwisely inclined to frankness. She looked him straight in the eyes now and said, But you and I are going to do our duty to our fellow Christians and polish them, aren't we? I was quite straight with you about the purchase of Vale Royale, but you weren't so straight with me about Herendon House. Don't you think, Prince, we can do our friends more good if we are friends ourselves? Quarrelling is always a mistake. He bowed and smiled. His smooth, delicate features expressed neither annoyance nor pleasure, neither wonder nor surprise. I am always Lady Kenilworth's devoted servant, he said graciously with the air of a suzerain accepting homage. I am sorry you think that I should have consulted you about the town house, he added. It did not occur to me. You were in Egypt. I never offend or forget those who wish me well. Of that you may be sure. It was amusing to arrange that house, and one could be of so much use to artists and other deserving people of talent. Mouse laughed rather rudely and her laughter brought a slight angry flush to the cheek of Prince Chris. He had both noble and royal blood in his veins, and at the sound of that derisive little laugh he could have strangled her with pleasure. By an odd contradiction, Lady Kenilworth offended him by precisely that same kind of bluntness and nakedness of speech with which her brother had offended herself the delicate euphemisms which she expected to have used to please herself seemed to her altogether ridiculous when they were required by another person. English women are always so coarse, he thought. They never understand veiled phrases. They will call their spate a spate. There is no need to do so, whether you are digging a grave with it or digging for gold. It can always be a drawing-room fire-shovel for other people, whatever work it may accomplish. Yes, you are quite right, dear lady, he added after a slight pause. The task is not a light one. We will divide its difficulties. I have experience that you have not yet gained. You have influence that I have, alas, lost. Let us take counsel together. Our friends, the Messerines, are good people, excellent people. It is a pleasure to guide them in the way they should go. He remained with her half an hour, and only left her when it was announced that her carriage was waiting below. He kissed her hand with all the reverential grace which a fine gentleman can lend to his farewell. But as he descended the staircase and went into the street, he swore under his breath, There is no devil like a blonde devil, he thought. Mouse, they call her. A rat, a rat, with teeth as sharp as nails and claws which can cling like a flying bat. It is little use for the world to have made women all these thousands of years. She remains just what she was in Eve's time, in Eryphile's time, always the same, always purchasable, always venal, always avaricious. Ah, why was this rodent not my daughter? We could have made the world our oyster, and no one should have known the taste of an oyster but ourselves. Whilst he passed along Stanhope Street and into the park, his own daughter was standing in a room of a secluded and aristocratic hotel in the Faubourg Saint-Germain, where she had arrived that morning. She was dressed in black, with three strings of pearls round her throat. They were the pearls she had worn on her ill-fated marriage day. She was a woman of singular beauty, the kind of beauty which resists sorrow and time and ennobles even the mask of death. With her was one of her cousins, Ernst von Karstein, 
the only one of her family who had been faithful to her through good and evil report, who had loved her always before the marriage and after it, but who had always known that he could look for no response from her. You are always well, Olga, he was saying now. What amulet have you? I imagine, she answered, that my talisman consists in absolute indifference as to whether I be ill or well. That is blasphemy, said her companion. No one can be indifferent to health. Ill health intensifies every other evil and saps the roots of every enjoyment. Yet to lie on a sick bed at peace with men and God and surrounded by those we love, would that be so sad a fate? You speak of what you know nothing about. You are never ill. You grow morbid, Olga. You live like a nun. You see no one. The finest mind cannot resist the morbid influences of constant solitude. Whoever your pope is, you should ask his dispensation from such vows. The law has clearly been my pope, and has set me free of all vows. I live thus because I do not care to live otherwise. I should have thought you too proud a woman to accept excommunication in this submissive way. She smiled a little. Proud? I? The daughter of Christoph of Karstein and the divorced wife of Adrian Wanderlin? Curse them both, said her cousin under his breath. You have been in London, he said aloud. A week, yes, my father's affairs as usual. You never see him? Never. See the man who ruined my life? But you have no proof of that. She smiled again, very sadly. A crime which can be proved is half undone. He was too wary to be traced in all these schemes of infamy. Yet you befriend him? Befriend? That is not the word. I spent my mother's money on him for her sake. One saves him at least from public disgrace. But he games away all he gets and continues to live in the way you know. I do not think you should waste your substance on him. Keep it for yourself and return to the world. On sufferance, as a déclassé? Never. As my wife. I have said so many times, I never change, Olga. She held out her hand to him with a noble and grateful gesture. You are always faithful. You alone. I thank you. But you must leave me to my fate, dear Ernst. It is not your power to change it. It would be in my power if you gave me the mandate. But it is that which I cannot do, which I shall never do. Because you still love the man who repudiated and disgraced you. She shrank a little, as at a blow. One cannot love and unlove at will, she said simply. It is very generous of you to be ready to give the shield of your unblemished honor to a dishonored woman. But were I ungenerous, unworthy enough to accept such a sacrifice, I should but make you and make myself more unhappy than we now are. All the feeling which is still alive in me, only for the memory of the past. Her cousin turned away and paced the room to hide the pain he felt. He had loved her through good and evil report, had remained unmarried for her sake, and was ready now to accept all obloquy, censure, and discredit for her sake. Go, my dear Ernst, she said very gently. Go and forget me. You might as well love a buried corpse as love a woman with such a fate as mine. My love should have power to magnetize the corpse into fresh life. She shook her head. It would be impossible. Were it possible, what use would be a galvanized corpse? An unnatural, unreal thing which would drop back into the dust of death. He did not reply. He endeavored to control his emotion. My dear Olga, he said when he could do so, allow me to say one thing to you without causing you offense. 
unknown to yourself, I think you cherish an illusion which can only cause you unhappiness. You think and speak as if your division from Adrian van der Linn were some quarrel, some mistake, which explanation, mediation or time could clear away. You forget that you are entire strangers to each other, worse than strangers because there is an irrevocable chasm between you. She did not reply. An expression of intense suffering came into her eyes, but she restrained any outward utterance of it. It hurts me to say these harsh things to you, he continued. I would so much sooner encourage you in your sentiment. But to what end should I do so? You are a woman of deep and passionate feeling. You do not forget. You do not change. Your little boy's grave is to you what Bethlehem was to the early Christians. Vandalin is to you what Ulysses was to Penelope. You never seem to realize that this pest to which you cling is a wholly dead thing, no more to be imbued again with the breath of life than the body of your poor child, or the marble which lies over him. It is intolerable that a woman as young, as lovely, as rich, as admired, and as admirable as you should pass your years in obscurity, fettered to a pack of useless memories like a living person to a corpse. I have told you so often, I shall never cease to tell you so. What do you expect? What do you hope? What do you desire? Nothing. The world was cold, incisive, harsh. He tortured her, but she did not give any sign of pain, except by the nervous gesture with which her fingers closed on the string of pearls at her throat, as if they were a collier de force which compressed and suffocated her. No one lives without desires or ends of some kind, however absurd or unattainable they may be, he said with truth. I think you deceive yourself. I think that, without your being sensible of it, you brood so much over the past because you fancy vaguely that you will evolve some kind of future out of it. As necromancers used to stare into a crystal until they saw the future suggested in its surface. The crystal gave them nothing but what their own imagination supplied. So it is with you. Your imagination makes you see in Vanderlyn a man who does not exist and never existed. And it also makes you fancy possible some kind of reconciliation or friendship which is as totally impossible as if you and he were both in your coffins. She had turned from the window and walked to and fro the room, unwilling that he should see the emotion which his blunt speech awakened in her. There was a certain truth in them, which she could not wholly deny, and of which she was ashamed. Do not let us speak of these things. It is useless, she said with impatience. You do not understand. You are a man. How can you comprehend all that there is ineffaceable, unforgettable, for a woman in four years of the tenderest and closest union? Nothing can destroy it for her. For a man it is a mere episode, more or less agreeable, more or less tenacious in its hold on him, but to her... She stopped abruptly. Her companion looked at her with admiration and compassion mingled in equal parts, and he smiled slightly. My dear Olga, once in a hundred years a woman is born who takes such a view as you do of love and life. They are dear to poets and furnish the themes of the most moving dramas. But they are women who invariably end miserably, either in a cloister like Heloise, or in a tomb like Juliet, or simply and more prosaically, with tubercles on their lungs at Yer or the Canaries. You know the world, or you used to know it. You must be aware that there are millions of women who in your place would have consoled themselves long ago. 
I want you to see the unwisdom and the uselessness of such self-sacrifice. I want you to resume your place in the world. I want you to realize that life is like the earth. There is the winter, more or less long. No doubt, but afterward there is the spring. You know that poem of Sully Prudhomme, in which he imagines that all the plants agree to refrain from bearing flowers a whole year. But that year has never been seen in fact. That poem is wrong artistically and scientifically. Of the earth, yes. But in the human soul there are so many spots stricken with barrenness forever. But not at your age. What has age to do with it? He sighed. He felt the use of argument, the futility of entreaty. Are you not too proud, a woman? He said at length, to sit in the dust with ashes on your hand, smitten to the ground by an unjust sentence? I have told you all my pride is dead, not for a year like Sully Prudhomme's flowers, but forever. And you forgive the man who killed it? The blood mantled in her face. That is a question I cannot allow, even to you, dear Ernst. He was silenced. And you are going back to the owls and the bitterns of Schloss Linar? He asked as he took his leave of her half an hour later. What a life for you, that Swabian solitude. The bitterns and owls are very good company, and at least they never offend me. Let me be as fortunate, he said with a sigh. I may return tomorrow. Yes, I do not leave until evening. When he had left her, she remained lost in the sadness of her own useless thoughts for some moments. Then she put on a long black cloak, a veil which hid her features, and went out in the street saying nothing to the two servants who traveled with her or to the servant of the hotel. She went out into the street and crossed the Seine by the bridge of Henri IV, her elegance of form and her height making some of the passers-by pause and stare, wondering who she could be, alone, on foot, and so closely veiled. One man followed and accosted her, but he did not dare persevere. She went straight on her way to the Rue de Rivoli, for she had known Paris well and loved it as we love a place which has been the seat of our happiness. It was near the end of a gray and chilly day. The lights were glittering everywhere, and the animation of a great and popular thoroughfare was at its height. The noise of traffic and the haste of crowds made her ears ache with sound, so used as she now was to the absolute silence of her Swabian solitude a silence only broken by the rush of wind or water. She approached a very large and stately building which looked like a palace blent with a prison. It was the French house of business of the great Paris and Berlin financiers, Vanderlyn et Compagnie. She walked towards it and passed it very slowly, whilst its electric lamps shed their rays upon her. She passed it and turned, and passed it and turned again, and as often as she could do so without attracting attention from the throngs or from the police. There was a mingling of daylight and lamplight. Above-head cumuli clouds were driven before a north wind. She waited on a mere chance, the chance of seeing one whom she had not seen for eight years pass out of a small private door to his carriage. She knew his hours, his habits. Probably, she thought, they had not changed. She was rewarded, if it could be called reward. As she passed the façade for the eighth time, and those on guard before the building began to watch her suspiciously, she saw a tall man come out of that private doorway and crossed the pavement to a coupé waiting by the curbstone. In a moment he had entered it. The door had closed on him, 
the horses had started down the Rue de Rivoli. She had seen the man who had repudiated and dishonored her, the only man she had ever loved, the father of her dead boy. Does he even remember? She wondered as she turned away and was lost amongst the crowds in the falling night. End of section 7 Read by Henry K. Noble in Washington, D.C. on February 22, 2023. Chapter 8 of the Masserines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Masserines by Weeder. If you get into a bad set, I tell you frankly, I shall never help you out of it. A bad set is a bog, a hopeless bog. You flounder on in it till you sink. Can't you understand? If you're going to be taken up by this kind of people, don't ask me to do any more for you. That's all. I don't want to be unkind. It must be one thing or another. I cannot come here if I am likely to meet persons whom I won't know. Anybody would say the same. She spoke with severity as to a chidden child, as she lighted a cigarette and put it between her rose-leaf lips. She was in the boudoir of Harrendon House, and Margaret Masserine listened in humble and dejected silence to the rebuke. The bone of contention was represented by two visiting cards, on which were printed respectively... Lady Mary Altringham and Lady Linlithgow. The bearers of those names had just been turned away from the gate below by order of the fair consul and the mistress of Harrendon House. Being a primitive person to whom a want of hospitality appeared a crime was swallowing her tears under difficulty. But surely these ladies are high and all that, ma'am, she pleaded piteously in her ignorance. They were born, if you mean that, replied Mouse with great impatience. Lady Mary was a Fitzfrederick, and the Linlithgow was a Knott's Buller. But they are nowhere. They have put themselves out of court. No one worth thinking of knows them. They can do you no good, and they can do you a great deal of harm. Mrs. Masserine puckered up in her fingers the fine cambric of her handkerchief. But I know Lady Mary, ma'am. Drop her, then. What have she done, ma'am? Oh, lots of things. Gone wrongly, stupidly. Turned the county against her. A boy's tutor and a young artist who went down to paint the ballroom. And all that kind of silly public sort of thing. People don't speak to her, even in the hunting field. She can't show herself at court. The girls were presented by their grandmother. She is completely tarée. Completely. Portrait was somewhat heavily loaded with colours but she knew that her hero would not be impressed by semitones or monochrome, and she really could not have Lady Mary coming and going at Harrington House. As for the other woman, she added, there is nothing actually against her, but she is bad form. They are as poor as Job and riddled with debts. They have even been glad to let their eldest daughter marry the banker of their county borough. To her humble companion to whom not so very long before a banker's clerk had seemed a functionary to be addressed as sir, and viewed with deep respect, this social error did not carry a deep dye of iniquity. But she abandoned Lady Linlithgow, for the other culprit she ventured to plead. Lady Mary was so very kind to my child, she murmured timidly. When Kathleen was at school, before we came over, Lady Mary's own daughters. What has that to do with it? I tell you, her daughters go out with their grandmother. You know nothing of all these things. You must do as you are told. You remember your blunder about my aunt Corsi? This reminiscence was a whip of nettles, which always lay ready to her monitress's hand, and the monitress used it with great effect. But such a blunder still seemed natural to her. Mrs Cecil Corsi was a commoner, and these ladies who had just been turned from her gates were titled people. Why was the one at the apex of fashion, and the others nowhere, as her monitress expressed it? She hinted timidly at this singular discrepancy, so unintelligible to the socially untutored mind. 
How is it possible to make you understand, said Mouse, lighting a second cigarette before the first was half consumed, after the wasteful manner of female smokers? Rank by itself is nothing at all. At least, well, yes, of course, it is something. But when people have got on the wrong side of the post, they are of no use socially to anybody. It isn't what you do, it's how you do it. You know there is an old adage, some mustn't look in at a church door and others may steal all the church plate. It is always so in this world. Lady Mary's muffed her life, as the boys say. I dare say there are worse women, but there isn't one so stupid in all the three kingdoms who goes driving all alone with a tutor, who makes a pet of a little two-sous Belgian fresco painter, who gets herself talked about with the attorney of her own town. Nobody who has a grain of sense. These are things which put a woman out of society at once and forever. I must beg you to try and understand one most essential fact. There are people extremely well born who are shady and there are others come from heaven knows where who are chic. It is due to tact more than anything else. Tact is, after all, the master of the ceremonies of life. It isn't Burke or Debrett who can tell you who to know and who to avoid. There is no court circular published which can show you where the ice won't bear you and where it will, whom you may only know out of England and whom you may safely know in it. There are no hard and fast rules about the thing, but you haven't been born to that kind of knowledge. You must grope about till you pick it up. I am very much afraid you will never pick it up. You will never know a princess without her gilt coach and six. You will never recognise an empress in a waterproof and galoshes, and you will never grasp the fact that supreme, inexorable and omnipotent fashion may be a little pale shabby creature like my aunt Corsi, who pinches and screws about Groshen, but who can make or mar people in society just as she pleases. Margaret Masserine winced. She had seen Mrs Cecil Corsi that very day in the park, driving with the Queen of Denmark, who was on a visit to Marlborough House. All these niceties of shade confused her utterly. Society is just like Aspinall's enamels, she thought in her bewilderment. And if you wanted a plain yellow, you were confused by a score of gradations, varying from palest lemon to deepest orange. There were no plain yellows any more. But I've always been told, if one's pile's big, really big, one can always go anywhere, she ventured to say, unconscious of the cynical character of her remark. You can go to court here, if that's your ideal. You do go, replied her teacher, with a slight accent of contempt, which sounded like high treason to the mind of the Ulster loyalist. But it don't follow. You can get in elsewhere. It just depends on lots of chances. Some people never get into the world at all, merely because they don't spend their money cleverly at the onset. Perhaps they spare the spigot and pour out at the bunghole, my lady, said Mrs Masserine in homely metaphor. There's a many has that fault. I have it myself. It's all I can do still to hold myself from saving the candle end. Good heavens, do you really mean it? I do indeed, ma'am, said the mistress of Harrington House. When I see them beautiful wax lights... Just burned an inch or two, and going to be taken away by them wasteful servants. Her companion laughed, infinitely diverted. But it's all electric light here. Not in the bedrooms. I wouldn't have the uncanny thing in the bedrooms. You see, my lady, she added timidly, in confidential whispers, William should have led me up to all this grandeur gradual, but he didn't. He always said, was scrape on this side and dash on the other. So till we come over to be gentlefolks, I had to cook and sweep and pinch and spare and toil and moil, and I can't get out of the habit. On the child he always spent, but on naught else, not a cent, till we came to Europe. Ah, oh, by the way, this daughter, said Mouse, suddenly roused to the perception that there was an unknown factor in the lives of these humble people. Where is she? I have never seen her. She's out, I think. Over the pallid, puffy, sorrowful face of the poor, harassed aspirant to smart society, there came a momentary brightness. Yes, ma'am, she's what you call out. I presented her myself, said Mrs. Masserine with pride. But where is she now? Kathleen, 
Catherine is in India, my lady. Good gracious, why? Well, she's great friends with the Marquis of Framlington's daughters, said Mrs. Masserin, feeling sure this time she was safe. What? Sherry and Bitters, cried Lady Kenilworth. Sherry and Bitters was the nickname, which his caustic but ever courteous wit has earned for Lord Framlingham in that London world which he had left for an Indian presidency. She was vexed with herself for not having thought sooner of asking for this daughter and taking her under her own wing. Mrs. Masserine was bewildered by the exclamation, but she was sure of her ground this time and was not alarmed. Lord and Lady Framlingham, ma'am, she repeated with zest. It's cruel hard on me to lose her for so long, but as they're such grand folks, one couldn't in reason object. Grand folks, repeated her visitor with amusement. Poor dear souls, how amused they be. They'd have been sold up if they hadn't gone out. She hated going, said she'd rather live on a crust in England, but he jumped at the appointment. He'd a whole yelling pack of Jews on him. It's quieted them, of course, and he's let Saxe Durham for the term. You'd better tell your husband not to lend him any money, for he never pays. He can't pay. He's sure to get your daughter to ask. Lord sakes, my lady, murmured Margaret Masserine. Life became altogether inexplicable to her. If a gentleman who was a marquis and governor of a province twice as big as France, they said, were not everything he ought to be, where could excellence and solvency be looked for? Oh, vertu, où vas-tu te nicher, she would have said, if she'd ever heard of the line. But they are very, very good people, are they not, ma'am? she asked pathetically. Oh dear, yes. She is much too ugly to be anything else, and he is a very good fellow, though he does make himself hated with his sharp tongue. He's like that monarch, you know, who never did a wise thing and never said a silly one. He's awfully clever, but he can't keep his head above water. But why on earth did you let your daughter go for so long? They'll get marrying her to one of their boys. They've no end of them. She was not pleased that the young woman was staying with Lord Framlingham. He was a very clever and sarcastic person who might supply his guest with inconvenient and premature knowledge of English society in general and of Cocky and herself in particular. Mrs. Masserine smoothed down her beautiful gown with a nervous, worried gesture. Oh, ma'am, Catherine's very discreet, and by her letters she seems to be thinking about is the white temples and the black men. There are no black men in India, and you'd have done much better to keep her at home, said her visitor sharply. What is she like? She intended this young woman for her brother Ronald, whatever she might be like. Paternal pride made Mrs. Masserine's inexpressive and commonplace face for once eloquent and not ordinary. Its troubled and dreary expression of chronic bewilderment lighted and changed. Her wide mouth smiled. Her colourless eyes grew almost bright. If you'll honour me, ma'am, by stepping this way, she said with alacrity as she rose. Horses step, people don't, said Lady Kenilworth unkindly as she accompanied the person, whose instructress and tormentor she was, into a smaller room, in which, set as it were upon an altar, a white marble bust stood on a plinth of jasper, with a fence of hothouse flowers round it. Hanging on the wall behind was a portrait. Lady Kenilworth looked critically, at both bust and portrait. She was surprised to find them what they were. Classic-faced and clever, she said to the anxious mother. Are they at all like the busts d'Alou, isn't it, and the portrait? They are both the image of her, ma'am, said Mrs. Masserine, with great triumph in the effect which they produced. But the marble pleases me best. Lady Kenilworth was still looking at them critically, through her double eyeglass. She was thinking that the original of that straight and somewhat severe profile was perhaps as well in India, until Prince Chris and she had tired of the Masserine vein. On the other hand, unless the girl came home, she would not be married to Hurstmonceau. Your daughter isn't facile, is she? she asked abruptly. What, ma'am? asked the mother, gazing with tears in her eyes, delicious tears, at the bus which would have passed as an Athene or a Cleo. Well, not easy to deal with, not easy to make believe things, likes her own way, don't she? Well, ma'am, said Mrs. Masserine doubtfully. Sweet tempered she is, and forgetful of self to a fault and I wouldn't lay blame to her as obstinate. 
But if you mean as how she can be firm, well, she can. And if you mean as how she can have opinions, well, she have. Lady Kenilworth laughed, but she was vexed. That's what I do mean. Nobody has that straight profile for nothing. Where did she get it? Lord, ma'am, however should I know, said the mother meekly. She don't take after either of us, that's a fact. The children pick up their own looks in heaven, I think, for often nobody can account for them on earth. Look at your own little dears. What black eyes they all have, and you and my lord so fair. I met them in the park this morning, my lady. Would you let them come and see me some day? Lady Kenilworth, to her own extreme amazement and annoyance, felt herself colour as the straightforward gaze of this common woman looked in sincerity and in ignorance at her. The children shall certainly come to see you if you wish, she said, but they are naughty little people. They will bother you horribly. And pray, my dear woman, don't say, my lady, you set all my nerves on edge. Mrs. Masserine humbly excused herself. It comes natural, she said with a sigh. I was dairy maid at the hall. William can't bear me to say I was, but I don't see as it matters. William is right, said Lady Kenilworth with a glance at the bust, and I am sure your daughter will say so too. Mrs. Masserine shook her head. Kathleen is quite the other way, ma'am. She says we can't be quality, and why should we pretend to? She angers her father terrible, to tell you the truth. She angers him so terrible that it was for that reason I gave in about this long visit to India. She is not of her time then, said Lady Kenilworth. I am afraid she gets those ideas from Framlingham. He is a downright radical. I don't know where she gets them, said Mrs. Masserine drearily. William always said the only comfort about a girl was that a girl couldn't spite you in politics as a boy might. But if her ideas aren't politics, and the worst sort of politics, I don't know what is. And when you've kept a daughter ten years and more at school, where nobody else goes as isn't titled, it's a cross as one doesn't look for to have her turned out a Republican. Lady Kenilworth laughed with genuine mirth which showed all her pretty teeth, white and even and pointed like a puppy's. Is she a Republican? Well, that's a popular creed enough now. I'm not sure it wouldn't get you on better than being on our side. The radicals do such a lot for their people, and do it seriously, without a grimace. We always put our tongue in our cheek while we do it, she was about to add, when a sense of the imprudence of her confession arrested her utterance of it. I do wonder, you know, that you belong to us, she hastened to add with an air of candour, which so often stood her in good stead. You would have found Howarden easier of access than Hatfield. Margaret Mazarine stared. But William's principles, ma'am, she murmured, church and state and property. William says them three stand or fall together. And he will hold them all up on his shoulders, like a carrier tid, said Lady Kenilworth with her most winning smile. Mrs. Mazarine smiled too, blankly, because she did not understand, but gratefully, because she felt that a compliment was intended. I can't think, though, that it is wise of him to allow this visit. I think it is exceedingly ill-advised to let her be away from you so long, said her visitor, still gazing through her eyeglass at Deleuze's bust, and reflecting as she gazed. The young woman must be odious, but she is good-looking, and Ronnie shall marry her. You don't know my brother, she said apparently abruptly, but in her own mind, following out her thoughts. Meaning Lord Hurstman so? No, ma'am. We haven't that honour. We call it her so, please. Oh, indeed, as you say. A born for Otterborn, and Kersum for Kersterhome. Might I ask why those names are cut about so, ma'am? Usage. Why do we say Gore for Gower, and Selinger for St. Ledger? Rebecca Gower was postmistress at Kilrathy when I was a girl, said Mrs. Masserine reflectively. But Lord, if anybody had clipped her down to Gore, their letters would have all gone in the swill tub. You see, we have not the privilege of acquaintance with the postmistress of Kilrathy. Well, I must try and bring my brother to see you. But he is like your daughter. He is not facile, like all those reactionary sort of people. He thinks nobody good enough to know. I never can induce him. To make a new acquaintance. But perhaps if he sees this Dalou, with a pretty smile, she left the unfinished sentence to sink into the mind of Catherine Masserine's mother. 
that simple and candid personage answered the unspoken thought. We've had a many asking for Kathleen's hand, ma'am, she said very stupidly. But neither she or William are easy to please in that way. He looks so high as naught but kings would satisfy him. And she, well, I don't know what she wants, I'm sure. And I don't think she knows herself. Perhaps she's in love with Framlingham, cried her companion with a disagreeable little laugh, for she was provoked at her unplayed cards being discerned by a person of such limited intelligence. Married man, ma'am, cried Mrs. Masserine, with a countenance so pallid from horror that Lady Kenilworth laughed as heartily as if she were hearing Yvette Gilbert sing. Oh, my good woman, how much you have got to learn, she cried gaily. Mrs. Masserine patted her gown a little irritably, but she dared not resent, though it seemed to her that, after all, her William had done for this lovely young lady. It was hard to be called by her a good woman. I'll never learn to break the holy commandments, ma'am, she said in a tone of offence. Oh, you dear droll creature, cried her visitor, more and more amused. But let us go over your lists, she said sharply, realising she was wasting valuable time on this goose. They will want no end of weeding. I will not meet anybody who is not in my own set. You'll get the right people if you don't mix them with the wrong. With her little gold pencil as a stiletto, she set to work mercilessly on her work of expurgation and execution. Mrs. Masserine looked on, helpless but agitated. A sense of wrath was stirring in her mild bosom but she dared not show it. To be called a good woman, she thought, just as I'd speak to the match-seller at the corner of a street. The lists, thus weeded, with such pitiless surgery, produced very brilliant gatherings at Harrington House, and the falconer of Clodion saw nearly all that was fairest and noblest pass up the grand staircase which he guarded. Margaret Masserine, standing till she was ready to drop at the entrance of her reception rooms, felt her head swim under her tiara as she heard the great names announced by Winters. The Masserine pile had been touched by the magic wand which could transform it into fashion. To go to Harrington House became the amusement of the great and the ambition of all lesser folks. Not to go to Harrington House became soon a confession that you were nobody yourself. Tenez la draguie ut, said their guide, philosopher and friend, and she made them very exclusive indeed and would let no one snub them or laugh at them except herself. Oh, my soul, she do give worth for her money, thought William Masserine, and he was pleased to feel he had not been fooled even when he had bought a barren Scotch estate and compromised his credit in the city by putting a consumptive little sot on the board of a bank. Why don't you bespeak the Masserine young woman for me, Mouse? said Ransopeth in the boudoir of Stanhope Street when he heard of the bust of Dalou and the portrait of Orchardson. "'How exactly like a man,' said his friend, blue fire flashing from her eyes. "'A little while ago you were mad about the Countess Linnar. "'It's uncommon like a man to get a pot of money when he can,' said Brunspeth, with amusement. "'If you did your duty by me, you'd bespeak me those loaves and fishes. "'You'd do what you like with the blooming cad. "'I would sooner see you dead than married.' I be bound you would, muttered the young man. Lord, that's the sort of thing women call love. Men's love is so disinterested, we know, said Mouse, with withering contempt. You want the young woman for Ronnie, continued Brantspeth. That's your little game, but he won't take your tip. Why not? Because he's the cursedest crank in all Judy. Let Ronnie please himself and get me the Mazarine dollars. I'll give you half I get, and I shan't know whether she's a snub nose or a straight one. Mouse coloured with anger. There are things when, however necessary it might be to do them, cannot be spoken of without offence. How odiously coarse you grow, she observed with severity. Oh, bother! You call a spade a spade fast enough sometimes. How you do make me think of my old Granny Luce. In what do I resemble your old Granny Luce? Brantspeth was mute. To repeat what his maternal grandmother had said would not pour oil on troubled waters. What the very free-spoken and sharp-tongued old lady Luce had said was this, when Brantspeth was still in the sixth form at Eton. You're such a pretty boy, Harry. The women folks will be after you like wasps after treacle. Take my advice. Whatever you do, steer clear of the married ones. 
A married woman always has such a lot of trumps up her sleeve. She sticks like a burr. You can pay off a wench, but you can't pay off her. And if her fancy man tries to get away, she calls in her husband, and there's the devil and all to pay. Don't you forget that, Harry. But he had forgotten it. I think I'll go up and see the little beggars, he said, to make a diversion. And he slipped away before she could stop him, and went up, four stairs at a time, to the nurseries. There he was extremely popular and much beloved, especially by Jack. And there he was perfectly happy, being a young man of simple tastes, limited intelligence, and affectionate disposition. He was in the midst of an uproarious game of romps there one day, when Cocky looked in from the doorway with an odd little smile. What a good part of familius you'll be, Harry, when your time comes, he said, with a look which made poor Harry colour to the roots of his hair. The head nurse intervened by calling to order noisy, laughing little Jack. Don't you see your dear papa at the door, Lord Kersham, said that discreet woman. This day, there was no cocky in the doorway, but the blind man's buff was early in its merry course, interrupted by a message from Lady Kenilworth requesting his presence downstairs. Oh, Lord, what a pity, said Branspeth, as he pulled the handkerchief off his eyes, swung Jack up above his head, and then kissed him a dozen times. I wasn't doing any harm, he said sulkily, as he re-entered the presence of Jack's mother. Yes, you were, she said coldly. I cannot allow you to be upstairs with the children, so long and so constantly. Their women must think it very odd. They will talk. No other of my husband's friends enters the nurseries. You must have something to do at the barracks, or the clubs, or the stables, or somewhere. Go and do it. Branspeth hung his head. He understood what his punishment would be if he dreamed of marrying the Masserine heiress or any other person whatsoever. Not to see the children any more, except as any other of Cocky's friends saw them. He was tender-hearted and weak in will. She cowed him and ruled him with a rod of iron. Lord, how right my grandmother Luce was, thought the poor fellow as he went down Stanhope Street, meekly, feeling in remembrance the touch of Jack's soft, fresh, rosy lips. End of chapter 8. Read by Bertha Mason, Nottingham, 2023. Section 9 of The Masserines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Masserines by Ouida. Section 9. Some time before Easter, cards had been issued for a costume ball at Otterbourne House, Temp Charles the Second, to be given immediately after Easter. The Duke occasionally lent the mansion to his daughter-in-law for such entertainments, never very willingly, for he had always to defray himself the costs of them and he greatly disliked many members of her set. But he recognized a certain right in his eldest son's wife to have the house sometimes, though he did not concede that it went so far as for her to inhabit it. Those little dark-eyed children running about Otterbourne House and Harry Branspeth going in and out of it continually. Not whilst I live! said the duke to himself. After him, Cocky must do as he chose. Cocky would probably let it or sell it at once for a monster hotel. She arranged her ball greatly to her satisfaction in every detail before she went down for the Easter recess. But there was one thing which had been difficult. That was to persuade the duke, who always insisted on revisiting her list for parties given at his houses, whether in town or country, to allow that of Masserine to remain on it. He inquired who the Masserines were, and did not inquire only of herself, but of others. He was most decidedly opposed to the presence of such people at Otterbourne House. But Blair Aaron was not yet definitely purchased, and it had been given to her to understand that unless the gates of Otterbourne House unclosed, that purchase never might be ratified. 
all her ingenuity, all her cajolery, all her infinite skill in the manipulation of the minds and wills of men, failed absolutely for a long time with the old duke. He would not have a man come from God knew where, well, from the state of Dakota, that was equally indefinite, brought within his doors, and everything she could think of to say only rooted him more firmly in his prejudices. Odious, insolent, ill-natured, pig-headed, spiteful, out-of-date old wretch! exclaimed Mouse as she read a note from him and cast it across the room to her husband. The Peter? Oh, I say choose your language, said Cocky, in his shriveled heart, dry and sere as a last year's leaf. If there was one remnant of regard and respect left, it was for his father. Besides, like most men, he always disagreed with anything his wife said. He read the note in a glance. Won't swallow man from Dakota, he said under a smile. Well, I wouldn't have swallowed him if he hadn't greased my throat so well. Hush! Who's to hear? Dogs don't blab, bless em. I dislike to hear such things said, even in jest. Cocky chuckled. What do you bother the pater about him for? I've swallowed him, society's swallowed him, all the royal folks have swallowed him. Why can't you leave the pater in peace? Why? Why? Because it is absolutely necessary that the Massarines should be seen at Otterbourne House, seen at my ball. The refusal is an insult to me. Your father is a hundred years out of date. The country is practically a republic. We should all have our lands taken from us before long and parcelled out to Jack and Jill. It is ridiculous to be stiff-necked about knowing people. All stiffness of that sort went out when the Hanoverian line came in. What's half the peerage? Titled tradesmen. They have got Richmond. Could your father afford Richmond? There's only one aristocracy now left. It's money. When I have been getting them everywhere, and everybody's so kind about it— what shall I look to people when I don't have them at my own ball? Your father has no consideration for me. He never has. But it is a personal favour to myself, and you see what he answers within a week of the ball. Cocky listened quietly, because it was diverting to see his wife so displeased and to hear her so incoherent. He liked her to be in a wax. He hated to think things went as smoothly as they usually did go with her, but he saw the gravity of the dilemma. If Otterbourne would not have the Massarines, then he and she would be like the farm girl of fable. Adieu, vos vaches cochons convés. There might even ensue inquiries from high places and rebuffs, which even the talent of Richmond would not avert. Cocky to whom the talent of Richmond was agreeable. He lunched and dined whenever he chose at Harrendon House, and more agreeable, the master of Richmond, who accepted his signature as if it were Rothschild's, saw that this was one of those exceptional occasions on which he would do better for himself to side with the mother of the four little poppets upstairs. I'll see the pater about the thing if you're so set on it he said with unusual amiability. Can you do anything? She said doubtfully and sullenly. Well, I don't know. I'll tell him Billy's reforming me, making an honest man of me in Fleet Street, and that he'll damage me if he shuts his doors to the beggars. Perhaps he'll believe it, perhaps he won't. Uh, I'll try. I've sent them their cards. Tell him so. That wouldn't move him a jot. But when I do the eldest son rather well and make believe to see the errors of my ways, I can get a thing or two out of Poodle. 
Sometimes, after all... After all, thought Cocky, there had been days, though it seemed odd enough to think so now, when he had been a clean and pretty little child jumping up onto his father's knee. The Duke thought of those faraway days oftener than he did, and Cocky was never ashamed to exploiter the remembrance to base ends. Go at once, then, said his wife ungraciously. Cocky nodded, but when he had reached the door, he looked back between the curtains, a rather diabolic grin upon his thin, fair features. I won't tell Peter you sold Blair Erin instead of selling Black Hazel. Ain't I magnanimous? He disappeared whilst the Blenheims barked shrilly at his memory. Cocky turned into his own den and strengthened his courage with an eye-opener of the strongest species. Then he took his way to his father's mansion, looking on St. James's Park a beautiful and majestic house built by Christopher Wren and coveted ardently by an hotel company. As he spun along the streets in a hansom, for Cocky never went a yard on foot if he could help it, he changed his intended tactics. The Reformation dodge would not do. The Duke, who could on occasions be disagreeably keen-sighted, would inevitably discover beneath it accepted bills and unworthy obligations. I'll touch him up in his loyalty, he thought. The poodle's a cavalier in his creeds. He found the duke at home with a slight touch of gout in his left foot. I suppose he comes for money, thought Otterborn, for a cocky did not cross his threshold once in three months. But Cocky made it soon apparent that his motive was more disinterested. You wrote a very sharp note to my wife just now, he said. It has worried her. The Duke looked at him with sarcastic incredulity. Are you going to pose as your wife's champion? It is late in the day. No, I ain't, said Cocky. Do you mind my lighting up, Peter? Otterborn indicated with a gesture that when anything was painful to him an unpleasant trifle did not matter. Cocky lit his cigar. You won't let her invite these new people, the Masserines? Most decidedly not. Is it necessary to inquire? Well, you see, you put her in a hole. Your language is not mine, but I conclude you mean that I inconvenience her. I regret it, if it be so, but I cannot say otherwise. Why did you object to the people? I might more pertinently inquire, why did you know them? Everybody does. Everybody does, through you, or rather through your wife. At least, so I've heard. Uh, we run em, yes. Otterborn's silence was eloquent. You see, it's just that. Cocky pursued with engaging frankness. When the town's taken him on our word, it will be such a slap in the face to her if you won't let him into your house. We must take Willis's rooms or some place instead of giving the ball here, but that will make people talk. And cost you money, said the Duke with significance. And there's another thing, you know. He's gone to him through us. Mouse persuaded him. He'll be rough on us if he hears you set up your back. There might be an awful rumpus. It might be unpleasant for him. The papers would magnify the thing. You seem to make a mountain out of a molehill, said the Duke with suspicion and impatience. Go to Willis's rooms. You can ask any number of shoeblacks there that you please. You don't see the thing as it is. You'll get her into trouble with the prince and give the press a lot of brickbats to shy at him. I know you'd regret that. I shouldn't have come to bother you if I didn't think the thing of some importance. After all, you can't reasonably exclude a man received at court. 
My bootmaker goes to court, and my stationer. Very worthy persons, but they don't dine with me. But Masserine won't dine with you. We only want him to come to the ball, and it's her ball, and it's not yours. The house is mine as yet, said the Duke stiffly. And it will be yours twenty years after I'm tucked up. I'm dead broke, legs and lungs. You've ruined yourself. This was so obvious that Kaki did not notice it. Come, Peter, do give in. Don't get us in a row with the prince when he's accepted these people to please us. It would enrage him awfully if he learned you wouldn't let him in. He'd ask you about it, of course, or have you asked by somebody. And if he asks, why do I let them in? He won't do that. He goes there. The duke was silent. He sighed. He could not mend the manners or the men of a time which was out of tune with him. But Cocky's argument had weight. He was of all things kind and chivalrous, and would have no more caused a scandal or a scene than he would have set fire to St. James's palace next door to him. He reflected on the matter, saw clearly how ugly it was, look at it how you would, and at least conceded permission to let the new people come, on the condition, however, that they should not be introduced to himself. I am too old, he said, to digest American cheese. His daughter-in-law, who did not care in the least for this stipulation, went gaily to luncheon at Harrendon House, and interested herself graciously about their costumes, which were a source of great anxiety to both of them. "'May I wear my diamonds?' asked Mrs. Masserine. Her diamonds were a great resource and support to her in society. "'Oh, the more diamonds, the better,' said Mouse." "'Of course you'll go as somebody's grandmother. "'A hide, perhaps. "'You need only telegraph to your people in Paris the epic. "'They'll know exactly what to send you. "'They know your age and appearance.' "'Margaret Masserine was not pleased, "'and felt that persons of high rank "'could be most unpleasantly rude. "'What time is it?' "'asked her lord, who had not rightly understood. "'Charles the Seconds.' "'Do you know who Charles the Second was?' asked Mouse with a malicious little laugh. "'Him as had his head took off?' asked Mr. Masserine. Her laugh became a melodious scream of delight. "'Oh, you are too delightful! There were no standards in your young days, were there, Billy?' He reddened angrily under his thick, dull skin. He was ashamed of his blunder, and he hated to be called Billy, even by those lovely lips. Finally, it was decided that he should go as Titus Oates, and should get his dress from Paris, and should learn to say, Oh, lard. Remember, the man is not to speak to me, not to approach me, said Otterborne to his daughter-in-law on the day of the ball, when she had to come give a glance at the completed decorations. "'Oh, he quite understands that,' she replied. "'I've told him that you dislike strange men, as some people are afraid of strange dogs.' She laughed gaily as she spoke. "'You might have told him,' said the Duke dryly, that there are old-fashioned persons who think that their acquaintance should be kept as clean as their hands. That he wouldn't understand, replied Mouse. What makes you protect such people? Oh, I don't know. In other ages everybody had a pet jester. Now everybody has a pet parvenu. One runs him. It's great fun. The Duke was silent. You know... She continued, He bought Vale Royale of Gerald. Surely all the family ought to be rather nice to him. You surprise me, replied the Duke. I sold seed and pastures to a grazier last year, but the obligation to be nice to the purchaser was not in the contract. 
the sale of Vale Royale was a great disgrace to Roxhole, for his affairs were by no means in such a state as to necessitate or excuse it. But whether his loss or his gain, the sale is certainly his affair and no one else's. Oh, you look at things so, so stiffly, said his daughter-in-law. We don't, you know. I am aware that you do not, said Otterborn with significance, and dropped the subject when Claire Courcy, lovely as a dream, had been first married to his son. The duke, fascinated out of his better judgment, had admired and been inclined to love his daughter-in-law. Even now, he could not be wholly insensible always to the witchery of the prettiest woman in England. He knew her worthlessness. He was aware that his son, bad as he had been before, had become ten times worse in every way since his marriage. He could never see the little black-eyed, fair-haired cherubs of the Kenilworth nurseries without a sigh and a curse in his own thoughts. But she, at certain moments, fascinated him still. I may send the bills in to Masters, I suppose, she asked. Colonel Masters was the Duke's agent, a silent, conscientious ex-soldier entirely insensible to her own attractions. Certainly, he has my authority to discharge them all. You seem to me to have been more extravagant than usual in your orders. He looked around him as he spoke. They were standing in a long gallery at the head of the grand staircase. Flowers, flowers, flowers met the eye in every direction, and the various devices which held the electric lights were concealed on the walls by millions of roses and orchids. I suppose it is an old-fashioned idea, said Otterborn. But I think a gentleman's house should be thought good enough for his friends, even for his future sovereigns, without all this dressing up and disguising. Modern fashions are extremely snobbish. They certainly are. I quite agree with you, said his daughter-in-law, and meant what she said. A fine house like this wants no dressing up. But we must do as other people do, or look odd. Or oh, you think you must, said the duke, viewing with small pleasure a suit of damascene armor, which an ancestor had worn before Acre and Antioch, wreathed and smothered with long trails made of the united blossoms of Catalia and Tigretia whilst within its open visor two golden orioles sat upon a nest. Do you think that is in good taste? he said, pointing to it. No, execrable. Nothing done in time is ever otherwise, said Mouse with unusual sincerity. We are never merry, and we are never sorry, so we heap up flowers to make believe for us at our dances and our burials. You are quite right, Peter, in the abstract, but you see we can't live in the abstract. We must do as others do. I should have thought the only true privilege of birth was to set us free of that obligation, said Otterborn, to whom his noble old palace looked on these occasions very much like the sweep who was muffled up in the evergreens as Jack in the Green on May Day in the little old-world country town which clustered under the hills of his big-placed Staghurst castle. Of course he is right enough, she thought as she drove away. The house would be ten thousand times better left to itself, and we are all as vulgar as it is possible to be. We have lost the secrets of elegance. We have only got display. Why couldn't he give me a blank check, instead of making me send in the bills to masters? He is such a screw. He wants to save all he can for his precious Beric. Alberic Orm was the Duke's second son. He was in orders, was a scholar of high degree, held one of his father's livings, 
had married the daughter of a rural dean and was the especial object of the ridicule, derision, and suspicion of Cocky and his wife. Judging Lord Alberic by themselves, they attributed to him and his hostile influence every one of the duke's acts which was disagreeable to them. He was the one of his family nearest to the heart and to the ear of the duke, the other two being officers in cavalry regiments, both somewhat spendthrifts and troublesome, and his daughters having married early and being little with him. To be dressed up like a tomfool and prate like a pole parrot, as he phrased it in his own thoughts, was unutterably odious to William Massarine, but he was powerless under his enslaver's orders. When the Easter recess was passed and the great night came, he appeared as Titus Oates, looking and feeling very ridiculous with his stout bowed legs in black silk stockings and ruffled breeches. But, after all, it was not worse than court dress, and it had procured him admittance to Otterbourne House. Mind, the man is not to speak to me, not here nor anywhere, even at any time, said the Duke to his daughter-in-law, nervously and apprehensively. No, he never shall, she promised, but she knew that nobody who would see him there would be aware of the stipulation. She had got him to Otterbourne House, and had fulfilled one of the clauses of the unwritten contract by which Blair Aaron was sold. The ball was a great pageant and a great success, and she, as the most exquisite of Nell Gwynne's, with all her lovely natural hair curling over her shoulders, was very kind to Titus Oates, guided his squat, stiff, unaccustomed limbs through the mazes of one quadrille, and even snatched a few moments to present him to some great people. And as her father-in-law made but a brief appearance in the rooms and only spoke with the royal personages present and two or three of his intimate friends, she found little difficulty in avoiding the introduction to him of the man from Dakota. Another time, another time, she said vaguely, and William Massarine was dazzled and quieted. Cocky was present for half an hour looking a shaky, consumptive, but not inelegant Grammont, for his figure was slender, and his features were good. He was infinitely diverted by the sight of William Massarine. "'Passes muster, don't he, when he don't open his mouth?' he said to Hearst Manso. "'Lord, what an ugly mug he's got! But the women are always asking for his photo.' Ha! We've got it in Stanhope Street, large as life. Peter won't let him be taken up to him, and you won't know him either. You're both wrong. He's thoroughly respectable, and he's got a lot of my paper. And Cocky, leaving his brother-in-law furious, sneaked off to find the buffets. It was a very splendid and gorgeous scene in the great house which Wren had designed, and many a famous painter had decorated. Margaret Massarine gazed at it as she sat in solitary state, blazing with diamonds and admirably attired in black velvet and white satin, with that due regard to her age, which it had so wounded her to hear suggested. No one noticed her, no one remembered her, but some very stately dowagers near her glanced at her now and then with an expression which made her wish that she were back again in Dakota by her oil stove and her linen wringer. "'Tis a mighty pretty sight," thought Margaret Massarine as she sat and looked on. "'And William's dancing is a thing I never did think to see in all my days, but these women look as if they'd like to duck me in a pond.' Carrie Wisebeach, who was genuinely good-natured, observed her neglected and isolated aspect, and called to her side a fresh-colored, pleasant-looking person, old but hale and bright-eyed, 
who had taken with success the name of Samuel Pepys. Daddy, let me take you up to the Masserine woman, she whispered. She's so dreadfully disconsolate, and they give extraordinarily good dinners. He looked and made a little wry face. They've got von Holstein's cook, she added persuasively. Really? Richmond? Yes, Richmond, and the best cellar now in London. Come, make yourself pleasant. Ronnie won't know him, said the gentleman, glancing down the rooms to where Hearst Manceau stood, looking very handsome but extremely bored, wearing the dress which a Courcy had worn when ambassador for Charles to the French court. Ronnie, said Lady Wisebeach, if Ronnie's fads were attended to, we should know nobody except our own families. Come along. He reluctantly submitted, deriving courage as he went from the memories of von Holstein's chefs. Her aunts looked unutterable reproach at Carrie Wisebeach as she murmured the inarticulate formula which presented Mr. Gwillian of Los Withiel to Mrs. Masserine. Pretty sight, isn't it? he said, as he sank back on cushions beside her. A beautiful sight, said Margaret with unction, and one as I never thought to see, sir. He stared and laughed. Unsophisticated soul, he thought. Why has cruel fate brought you amongst us? Tell me, he murmured. Is it true that you have von Holstein's cook? If she had... He would wait and take her to supper tables. If she had not, he would at once leave her to her fate. Meaning the German ambassadors, sir, she replied. Yes, we have. Ah, he decided to take her to supper. But I can't say as we like him. What? It was like hearing anybody say they did not like Dante or John de Resquet or truffles, or comet claret. No, sir, we don't, she answered. He doesn't cook himself at all. Of course he doesn't. You might as well say that a pianist should make the piano he plays on and shoot an elephant to get ivory for his keys. Richmond, is it Richmond whom you have, is a surpassing artist. Tis easy to be an artist, sir, if you set a lot of people working and send up their work in your name, said Margaret Masserine. He don't do not all day. The undercooks say so, and he gets more'n a thousand guineas a year, and he called Mr. Masserine an imbecile because he wouldn't eat snails. Now I put it to you, sir. What's the use of being able to pay for the fat of the land if you're to put up with hodmy-dods out of the hedges? Gwillian laughed so delightedly that the two terrible dowagers turned to glance at him with a medusan frown. After all, he thought, one does get a great deal more fun out of this kind of people than one ever gets out of one's own. And he took her into supper and made himself exceedingly present. He was one of those wise persons who, if they cannot be pleasant with others, are nothing at all. Under the gentle exhilaration produced by a little sparkling wine, Mrs. Masserine amused him infinitely, and he cleverly extracted from her more about life in Dakota than the rest of London had learned in a year. He was even made acquainted with the oil stove and the linen wringer. What a nice kind man! How interested he do seem! She thought, poor creature, unconscious that the oil stove and the linen wringer would make the diversion of a dozen dinner tables manipulated with that skill at mimicry which was one of Daddy Gwillian's social attractions. Her husband saw her from a distance and divined that she was being drawn, but he was powerless. He was in waiting on an aunt of Lady Kenilworth's, a very high and mighty person with aquiline features and an immense appetite. It was her garrulous stupidity and her clumsy ingenuousness which made him hate her with a hate which deepened every day. Why had he hung such a millstone round his neck? 
when he had been a farm lad in country down her good and kindly qualities her natural sincerity simplicity and good nature were all homely instincts no more wanted in her new life than a pail of fresh milk was wanted at one of the grand dinners at Harrendon House. Once she had gone back to Kilrathy, the place of her birth, and revisited the pastures, the woods, the streams, which she had known in girlhood. The big house in the midst of the green lands was shut up. Bad times had told there, as in so many other places in the land, the family she had served was abroad, impoverished, alienated, and all but forgotten, but nothing else was changed. The same great trees spread their vast shadows above the grass, the same footpaths ran through the meadows, the same kind of herds fed lazily, hawk-deep in clover, the rain shining on their sleek sides, their breath odorous on the misty air, the same kind of birds sang above her head. Every step of the way was familiar to her. Here was the stile where she had listened first to William's wooing. There the footbridge which she had crossed every market day. Here the black hazel coppice where she had once lost a silver sixpence. There the old oak stump where the red cow had been suddenly taken with labor pains the rich long grass, the soft gray rain, the noisy frogs in the marsh, the brimming river with the trout upleaping amongst the sword rush and the dock leaves, all these and a thousand other familiar things were just as they had been five and thirty years before. But none of the people guessed that the lonely lady so richly dressed walking silently through the water meadows, had once been Margaret Hogan. She did not dare make herself known to any of them. She stole into the churchyard and sat by her parents' graves in the dusk and gathered a few daisies off the nameless mounds and stole away again, feeling ashamed as of some overt act she saw a bare-legged girl going home with the cattle, a switch in her hand and a gleam of sunset light coming through the rain clouds and touching her red hair and her red kirtle, and in an odd, breathless, senseless kind of ingratitude to fate, she wished that her Kathleen, Catherine, were that cowgirl threading that fragrant twilight path with the gentle kine lowing about her, and a little calf nibbling at a bunch of clover in her hand. "'Twas a good life when all was said," she murmured. "'A good life, washed by the dews, freshened by the winds, sweetened by the flowers." She left a banknote at the poor box of the little church and returned to her grandeur and greatness, bearing in memory for many a day that pleasant sound of the cattle chewing the wet grasses in the dusk, smelling in memory for many a day the honey scent of the cowslips in the wide pastures by the river. Those memories were shut up in her heart in secret. She would not have dared to speak of them to her husband or her daughter, but they were there, as the withered daisies were in the secret drawer of her dressing case, and they kept a little corner of feeling alive in her poor, puffed-out, stiffened, overstretched soul, so overweighted with its cares and honors. It seemed wonderful to her that she should be a grand, rich lady going to court and wearing diamonds. Through all these years, through which the millions had been accumulating, she had not been allowed to know of their accumulation, or permitted to seize from privations and incessant labor. More than a quarter of a century had been to her a period of toil quite as severe in one way as the life as a dairy girl had been in another way. Often and often, in the bitter winters and scorching summers of the Northwest, 
she had thought as of a lost paradise of these peaceful pastures where no greater anxiety had burdened her than to keep the cows in health and have her milking praised it was a fine thing to be a fine lady yes no doubt she was very proud of her new station in the world but still these white satin corsets of paris which laced her in so tightly were less easy than the cotton jacket and the frieze coat her hands laden with rings or imprisoned in gloves could not do the nimble work which they had been used to do and the unconcealed contempt of the smart society in which she lived had not the warmth and comfort which had been in the jokes and the tears of the farm girls when a cow upset the milk she had given or the boys came home fresh from a fair it was all much grander of course in this but ease was wanting my dear ronnie those new folk your sister's running are too delicious for anything said daddy gwillian to hearse manso in the smoking-room i took the woman into supper and on my soul i never laughed more at the coquelins i'm going to dine there on sunday they've got richmond more shame for you daddy said hearse manso i never thought you'd worship the golden calf well rich people are pleasant to know said daddy gwillian they're comfortable like these easy chairs borrow of em no tisn't that i never borrowed or wanted to borrow half a crown in my life but they're indirectly so useful and they're pleasant you can turn lots of things on them you can get lots of fun out of them you can do such a deal for your friends with them rich people are like well-filled luncheon baskets they make the journey with them mighty pleasant the wine's dry and the game pie's good and the peaches are hot house and it's all as it should be and no bother i travel on cold tea said hearse manso with dry significance oh lord my dear ronnie i know you do said gwillian but i can't stomach cold tea and a good many people can't either now you poor folks are cold tea and my rich folks are dry sherry economy's a damned ugly thing you know at its best when i go down to shoot with poor folks i know they put me in a cold room and expect my servant to clean my gun the wealth of my neighbour means my own comfort the want of means of my friend means my own want of bien-être when i go to see him naturally i don't go equally naturally i do go when i am sure to get all i want i don't want any bills backed but i do want a warm house a dry wine and a good cook the very good cooks only go nowadays to the very rich people that is to the roture i dined at a royal palace last month execrably i was ill afterwards for twenty-four hours i know one of the chamberlains very well i got to the bottom of this horrible mystery the king pays so much a head for his dinners wine included i fled from that capital the royal dynasty is very ancient very chivalrous very heroic but i prefer the masserines i dare say you're right said hearse manso bitterly the adoration of new wealth is not so much snobbism as selfishness it is not snobbism at all in us said gwillian the snobbism is on their side they kiss our boots when we kick em why shouldn't we kick em if they like it i don't blame your kicking them for a moment i blame your legs being under their dinner tables while you do it that's a matter of opinion said daddy je prends mon bien où je le trouve and if there's a good cook in a house i go there there are good cooks at the clubs passable but when i dine at a club i have to pay for my dinner said gwillian with a chuckle i don't borrow money but i like to save it i should not pay a guinea for a peach but a couple of guinea peaches taste uncommon good when somebody else provides em what a beast you make yourself out daddy i'm a man of my time dear boy said gwillian as he opened a silver cigarette case which a pretty woman had won at a bazaar raffle and given to him daddy was popular with both the sexes 
everybody liked him, though nobody could tell why they did so. He was one of those men who do nothing all their lives except run to and fro society like dogs in a fair. He was of ancient descent and had enough to live on as a bachelor without, as he had averred, ever wanting to borrow half a crown of anybody. He had a little nest of three rooms in Abermarle Street, full of pretty things which had all been given him chiefly by ladies, and he was seen in London, in Paris, in Hamburg, in Cowes, in Cannes, in Monaco, in Biarritz, at the height of their respective seasons with unvarying regularity. Farther afield he did not go often, he liked to have his familiar world about him. He was now an old man, and to the younger generation seemed patriarchal. He had been called daddy for more years than anybody could remember. But he was healthy and strong, for he had always taken care of himself. He could shoot with the best of them still, and could sit up all night and look fresh and rosy after his shower bath in the morning. You young'uns have no stamina, he said once to Bransbeth when he found that young man measuring the drop of his digitalis. It is the way you were brought up. In my time we were fed on bread and milk and rice pudding, and wore low frocks till we were eight or nine, and never even saw what the grown-up folks ate. You were all of you muffled up to your chains in the nurseries, and got at by the doctors, and plied with wine and raw meat, and told that you had livers and lungs and digestions before you could toddle, and given claret and what not at luncheon, and made old men of you before you were boys. Dilatation of the heart have you got? Hypertrophy, eh? Lord bless my soul, you shouldn't know you've got a heart except as a figure of speech when you swear it away to a woman. Everybody listened to Daddy, even in an age which never listens. He was so obviously always right. He had so evidently found out the secret of an evergreen vitality. He was so sagaciously and unaffectedly devoted to himself, his selfishness was just tempered by that amount of good nature, when it costs him nothing, which makes a person popular. He was naturally good-natured and serviable, and kindly, when to be so caused him no difficulty. He would even take a little trouble for people when he liked them, and he liked a great many. On the whole, he was a happy and very sensible creature, and if his existence was one long egotism and inutility, if he were really of no more value than a snail on a cabbage leaf, if the alpha and omega of existence were compromised for him in his own comfort, he was at least pleasant to look at and to listen to, which cannot always be said of persons of great utility. Daddy, moreover, though a very prudent creature, did patch up some quarrels, prevent some scandals, remove some misunderstandings amongst his numerous acquaintances, but it was because he liked smooth waters around his own little bark. Life ought to be comfortable, he thought. It was short, it was bothered, it was subject to unforeseen accident, and it was made precarious by drafts, fogs, model stoves, runaway horses, and orange peel on the pavement. But as far as it could be kept so, it ought to be comfortable. All his philosophy centered in that, and it was a philosophy which carried him along without friction. If Daddy Gwillian never borrowed, he also never lent half a crown, but he got other people to lend it to other people. And this is the next most attractive social qualification which endears us to our friends. To real necessity, he was occasionally very serviceable indeed, so long as it did not put its empty hand in his own pockets. But on the distresses of fine ladies and gentlemen, he was exceedingly severe. Why couldn't everybody keep straight as he himself had always kept? Why do you bother about Cocky and your sister? he said to Hearst Manceau, whom he had known from a child, as they sat alone in the ducal smoking-room. 
If Cocky and your sister had a million a year tomorrow, they'd want a million and a half when the year ended. There are people like that. You can't alter them. Their receptivity is always greater than when they receive. Their moor's bigger than the biggest morsel you can put into it. Don't strip yourself for them. You might as well go without your bath for fear the Thames should run dry. Daddy was so fond of pretty women, platonically, that he generally forgave them all their sins, which was the easier because they were not sins against himself. But Lady Kenilworth, though he admired her, he did not like her. He gave her a little sly pat whenever he could. She yawned when he talked, which nobody else ever did. And once, when they were staying at the same country house when he had offered to ride with her, she had told him in plain terms that she didn't care for old men in the saddle or out of it. It was not in human nature to forget and forgive such a reply, even though you were the best-natured man in the world. He could not do her much harm, for Mouse was at that height of beauty, fashion, and renown at which a person is absolutely unassailable. But when he could breathe on the mirror of her charms and dull it, he did so. When he could slip a little stone under the smoothly rolling wheel of her life's triumphal chariot, he did so. It was but rarely. She was a very popular person. Her elastic spirit, her beauty, her grace, her untiring readiness for pleasure, all made her welcome in society. Her very insolence was charming and her word was law on matters of fashion. She was often unkind, often malicious, always selfish, always cruel, but these qualities served to intimidate and added to her potency. People trembled for her verdict and supplicated for her presence. Whether she were leading the cotillon or the first flight, whether she was forming a costume quadrille or bringing down a rock setter, she was equally admirable, and although she excelled in masculine sports, she had the tact always to remain exquisitely feminine in appearance and style. She had had also the tact and the good luck always to preserve her position. She had always done what she liked, but she had always done it in such a way that it never injured her. End of section 9 Read by Henry K. Noble in Washington, D.C. on April 8, 2023. Section 10 of The Massarines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Massarines by Ouida. Section 10 A week or two later, Hearst Manso saw a paragraph in the morning papers which made him throw them hastily aside, leave his breakfast unfinished, and go to his sister's house in Stanhope Street. Her ladyship was in her bath. Say I shall return in half an hour. I come on an urgent matter. Leaving that message with her servants, he went to walk away the time in the park. It was a fine and breezy morning, but Hearst Manso, who always hated the town, saw no beauty in the budding elms or the cycling women, or even in Jack or Boo who were trotting along on their little black Shetlands. When the time was up, he waited restlessly another half hour in his sister's boudoir, where he felt and looked like a St. Bernard dog shut up in a pen at a show. She at last made her appearance, looking charming, with her hair scarce dry, gathered loosely up, with a turquoise-studded comb and a morning gown of cloudy lace and chiffon floating about her a modern Aphrodite. "'You have made your husband a director in the city,' said Hurst Manso without preface, almost before she had entered the room. 
She was prepared for the attack and smiled rather impertinently. What does it matter to you, Ronnie? A director of a bank. Tisn't your bank, is it? A director of a bank, he repeated. It seemed to him so monstrous, so shocking, that he had no words left. They won't let him into the strong room, said Cocky's wife. It may be rather absurd, but it is more absurd than numbers of other things, than your being asked to be a mayor, for instance. If I had accepted, I should not have disgraced the mayoralty. Cocky won't disgrace anything. They'll look after him. Who did it? Is that your business, dear Ronnie? Oh, of course, it was that miserable cad from Dakota whom you forced through the gates of Otterbourne House. If you know, why ask? What an insult to us all! What a position to put us in, when everybody's seen the man at your ball where we all were! His indignation and emotion checked his utterance. His sister laughed a little, but she was bored and annoyed. What business was it of his? Why could she not be let alone to arrange these little matters to her own convenience in any ingenious way she chose? How could you make the Duke appear to play such a part? said Hurst Manso. He is the soul of honour and of proper pride. What have you made him look like? It is the kind of thing that is a disgrace to the country. It is the kind of thing that makes the whole peerage ridiculous and contemptible. Imagine what the radical press will say. Such scandalous jobbery justifies the worst accusations. Don't read the radical newspapers, then. I shall read them, because they will be so deliciously funny. They are always so amusing about cocky. You have singular notions of amusement. I do not share them. I know you don't. You are always on stilts. You never see the comedy of Cocky. I do not see the comedy of what is disreputable and dishonourable. His father will be most cruelly distressed. He should give us more money, then. We must do what we can to keep ourselves. Poodle never helps us. Well, hardly ever. Hurst Manso emitted a sound very like a big dog's growl. Oh, Otterbourne has been endlessly good to you. It is no use for him or anybody else to fill a sieve with water. Why don't he give us the house? We are obliged to pay fifteen hundred a year for this nutshell while he lives all alone in that huge place. Why should he not live in his own house? What decent gentleman would have cocky under his roof? You have no kind of feeling, Ronnie. I ought to have Otterbourne House. I have always said so. I can't give a ball here, not even a little dance. Poodle might keep his own apartments, those he uses on the ground floor there, but we ought to have all the rest. He allowed you to have that ball there the other night, and all the costs of it fell on him. That is a great deal for him to do, certainly. To lend us the house once in a season when it is our right to live in it altogether? He does not think so. No, horrid, selfish old man, pretending to be young, too, with his flossy white hair and his absurd flirtations. Wouldn't you believe he even made difficulties about our keeping our horses at his mews? He probably knew that it meant his paying for the forage bills. The Duke is most generous and kind, and I think you ought to be more grateful to him than you are. Oh, rubbish, said Mouse, infinitely bored. People who hate you to amuse yourself, who want you to live on a half penny a day, and who say something disagreeable whenever they open their lips, are always considered to be good to one. 
There is only one really good-natured thing that we ever wanted Poodle to do, and that was to let us live in Otterbourne House, and he has always refused. I am certain that he will go on living for twenty years merely to keep us out of it. Don't wish him in his grave. As soon as your husband gets Otterbourne House, he will sell it to make it an hotel. A company has already spoken to him. Isn't it in the entail? Perhaps. I cannot say. Ask your lawyer. But I know that an hotel company has made overtures to him for purchase or lease in the event of the Duke's death. May it be many a day distant. He is an honest gentleman, and you and your husband and your cursed cad out of Dakota have made him look to English society as if he were capable of having sold the honour of entrance to his house for a mess of pottage for his son's thirsty moor. My dear Ronald, how you excite yourself. Really, there is no reason. Hurst Manceau looked at her very wistfully. Can't you see the dishonour of what you've done? he said impatiently. You coax and persecute Otterbourne until he allows you to take those new people to his house, and then you let the cad you take there make your husband a director of a bank of which the man is chairman. Can't you see to what comment you expose us all, of what wretched manoeuvring you make us all look guilty? Have you any perception, no conscience, no common decency? If Cocky were another kind of man than he is, such a thing would look a job, but being what he is, the transaction is something still more infamous. She listened, so much amused that she really could scarcely feel angry. My dear Ronald, she said very impertinently, you have a morality altogether of your own. It is so extremely old-fashioned that you can't expect anybody to make themselves ridiculous by adopting it. As for a job, isn't the whole of government a job? When you've cleaned out Downing Street, it will be time to bring your brooms in here. At that moment, Cocky put his head in between the door curtains and nodded to Hurst Manso. She's made me a guinea pig, Ronnie, he said with his little thin laugh. Didn't think I should take to business, did you? Have you seen the papers? Lord, they're such fun. I've bought ten copies of Truth. His wife laughed. It's no use reading Truth to Ronnie. He's no sense of fun. He never had. I have some sense of shame replied Hurst Manso, looking with loathing on his brother-in-law's thin, colorless, grinning face. It is an old-fashioned thing, but if this wretched little cur were not too feeble for a man to touch, I would teach him some respect for it with a hunting crop. Then he pushed past Cocky, who was still in between the door curtains, and went downstairs to take his way to Otterbourne House. Cocky laughed shrilly and gleefully. Jove, what a whack season, said Cocky, greatly diverted. Just as if he didn't know us by this time. He's always so absurd, replied Mouse. He has no common sense and no perception. He ought to go about and chain armor, said Cocky, picking up truth and reading for the fourth time with infinite relish the description of himself as an hereditary legislator in Mincing Lane. I am not a hereditary legislator yet, he said as he read. As I don't get the half pence, why should I get the kicks? That's what I said to the mob in the park. Break the pater's windows, don't break mine. I'm plain John Orm, without a shilling to bless myself with, and the beggars cheered me. They'll cheer you for any rot if they're only in the mood for it. And if they aren't in the mood, you might talk like Moses and Mohammed. They'd bawl you down. Oh, get out, you little beast, damn you. The objurgation was addressed to the Blenheims, who, suddenly becoming aware of his presence, 
made for his trousers with that conviction that his immediate destruction would be a public service, which they shared with the editor of Truth. Hearst Manceau walked through the streets and felt his ears tingle as he heard the newsboys shouting the names of newspapers. His sister had said rightly, he was not a man of his time. He was impetuous in action, warm in feeling, sensitive in honor. He had nothing of the cynical morality, the apathetic indifference, the cool opportunism of modern men of his age. He was no philosopher, and he could not bring himself to smile at an unprincipled action. He felt as ashamed as though he were himself at fault as he entered the Duke's apartment in Otterborne House. Hurst Manso and the Duke had much regard for each other, but their conversation was usually somewhat guarded and reserved, for the one could not say all he thought of Otterborne's son, and the other could not say all he thought of Ronald's sister. There were many subjects on which they mutually preserved silence, but this appointment of Kenilworth seemed so monstrous to both that it broke the reserve between them. They each felt to owe the other an apology. My dear Ronald, said the Duke, holding out his hand, I know why you have come, thank you. I dare not offer any plea in her defense, replied Hersman so huskily. I can only tell you how grieved I am that your constant kindness and forbearance to my sister should meet with so base a requital. The Duke sighed. I am bound in honour to remember that the basest of men is her husband and my son. They were both silent. The morning papers were lying on a table by the Duke's side, amongst them the green cover of truth. That is no excuse for her, said her brother at length. This thing is of her devising much more than it is his. There are women who are immoral phylloxera, replied Otterborn. They corrupt all they touch, but in fairness to her, I must say that it was chiefly my son who persuaded me to let this man, Masserine, into my house. They made me an accomplice in the job, perhaps, the Duke added with a sad smile. The world knows me well enough to give me credit for having been an unconscious accomplice, for having been a fool, not a knave. To these two honest gentlemen, the matter was one of excruciating pain and of what seemed to them both intolerable humiliation. But society, though it laughed loudly for five minutes over the article on an hereditary legislator, forgot it five minutes later, and was not shocked. It is too well used in these days to similar transactions between an impoverished nobility with unpaid rents and ruinous death duties, and a newborn plutocracy creeping upward onto its swollen belly like the serpent of scripture. End of section 10 Read by Henry K. Noble in Washington, D.C. on March 12, 2023. Chapter 11 of The Massarines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard Ship, The Massarines by Oida. Chapter 11 A young woman dressed in white cambric, with the deep shade of a magnolia grove cast upon her as she sat on the marble steps of an oriental garden, read of these brilliant festivities in various English journals, whose office it is to chronicle such matters. And as she read, she frowned, and as she frowned, she sighed. 
Oh, the waste, the folly, the disgrace, she murmured, as she pushed the newspapers away from her. For she had peculiar views of her own, and had little or nothing in common with her generation or with her procreators. She looked very like her bust by Dalu as she thrust the offending journals off her lap. I'm a déclassé, she said to herself as she sat amongst the rhododendrons and the monkeys. All they have spent on me cannot make me anything more. They should have left me in the place which they occupied when I was born. I would sooner go out as a common servant any day than be forced to witness their ignominy and live in their suffocating wealth, to see the laugh in the eyes of the people they toady and overhear the ridicule of those who crowd to their supper table. If he would only disown me, cut me off with a shilling. What's the matter, my dear? Bad news from England? Parents ill? said a mellow and cheerful voice as the temporary owner of Terrace and Magnolia Grove, Lord Framlingham, came out of the house and across the rough grass, accompanied by his two inseparable companions, his cigarette and his Sky Terrier. She picked up one of the newspapers and pointed to a paragraph in it. They must be the laugh of London. Oh, my dear, you don't know London, said her host as he read. They will be the idols of London, the very Buddha of solid gold that its smart people most delight to adore. Look at the whole thing as a comedy, my child, and you will enjoy it. I once spoke to a clown's wife at a circus, said Catherine Masserine. While the clown was making the audience scream with laughter, she was crying. I can't help crying, she said, to see my man make a butt and a guy of himself. He's nabbed a tom fool to them, but he's my man to me. I am as foolish as the clown's wife. Well, I can't admit the analogy, said her host. I think you take the thing too seriously. Your people's position is a common one enough in our days. When anybody has made a heap of money, they're never happy till they get a mob of smart beggars to crowd round them and pick their pockets. How would smart society go on unless there were these feeders for it to fatten on? If I were your father, I should keep my money in my pocket and snap my fingers at smart society. But then, you see, I know what smart society is, and he doesn't. But why should he want to know? He's not made for it. He only laughs at him. Oh, pardon me, I'm sure it does more than laugh. I'm sure it plunders him as well. I only hope that he will know when to cry, Stop thief! For if he doesn't, all his millions will go into the maw of his fine friends. Catherine Masserine sighed. My father will never lose except when he chooses to do so. If they use him, he uses them. It's a quid pro quo. It is a question of barter. But that is what is so disgraceful about it. I have said, replied her host, I think if I were an intelligent man who had made a pot of money by my own exertions, as Mr. Masserine has done, that I should not care a damn, excuse the word, for all the fine folks in creation. Certainly I should not care to waste my money upon them. But the fact is that all these new men do care for that, and that alone. They appear wholly to underrate themselves and their own accomplishment and care only to be rooked by a set of idle loungers with handles to their names. It is not they who will ever destroy the upper house. No, said his guest bitterly, an earl can see and say that the days of the upper house are numbered, but my father regards it as the holy of holies because he means to seat himself in its gilded chamber. It's Joe Chamberlain's reason too, said Framlingham with a chuckle. When we make peers of the tradesmen, my dear, we know what we are about. We are solder in our own leaking pot. Solder it with other men's smelted gold? Oh, you'd better break it up honestly as a thing which has had its day and is done with. Poor old pot, perhaps it would be better to bury it for good and all on Runnymede Island. But I think you exaggerate a little. I must say you exaggerate. And you totally ignore a fact which has been put on record by every English sociologist and historian that it has been its frank admission to its ranks of novi homine which has kept the English aristocracy vigorous and popular. She gave a scornful gesture of denial. It is the novi homine who have degraded the English aristocracy. Pardon me if I contradict you. Mr. Malloch has written very kind and possibly very just things of your nobility, but he has forgotten to satirise its most shameful infirmity. 
its moral scrofula, its incessant and unblushing prostration of itself before wealth qua wealth. It likes hothouse pines and can no longer afford to keep them for its own eating. It can only grow them for sale and eat them at the tables of those who buy them. Well, that is very severe. Well, who would be less severe who had seen anything at all of Paris, of London, of Nice, of Biarritz, of any place where modern society disports itself? Framlingham laughed. My dear Miss Masserine, you delight me beyond expression, but I can imagine that you are, to a parent who adores princes and means to die a peer, rather, rather, forgive a vulgar word, rather a handful. My father has purchased a place called Vale Royal, continued Catherine. You know it? Well, he wishes to be there, plus royaliste que le roi. In the leases he gives to his farmers, they are bound over to pay forty pounds for every pheasant killed or maimed on their ground. Is it not our Heroding Herod? He cares nothing for such trumpery sport himself. He has killed grizzlies and negroes and train lifters. He would care nothing to fire at a flock of frightened hand-fed birds, but he wishes to tempt princes and lords to his coverts and to see the bags made on his estate cited in newspapers. Who set him that base example? Princes and lords themselves. Uh, no estates would be kept up but for the game, said her host, rather feebly, as he felt. What satire can be so withering as such a statement? There is then no love of hereditary lands, no sense of woodland beauty, no interest in fur or feather without slaughter attached to them, no tenderness for tradition and for nature, nothing, nothing whatever of such pride in and affection for the soil itself as Shakespeare felt, who only owned a little rural freehold. Who can condemn you as utterly as you condemn yourselves? I think we are rather useful sometimes, he said humbly. Oh, very, you vote against marriage with a deceased wife's sister and maintain the game laws. I am not ashamed of my parents' origin, Lord Framlingham, I assure you, she added after a pause. I am ashamed that they are ashamed of it. I understand, my dear, and I sympathise, though I suppose not many people would do either. You see, we all have our crosses. My daughters have to endure the misery of a conspicuous rank with wholly inadequate means and more trying position than you can imagine. I should not mind that. Oh, yes, you would. It is humiliation at every turn. It is to be checked in every generous impulse to spend half your time in efforts to make a five-pound note do the work of ten sovereigns. It is to wear your George in garter over a ragged shirt and knock your diamond tiara against the roof of a hackney cab. I know what I'm talking about, my dear, as most unhappy English landowners do in this year of grace. I know that there is no misery so accursed as the combination of high place and narrow means. I came out here to relieve the strain a little. It was worse for the women than for me. You, my dear, are a high-mettled pony, which kicks at carrying the money bags. But my poor girls are high-mettled ponies which sweat under the halter and the cobble. That's a good deal worse. You'll have to buy a fine name with your big dower, but they will have to take what offers first, for they must go to their husbands portionless, or nearly so. And we were thanes in Alfred's time, my dear, and we fought for Harold Tooth and Nail, and we were at Runnymead and at Bosworth and at Tewkesbury and all the rest of it, and our name is as old as the very hills around the Rekin. And that, you see, is what an ancient lineage is worth in these days. Your father has the better part. Catherine shook her head. And honour, she said in a low tone. Lord Framlingham laughed grimly. When one is in debt to one's bankers and one's tradesmen, and has to let one's place to a sugar baker, the less said about honour the better. I wish I were a monkey. Don't you wish you were one? They get such fun out of each other's tails, and it must be such a jolly life swinging on branches and living on fruits. And if you like ancient lineage, look at theirs. She smiled, but her heart was heavy. She knew that she could not alter her fate, and she loathed it. Do not misunderstand me, she said, with a passing flush coming on her face. Do not think me more stoical or philosophical than I am. It is probably pride, not humility which makes me suffer so much for my sense of my parents' present position. 
if I had been born in your class, in your world, I should probably have been odiously arrogant. I do not think you could be odiously anything, my dear, said Lord Framlingham with a smile. Oh, yes, I can. I know it. I feel it. I regret it. And yet I cannot help it. When I am in their world, to which we have no right, to which we shall be only welcomed for reasons as discreditable to ourselves as to those who welcome us, I know that I offend everyone, and that I afflict, surprise and disappoint my parents. But I cannot be otherwise. It is all I can do to keep in unspoken the bitter truths which rise to my lips. The Amaria liquid was never enclosed in a fairer crystal sphere, said her host gallantly. I never would have left my mother, she added, but I could do nothing. I was only the helpless spectator of a kind of effort which is in my sight the most ignoble, the most foolish of all, the endeavour to appear what one is not and never can be. You take it too much to heart, said her companion. You do not make allowance for the times. Your people are only doing what every person who has made money does on a small scale or a big scale according to their means. Mr. Masserin is immensely rich, and so his aspirations are very large too. Aspirations! To get on in society, to have great persons to dinner, to represent in Parliament the interest of a constituency he had never heard of a year ago, to get a title, though my brothers are all dead, to entertain troops of people who scarcely know his name and have hardly the decency to pretend to know it, do you call that aspiration? It's more like degradation. Why cannot he remain in obscurity, spending his vast fortune for the good of others, instead of squandering it on idle people, impudent people, worthless people, people to whom he is a jest, a byword and a jeer? My dear young lady, money is power, said Lord Framlingham. It is nothing new that it should be so, but in other ages it was subordinate to many greater powers than itself. Now it is practically supreme. It is practically alone. Aristocracy in its true sense exists no longer. War in its modern form is wholly a question of supply. The victory will go to who can pay most and longest. The religious orders, once so absolute, are now timid anachronisms quaking before secular governments. Science, which cannot move a step without funds, goes cap in hand to the rich. Art has perished nearly. What is left of it does the same thing as science. The Pope, who ought to be a purely spiritual power, is mendicant and begs like Belisarius. What remains? Nothing except trade, and trade cannot oppose wealth, because it lives solely through it. For this reason, money, mere money, with no other qualities or attractions behind it, is omnipotent now, as it never was before in the history of the world. It is not one person or set of persons who is responsible for this. It is the tendency of the age, an age which is essentially mercenary and is very little else. In politics, as in war and in science, there is no moving a step without money and much money. The least corrupt election costs a large outlay. Royalty, recognising that money is stronger than itself, courts men of money, borrows from them and puts out in foreign stocks where it borrows as a reserve fund against exile. You see, there is no power left which can or dare attempt to oppose the undisputed sway of money. A great evil, you say? No doubt. She sighed. She recognised the truth of all he said, but she loathed the fact she was compelled by her reason to acknowledge. When she's convinced against her will, she's of the same opinion still quoted Framlingham. Come, my dear, let's go and have a game of tennis. Catherine Masserine, whose future was a subject of lively speculation to many, was now 21 years old. She looked much more than that then, and 20 years hence will probably look no older. At five years of age, notwithstanding her poor mother's tears and prayers, she had been sent to the care of a gentlewoman in England, who lived at Eastbourne and received only a half a dozen children to educate, with two of her own. The lady had been recommended to William Masserine by the English minister at Washington, and the influence of that gentleman had been exercised in persuading her to consent to receive against her rules a little ignorant obscure brat from Dakota. 
Make her happy and keep her well, ma'am, for she's all we've got, wrote her poor mother. Make her English, ma'am, and fit to hold her head with the highest, for she'll mean gold, wrote her father. The lady disliked excessively accepting a charge which was alien to her habits and might injure the tone of her house. But she was under obligations to the English minister and reluctantly consented to take into her home this one little girl who had great astonished unwinking eyes like an owl's and who said to her with a dreadful nasal accent, Don't grin when I speak or I'll hit you. For twelve years she remained under this lady's care, being trained in all exercises of the mind and body, and becoming a calm, cold, high-bred girl who looked as if she had a thousand years behind her of old nobility and gracious memories. Of her parents she saw nothing, and only heard that they were extremely rich. But the orthography of her mother's letters and the style of her father's few lines always made her uneasy, and the recollections of life in Dakota were not as absolutely obliterated as her parents desired. But of those she never spoke. She divined what was expected of her. Those recollections became increasingly painful, as with increasing perception she could construe them by induction. When, in her eighteenth year, her parents came for the first time to England, she could only see in them strangers and strangers who, alas, had nothing of that attraction which bridges the distance between age and youth. If what she felt on meeting them was an agony of disappointment and a sense of shame, more acute because it was shut close in her own breast, they were themselves not less chagrined. When they first saw her, her parents both thought that she did not give them great results for the vast sums they had spent on her and that really they would have turned her out smarter if they had had her brought up in New York. The art of gilding gold and painting lilies is at its perihelion in the Empire City. He especially was disappointed in her at first. He expected her to make more show, to have more colour, to be more swagger, as the slang words ran. This tall, proud, slender young woman, who wore generally black or grey in the day and white in the evening, and put on no jewellery of any kind, seemed to him to give him poor value for the many thousand of dollars he had spent on her. He had intended her to be ultra-fashionable, ultra-chic, always in the swim, always in the first flight, on race courses, on yacht decks, on the box seat of drags, at aristocratic river clubs, at exclusive and crowded little suppers after theatres. I wanted a gal of fashion, not a school ma'am, he said, with much disgust when the lady who had brought her up told him that she was the finest Hellenist of her sex. He didn't know what a Hellenist was, but he understood that it was something connected with teaching. What he wanted was something very showy, very sensational, very super fine. But Catherine did not like fashionable life at all. A very little of it wearied her. She did not like a man to lean his elbows on a little round tete-a-tete supper table and stare at her with his eyes within six inches of her necklace and his champagne and cigar-scented breath hot in her face. And she did not think the situation made more agreeable by the fact that the starer was illustrious. She infinitely preferred to be alone in the music room with her violin and harmonium or in the library comparing Jowett's dialogues with the original. It is easy to understand that she was a great disappointment to her father, though a sort of solemn pride in her was wrung out of him when he saw how indifferent she appeared to the great folks he adored, yet at the same time how at home she seemed in the mystic arena of that society which made him shake in his shoes, strong, hard, shrewd man though he was. Except the Archduke, who insisted on becoming a skipper of a timber brig, so infuriating and insensate a flying in the face of a fair fate had never been known. Catherine Masserine, for her part, did not enter or try to enter into his feelings, as no doubt it should have been her filial duty to do. She had some of his stubbornness and a pride of her own kind which made her unyielding. Her numerous teachers, male and female, had all found her of unusual intelligence, and she had studied the classics with ardour and thoroughness. She could say extremely caustic and witty things, but she generally was merciful and forbore to say them. She had a vast reserve of sound and unusual knowledge, but she endeavoured to conceal it, 
disliking all display and being by nature very modest. As, little by little, she began gradually to understand the position of her parents, she suffered from it acutely. If she could, with a clear conscience, have done so, she would have liked to renounce all their wealth and grandeur and earn her own living, which she could have earned very well as a musician or a professor of history or dead languages. She said so once to her father, on his arrival in England, and the rage of the taciturn, ruthless man was so terrible that her mother on her knees entreated her never to allude to such an idea. "'You are all we have left,' she said, weeping. "'Your brothers and sisters all died in that horrible West. "'You are the sole one he has to look to for bearing his name and glorifying his money. "'You are heir and heiress both, Kathleen. "'Has he slaved and spared and laid by thirty years and more "'only that the soul begot of his loin shall disgrace him as a menial?' "'Rise up, my dear mother, we will not speak of it again,' said Catherine, a mere schoolgirl then of seventeen. "'We might discuss and argue for ever. Neither my father nor you would ever see these things as I see them.' And with great self-control, most rare in one of her age, she renounced her dreams of independence and never did allude again in any way to them. She soon perceived that whatever chance she might have had of influencing her mother, she had none whatever of moving her father. If she had stood in his way, he would have brushed her aside or trampled her down. He had not made his money to lose the enjoyment of it for the quips and cranks of a crotchety child. Her indifference to all which fascinated and awed himself compelled his reluctant respect, and the serene hauteur of her habitual manner made him feel awkward and insignificant in her presence. He was, in some respects, when he pitted himself against her, compelled unwillingly to acknowledge that she was the stronger of the two. She had hurt him enough by the mere accident of her sex. He never forgave her that she had lived whilst her brothers had died. He had no affection for her, and only a sudden unwilling respect which was wrung out of him by seeing her ease in that world where he was uneasy and her familiarity with those great persons before whom he was always himself dumb and frightened and distressed. So far, at least, the money spent on her had not been wasted. It had made her one of them. For this he held her in respect, but she could not move him a hair's breadth from his ambitions or his methods of pursuing them. These methods were, to her more refined taste and more penetrating vision, absurd and odious. She knew that the great world would use him, rook him, feed on him, but would always laugh at him and never see in him anything except a snob. She knew that every invitation given to him or accepted from him, every house party which he was allowed to gather or allowed to join, every good club which he was put up for, every great man who consented to dine with him, were all paid for by him at enormous cost, indirectly indeed, but nonetheless extravagantly. She knew that he would in all likelihood live to do all he had aspired to do, to get into the commons, perhaps to get into the cabinet, to receive royalty, to shake hands with princes of the blood, even perhaps to die a peer. But she knew that all this would be done by purchase, by giving money, by lending money, by spending money largely and asking no questions, by doing for the impoverished great what Madame de Sévigné called manuring the ground. To her taste, success and rank procured in such a manner left you precisely where you were before its purchase. She knew that to a society which you only enter on sufferance, you remain almost practically outside on the doormat. And she did not understand that to the soul of the snob, even the dust of the doormat is sweet. She did not understand either that in her father's case the doormat was but one of the preliminary stages of the triumphant career which he had mapped out in his brain when he had first put one dollar on another in Dakota. She early perceived that her parents looked to her for assistance in their ambitions, but she was obdurate in giving them none. They called her undutiful, and undutiful she might be, but she felt that she would rather be guilty of any offence whatever than become degraded and servile. So extreme was her resistance on this point that one evening it brought an open rupture with her father and that exile to India of which Mrs. Masserine had not told all the truth when exhibiting Dallant's bust of her daughter. 
The winter before their acquaintance with Lady Kenworth, the Massarines had been at Cannes and Monte Carlo, following that smart world of which they still vainly pined to enter the arena. They had not as yet found their guide, philosopher, and friend in the fair mother of Jack and Boo, and William Massarine was beginning to fear that gold was not the all-potent solvent he had believed it but a very high personage, whose notice would have had power to lift them at once into the Empyrean, was also at Cannes at that period, and the white rose skin and admirable form of Catherine Massarine attracted him, and he desired that she should be presented to him. Very unwillingly, very coldly, she had submitted to her fate at a public ball to which she had been taken. The great gentleman asked her to waltz, Neither his age nor his figure was suited to the dance, but women were nevertheless enchanted to be embraced by him in its giddy gyrations. Catherine excused herself and said that she did not waltz. The great gentleman was annoyed, but attracted. He sat out the dance by her side on a couch in a little shady corner under palm trees such as he especially favoured. But he made very little way with her. She was chilly, reserved, respectful. Take your respect to the devil, thought the misunderstood prince. Why are you so very unkind to me, Miss Massarine? he said in a joking fashion, which would have convulsed with joy every other woman in those rooms. There can be no question of unkindness from me to yourself, sir, she replied more distantly still, and she looked him straight in the eyes. He was not used to being looked at thus. He had drunk more wine than was good for him. He tried to take her hand. His breath was hot upon her shoulder. I'll dine with your father, if you ask me, he murmured. A whole world of suggestion was in the simple phrase. Catherine Musserine drew her hand away. Sir, she said very distinctly, my father was a cowherd and my mother a dairy woman. I do not know why you should do them the honour to dine with them, sir, merely because they earned money in America. Her companion had never received such a facer in all his fifty years of life. Like his own speech, it suggested innumerable things. He grew very red and his glassy eyes became very sullen. He was silent for a few moments. Then he rose and offered her his arm. Allow me to take you back to your chaperone, he said in glacial accents, which he infinitely preferred to his familiarity. "'What have you done to him?' said that lady as he left her with a ceremonious bow. "'I have told him a truth,' said Catherine indifferently. "'I suppose it is too strong diet for him. He's not used to it.' "'I should think not indeed,' said the lady, much disturbed. "'What can you have said?' "'He will probably tell people,' said Catherine. "'If he do not, I shall not.' "'He did, not very wisely,' tell two of his boon companions that same night as they sat smoking with him.' Of course, the story ran about the Riviera next day from Monaco to Jerez, taking protean forms and changing with every tongue that told it. One of its versions, one of the most accurate, reached the ears of William Massarine. His nickname in the States had been Blasted Blizzard, and his temper was such as corresponded with the name. His wrath was terrible. From his point of view, it was justified. His wife, trembling like a leaf in a hurricane, was paralysed with fear. His daughter remained calm. She did not for an instant admit that she was at fault, although she regretted that any cause for anger should arise between her and her parents. "'You shall apologise," he swore a dozen times. "'I shall certainly never do that,' said Catherine, with contemptuous composure. "'You shall apologise in public.' "'Neither in public nor in private.' "'You shall go on your knees to him if I flog you on to them,' yelled Mr. Massarine. "'My dear father, pray keep within the laws of that good society in which you have been so anxious to enter,' she said with a delicate scorn, which he felt through all his tough hide like the tingling strokes of the whip with which he threatened her. "'Cannot you understand, mother?' she said wistfully. "'Surely you must see, must feel the insult that it was.' "'Oh, my dear, don't appeal to me,' said her mother with a sob. "'Great folks aren't like other folks, and your father must know best.' "'How dare you turn to your fool of a mother?' he yelled. "'Is it she whose dollars have dressed you fine "'and cockered you up amongst blood fillies all these years?' 
I regret that I have cost you so much, but if you will allow me, I will relieve you of my presence and maintain myself, she said, with a tranquillity which made her father's rage choke him as though he were on the point of apoplexy. Did I bring you up amongst Duchess's daughters that you might disgrace me, he cried with a foul oath. From his point of view, it was hard on him, unjust, a very abomination of providence. There were four hundred young women in London, four thousand in Great Britain, who would have asked nothing better than to be beautifully dressed, to have abundance of pocket money, to ride thoroughbred hacks in the park, to pay court to great people, and to make themselves agreeable and popular in society. There was not, indeed, one young woman in ten millions who would have quarrelled with such a fate, and that extraordinary and solitary exception was his daughter. It was not wonderful, it was scarcely even blamable, that William Massarine was beside himself with chagrin and rage. A thousand other men had daughters who asked nothing better than to be allowed to spend money and be made love to by princes and wear smart frocks and push themselves into smart society. And he had this rara avis, this abnormal, unnatural, incredible phenomenon to whom all these things, which were the very sort of life to other women, were only as dust and ashes. What punishment could he give her? What other threats could he make her? It was useless to threaten with being turned out of doors a person who asked nothing better than to be set free to work for her livelihood. If he had hinted at such a punishment, she would have taken him at his word, would have put on her simplest gown, and would have gone to the nearest railway station. He thundered at her, he hurled at her blasphemous words, which had used to make the blood of miners and navvies turn cold when they bulldozing boss used such to them. He swore by all heavenly and infernal powers that he would drag her on her knees to the offended gentleman, but he made no impression whatever on her. She ceased to reply but she gave no sign of any emotion neither timorous or repentant she was altogether unmoved say what he would he could not intimidate her and the force of his fury spent itself in time beaten by passive resistance the upshot of the stormy scene was that he exiled her from his world by allowing her to accept an invitation to pass a year in india with some school friends who were daughters of a nobleman who had recently accepted the governorship of one of the presidencies in india the decision cost her mother many tears, but it was the mildest ultimatum to which William Massarine could be brought. He only saw in his daughter a person who might have secured to him the one supreme honour for which his soul pined, and who had not done so, out of some squeamish, insolent, democratic, intolerable self-assertion. In sending her to pass a year in the family of Lord Framlingham, he not only removed her from his own sight, but placed her where he not unnaturally supposed that she would be surrounded by conservative and aristocratic influences. Framlingham, however, though it had suited his pocket to accept his appointment, was a revolutionary at heart, and railed incessantly at the existence of his own order and his own privileges. He had heard of the discomfiture of the great personage and chuckled over it, and welcomed the heroine of that rebuff with great cordiality to his marble palace, looking through the golden stems of palm groves onto the Indian Ocean, where he was a funny incongruous figure himself, in his check tweed clothes with his red English face, his shining bald head, his eyeglass screwed into his left eye, and his clean-shaven lips shut close on a big cigar. Did so right, Miss Masserine, did so right, he said warmly to her soon after her arrival. Mustn't say so, you know, as I'm one of Her Majesty's servants, but I'm always deuced glad when any royalty gets a facer. Those people, you know, are like preserved meats in a tin case which has had all the air pumped out of it. They never get a chance of hearing the truth, nor of knowing what they look like to people who aren't snobs. Almost everybody is a snob, you see. I should like to write a new book of snobs. The species has grown a good deal since Thackeray's days. It is developed like orchids or prized vegetables. Framlingham, although an unpoetic-looking occupant of a marble palace in rose gardens of the gorgeous east, was a person of delicate perceptions, high intelligence and cultured mind. He took a great liking to this young woman, who quarrelled with a lot which all the world envied her, and he pressed her to remain with his family when the year had passed, and she obtained permission to do so. Her mother was yearning for her return, but her father would willingly never have seen her face again. He was not a man who forgave. 
She was thinking of the scene with her father as she sat on the marble steps in the governor's gardens, in the deep shade of a magnolia grove, absently listening to the chatter of the monkeys overhead. She felt that she had been in the right. She burned with shame whenever she remembered the eyes of the great gentleman luring upon her as he said, I'll dine with your father if you ask me. And her father had not seen the meaning in those words or had seen it but would willingly have purchased the honour even at that price. She felt as if she could never go back to that life in England, at Monte Carlo, at Homburg, if only they would allow her to make her own career here in this ancient and romantic land as a teacher, as a nurse, as an artist, as anything. If only they would not oblige her to return to the yoke of that inane, humiliating, tedious routine which they thought honour and the world called pleasure. She had by that day's mail received from her mother some cuttings from a society journal descriptive of the glories of Harrendon House and Vale Royal and containing an account of the dinner party which the Grand Duchess had ordered and honoured. These brilliant paragraphs had filled her with pain and disgust. We are getting on fast, my dear child, wrote her mother, and it's time as you came back, for people are always asking after you, and I'd like to see you well married, and I'm sure you look more of a lady than many of them. She knew very well what kind of marriage she would alone be allowed to make, marriage which would give her some high place in return for an abyss of debt filled up, which would purchase for her entry into some great family who would receive her for sake of what she would bring to clear off mortgages and save the sale of timber and enable some titled fool to go on keeping his racing stud. Never, never, she said to herself. Her father might disinherit her if he pleased, but he should never make her marry so. The same temper was in her, which had made her say as a small child, if you grin when I speak, I'll hit you. The temper was softened by courtesy, by culture, by self-control, by polished habit, but it was there, proud, imperious and indomitable. Les chines souples of the snob and the courtier was wanting in her. You might have swallowed your ancestor's sword, said one of her girl playmates once to her, and she thought bitterly, my father's shooting irons are the only substitute for ancestral steel that I know. But yet she bore herself as though she had all the barons of Runnymede behind her, and she could not bend or cringe. I don't know how the devil she comes by it, but she is certainly thoroughbred, thought her host. Who knows what grace of Geraldine's or strength of Hamilton's or charm of Sheridan's may have filtered into the veins of some ancestor of hers in the long, long ago. End of chapter 11Chapter 12 of The Massarines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard Shipp. The Massarines by Ouida. Chapter 12. In the March and early April of the next year, there was very bad weather in England. Snow, sleet and storm, killing sheep, starving cattle, delaying railway trains and covering much in the woodland nooks where the primrose roots were getting ready their buds for sacrifice at Westminster in the drollest form of hero worship which a generation bereft of any sense of humour ever invented. The moors were vast unbroken plains of virginal whiteness and the woods looked black against a steely sky as Hurstman so got into the express, which had been signalled by telegram to stop for him at the little station outside the park of a country house at which he had been staying in the north riding. The engine snorted, hissed and flung up steam and fire into the chilly air as he hastened across the platform. He got quickly into the carriage indicated to him by his servant, pushing his dog before him, and the train had moved off before he saw that there was a lady in the compartment to whom he lifted his Glengarry cap with a word of apology for the presence of his collie. "'I'm very fond of dogs,' said the lady with a smile, and the collie smelt the hem of her gown and the fur of her cloak with approval. "'Thanks,' said his master, and as he looked at her, thought how well-groomed in his own vernacular she was. 
She did not belong to the county, he felt sure. He had never seen her before, and he knew all the ridings well. She was plainly dressed in dark cloth, but the sables lining her cloak were of the finest. Her gloves were of perfect fit and texture. Her buttoned velvet boots were admirably made. She had a little velvet toque on a shapely head. She had an air of great distinction and simplicity combined. She resumed the perusal of her book, and he unfolded a morning paper. The train swung on its way at great speed. The dog, Ossian, lay down in the middle of the carriage. The glass of the windows was silvered with hoar-frost. Nothing was to be seen out of them of the country through which they were being hurried. The snow fell continually. There was no wind. Ossian, waking out of his nap and yawning, much bored, began the conversation by laying his muzzle on the lady's knees. "'Pray forgive him,' said his master. "'There is nothing to forgive. What a beauty he is!' "'He is as good as he looks, but perhaps he ought to apologise for being here.' "'Why? Well, really, I do not know why, but it is expected that a dog's owner should say so.' "'Only when he writes to the Times,' said the lady, amused. In point of fact, it is I who am in the wrong place, for this is a smoking carriage. Ossian having thus broken the ice between them, they continued to talk, of the weather, of the news of the day, of the book she had brought with her, of dogs in general, and of the collie in particular. They were neither of them very talkative by temperament, or disposed to be communicative usually, but they got on very well together. He shifted his seat to the corner in front of her, and they continued to skim over a variety of subjects, harmoniously and agreeably to both, as the train glided over the frozen ground, scattering the fine white powder of the snow in front of it. "'How fast it snows!' said the lady rather anxiously, trying to rub the pane of glass nearest her clear with her handkerchief. "'Were you ever blocked up by a snowstorm?' asked Hurstman so. I have been, once in Scotland and once in Canada. It is a disagreeable experience. It must be indeed. I hope there'll be no chance of that today. Oh no, men will have kept the line clear, no doubt. As he spoke, the train slackened its speed, moved with a jerking and dragging sound for some time, and a little while later stopped still with a great noise of rushing steam and a jar which shook the carriage violently and flung Ossian against one of the doors. The lady turned pale, but she did not move or scream. She looked a mute inquiry. I suppose they failed to keep the line clear, he said in answer to the glance. Allow me to look out a moment. He let down a window and leaned out of it, but the air was so dense with steam and snow that he could not see a yard before him. This is an accident, she said. I do not think so. I imagine we've run into a snowdrift, nothing more. The noise of the steam rushing out of the engine and the shouts of officials calling to each other almost drowned his voice. He took his railway key out of his pocket and opened the door. I will go and see what it is and return in a moment, he said to her, signing to Ossian to remain in the carriage and leaving the door open. She did not attempt to detain or to follow him. That is a thoroughbred woman, he said to himself. He did return in a few minutes and brought word that they had stuck fast in the snow. The engine driver had slackened speed in time to avoid an accident, but they might be detained for hours. The telegraph wires were all down through the weight of the snow. It is extremely disagreeable, but it is not dangerous, he said to reassure her. We shall be quitte pour la peur. We shall probably have time to get dreadfully keen about eating and have nothing to eat. England is such a small place, one never thinks of stoking when one travels in it. My poor maid, she said anxiously, I am afraid she must be very frightened wherever she is. Uh, can I look for her? You are very kind, but how should you know her? I will get out myself. It may be as well to get out, you would be warmer if you stayed in the carriage, but there is the chance that a train may come up behind and run into ours, though men have gone down the line with lamps. She had nothing with her except her book and a bouquet of violets. Closely followed by Ossian, he accompanied her along the line, looking into each compartment to find her maid. There were many people, both in the train and out of it, talking confusedly. 
suggesting this, that and the other. The air was full of fog and snow. The engine, snorting and smoking, stood with its brazen breast pushed against the high white hillocks. When they found the maid, a grey elderly person, she was in a panic of terror which made her perfectly useless. She was shaking from head to foot and repeating disconnected scriptural texts. She resisted all her mistress's requests and entreaties to her to descend. She said she wished to meet her God where she was. If there be any thieves in the train, said Hurstman so to the lady, they will have an easy time with your jewel box. I do not wear jewels, said his fellow traveller curtly. He looked at her in some surprise. Her tone had asperity in it. Were you going up to town, may I ask? He ventured to inquire. No, she answered, only from one country house to another. He wished he knew what country houses they were, but he could not ask that. She argued with her maid very patiently and with great kindness, but made no impression. Poor Danvers, she's out of her mind with fear. What shall I do, she said, appealing to him as though they had been old acquaintances. Are you afraid of a long walk? No. Will you come with me then? I know the country. The nearest town is four miles away. I'm going there to send help. Will you like to come? She did not immediately reply. May I present myself, he added. I am Lord Hurstman so. She looked up quickly. Indeed, you are very like your sister. Which one? I have several. Lady Kenilworth. He laughed. That is a great compliment. She is the beauty of the family. Do you know her? She is one of the beauties of England. Not I, but my people do. I have seen her, of course. The tone was rather repellent, by no means cordial. Well, we must not lose daylight, said Ronald. Will you come? The snow is firm, and it will be fair cross-country walking. You will be less chilled than staying here in inaction, and it is not more than four miles to the town by shortcuts which I know. She hesitated. But my poor woman, to leave her here alone. I will tell my servant to stay and look after her. She will join you in the town, and you will continue your journey. I think you had better come with me. I must go myself anyhow, for no one else knows the country. I have hunted and ridden over it scores of times, and I know every bush and briar. I will come, she said, without any further hesitation. You are a good walker, he said a little anxiously. She laughed a little. Oh, yes, I shall not break down and cast my shoes. Come along then. It soon grows dark in these early spring days. Our Aprils are considerably worse than our Novembers. He is rather too familiar, she thought, but she perceived that it was his natural manner, which, when he was not irritated or sarcastic, or, as he frequently was, silent, had great frankness and simplicity in it. It's an odd thing to do, she continued to say to herself, to walk across country in the snow with a man one does not know. But he is certainly Lord Hurstman so by his resemblance to his sister. And it will be better to walk than to sit still in a railway carriage with a chance of being frozen into bronchitis or smashed by an express train. And she took her way across the bleak blank pastures which stretched around the scene of the accident with little frozen brooks and ditches and sunken fences dividing them and no trees or hedges to relieve the tedium of the level landscape since scientific agriculture ruled supreme. How well she carries herself, thought Hurstman so. Who could she be possibly that I do not know her by sight? And her people know Mouse and not me. The snow was hard and afforded good footing. She crossed the ditches and little streams as easily and with as much elasticity as Ossian did and went on her way quickly and with energy, carrying her bouquet of violets close up to her mouth to keep out the biting wind. She asked him the name of the town to which they were going, and if they would be able to telegraph thence. I fear the wires will be damaged there too, he answered. It is called Greater Thorpe. There is Lesser Thorpe, St Mary's Thorpe, Monk's Thorpe, Dane's Thorpe, the two latter charming names suggestive of the past. You would see the spire of Greater Thorpe from here if it were a clear day, or what does duty in England as a clear day? One's greatest want in England is distance, she answered. 
I was in India a little while ago. What an atmosphere! It is heaven only to live in it. Yes, the light is wonderful. So golden, so pure, to think that the English dare to defile it with factory smoke. Well, that is on a piece with all we do there. How vulgar, how fussy, how common the conquerors look beside the conquered. Go into a bank a counting-house, a police station, and see the calm, stately, proud, reposeful natives in their flowing robes, bullied and sworn at by some smug, sandy-haired, snub-nosed official in a checked suit and a pot hat. One wishes for a second and successful mutiny. It must be admitted we are neither pliant nor picturesque. The Russians, when they succeed us, will at least compose better. In what part of India were you? She told him, adding... I have left with extreme regret. You were in the Framlingans' presidency. Did you know them? I was on a visit to them. If she would only say who she is, thought Ronald, as a gust of wind blew them apart and sent the snow spray into their faces. He felt sure that she belonged to his world and that she was married. She had a composure of tone and manner which made her seem much older than her features looked. He was lost in admiration of the beauty of her feet as the wind lifted her skirts, or as she lifted herself over the ditches in a spring as easy as the dogs. "'You enjoy this rough walk?' he asked shortly to her. "'I think I do,' she answered. "'But I should enjoy it more if I were sure I could telegraph from this greater Thorpe. "'You wish to reassure your people?' "'I do.' "'If she would only say who they are,' he thought." but she did not. They could only converse when the wind lulled, which was not very often. It blew straight in their faces over the bare level land, and he had some trouble in recognising the landmarks in the white obliteration of the always featureless landscape, and in avoiding the barbed wire fencing, which had many a day cost him many an angry oath as he had hunted over those pastures. I used to be a good deal in this country, he said, as they at last left the wide level fields for a high road, and which was less exposed to the wind. I used to hunt with a veil of Thorpe hounds. I do not hunt anywhere now, and I have nothing now to bring me into the county since my cousin, Lord Roxall, sold his place. Veil vale Royal? Yes, do you know it? I have seen it. A fine old place, the biggest beaches in England, and a herd of wild cattle equal to the Chillingham. I only wish one of the red bulls would gore the wretched cad who has bought it, or perhaps in strict justice the bulls ought first to have gored Roxall. She did not reply. She was walking as easily and quickly as ever, though it was the fourth mile, and the cold of the bleak sunless day grew more intense as the hours wore away. Vale Royal was given by Henry the Second to the Roxalls of that time, he continued. My cousin wanted money, it is true, but not so desperately that he need have done so vile a thing. He was led into it. The man who has bought it is a brute from the northwestern states, made his fortune in all kinds of foul ways, drinking shops, gambling saloons, cattle trading, opium dealing, cheating poor devils who landed with a little money and went to him for advice and concessions. An unspeakable rascal who, after thirty years' infamy out there, pulls himself together, praises God for all his mercies, and comes back to this country to go to church, sit in Parliament, wear a tall hat, and buy English society in English estates. Don't you agree with me that it is utterly disgraceful? She held her violets higher up to her face, so that he saw nothing but her eyes which were looking down the long straight white road which stretched out before them into a grey haze of fogs. I quite agree with you, she said, in very clear and incisive tones. I think it utterly disgraceful, but the disgrace is as much to the bought as the buyer. Certainly, said Hurstman, so with great warmth. A society is utterly rotten and ruined when such a fungus as this can take root in it. That I have always maintained. Tell me whom you know and I will tell you what you are is as true when said of society as when it is said of an individual. Certainly society only knows this man, this Massarine, in a perfunctory supercilious way and only gives him the kind of nod which is the equivalent of a kick. But it does know him. It drinks his wines and eats his dinners. It nods to him. It elects him. 
It leaves cards on him. It lets him look ridiculous in white breeches and a gilded coat at St. James's, and it makes him pay through the nose for all its amiabilities and tolerations. It is an infamy. She looked straight before her down the road and did not reply. You said you agreed with me, said Hurstman, so surprised at her silence. I agree with you entirely. But there was a chillness in her tone which suggested to him that, however completely she shared his opinions, the subject was disagreeable to her. She can't belong to that class herself. She is thoroughbred down to the ground, he thought, as he said aloud. I'm afraid you are tired. The cold is beginning to tell on you. No, I am not at all cold, she answered, holding up nearer to her the poor violets shriveling in the frost. What has come over her, I wonder, he said to himself. She was so frank and natural and pleasant, and now she is chilly and stiff and scarcely opens her lips. It is since I spoke of Vale Royal, but she said she agreed with me. Perhaps she knows Gerald and is fond of him, but he could hardly know anybody intimately whom I have never seen or never heard of at the least. Yet there is this to be said, you blame this person, she added, in a low but clear tone as she walked on, looking straight before her. You admit that your world is more contemptible than he. What obliged Lord Roxall to live in such a manner that he was forced to sell his old estate? Are not nearly all of you tradesmen and horse dealers and speculators, who fill the markets with game, the wharves with coal, the shows with fat cattle and brood mares? who breed herds of Shetland ponies to sell them to the cruel work of the mines, who destroy all the wild bird life of three kingdoms, that the slaughter of the Batus may be wholesale and the pheasants sent in thousands to Leadenhall. Your own order, your own order, what has it done, what does it ever do to make it so superior to the man from Dakota? Hurstman so listened in extreme astonishment. He could not understand the scorn and suppressed vehemence with which her words vibrated. He was silent because, in his own mind, he found the indictment a just one, but his aristocratic temper was in conflict with his intellectual judgment. What have the English aristocracy brought into fashion? What do they uphold by example and precept? she continued. Their life is one course of reckless folly. The summer is wasted in crowded London houses, varied by race meetings and pigeon shooting. The autumn and winter are spent in the incessant slaughtering of birds and beasts. Their beautiful country houses are only visited at intervals, when they are as crowded as a booth at a fair. What kind of example do they set to the man from Dakota? What do they suggest to him of self-denial, of culture, of true grace and courtesy, of contempt for ill-gotten riches? They crowd around him as poultry around a feeding pan. The whole thing is discreditable, but perhaps the most shameful part in it is not his. Hurstmanso was silent. He thought of Cocky and his sister, and he felt his blood tingle under the lash of her stinging words. My own withers are unwrung, he said at last with a smile. I don't do those things. My estates are extremely unproductive, and I live for the chief part of the year on one of them, Falden. It is on the sea, I think. Yes, on the coast of Waterford. Do you cut your timber? I do not. Do you preserve? For sport? No. Wildlife has a happy time of it, I assure you, with me. I am glad to hear any Englishman say so. Are we such a set of barbarians? Yes, you are very barbarous, much more so than the Hindus whom you have conquered. Compare the simplicity of their diet, the purity of their arts, the beauty of their costume and their architecture with a Lord Mayor's feast, a Royal Academy show, a Manchester Canal, a Fourth Bridge, a team of cyclists, a London woman's gown. Barbarians, barbarians indeed, worse than any Goth or Vandal, the nation which destroyed Delhi. She must surely be a Russian, thought Hurstman so. They often speak English with an admirable fluency, but why, if so, should Vale Royal affect her so singularly? It was not impressionable in these ways, but his new acquaintance attracted him extremely. He admired her, and her voice charmed him like music. At that moment, Ossian, perceiving in a distant field some sheep feeding on Swedes in the snow, could not resist his hereditary instinct of shepherding them. 
and caused his master some trouble as the sheep entirely mistook the collie's good intentions and fled away in all directions. The lady watched the scene standing still under pollarded willow. When order was restored and they walked on again, she asked him what had made him give up hunting. In herself she regretted her late eloquence and wished her companion to forget it. What made you give up hunting? she asked suddenly, as if conscious that the severity of her tone might appear strange to him. Well, I've never told anybody, he answered and paused. Then he went on in a rather embarrassed manner, nerved by the confidence which his unknown companion roused in him. I was one day in my own woods at Falden, sketching. Hounds were out, but I was not with them. I was sitting in the bracken, quite hidden by it, and an old dog fox slouched by me. His tail drooped. He was dead beat. He could scarcely drag himself along. He had a bad gash in his side from a stake or something. He went up to an old hollow oak, and out of it came his bitch and three little cubs. And they welcomed him, I assure you, just as his family might welcome a man going home after a hard campaign. And the bitch fell to licking the gash in his side, and the cubs frolicked around her. I never had the heart to hurt a fox again. Hares I never did hunt. It is barbarous work. But that fox, too, set me thinking. He cared for his home and his wife, just like any good citizen, going home in the tram to Peckham Rise or Brixton. It was a pretty sight, that poor thing going home. I stopped there till dark to make sure the pack didn't come after him. You did very right, she said in her soft, grave voice. I wish more men would pause and think like that. The wind rose and blew some more fine snow powder over them and in their faces. It is half past two o'clock, he said, looking at his watch. I am sure you must miss your luncheon. I should like a cup of tea, she answered. How much farther is it to Thorpe? About three quarters of a mile. We shall get there before dark. But I fear the Thorpe tea will not be up to your standard. However, they will give you a good fire at the Bell Inn. Ugh, the Bell Inn, it sounds like Charles Dickens and Washington Irving. Yes, but there is no longer the abundance and comfort of the old coaching days. Country inns now, like most other things, hardly pay their own expenses. I'm afraid I prefer the wayside station on the edge of the Indian jungle with ripe bananas brought to me on a coconut leaf and the monkeys looking down for a share from the reed roofs. So do I, he said, thinking that she looked pale and fatigued. But for our sins, we are in Waldshire, and we shall have to put up with coal fires and beefsteaks. She looked alarmed. Surely I shall not have to stay there. That will depend on what state the roads and the lines are in. The snow is less thick about here. Where are you going to? Of course, horses cannot stir out in this frost. She avoided the direct question. Oh well, it is an adventure. One must not complain. If I can get my poor woman to the town, I will support its indifferent accommodation. We will do the best we can, but the thought mind is slow and uninventive. The rural brain in England is apt to be clogged with beer. Fortunately, however, whatever be its density, it always retains its perception of the value of shillings and sovereigns. We will try that gentle stimulant so appreciated in politics, so especially appreciated since bribery was made a crime. They had now come near enough to the town to perceive in the haze the square shoulders of its roofs and the tower of its famous church, all blurred and blotted by the fog, like a too much washed watercolour drawing. She did not seem to be tired, but she had lost her elasticity of movement. Her eyes looked straight ahead and no longer turned to meet his own frankly, as they had done before. She seemed to wish to be silent, so he let the conversation drop and walked on beside her mutely, as the straggling suburbs of a country town began to show themselves in the more frequent cottages, in the occasional alehouse and in the presence of people in the roads and in the small wayside gardens where they were scraping and sweeping clear little paths from the gates to the doors. Some of these, recognise him, touched their hats. He spoke to the most capable looking, told them briefly of the accident and sent them on to the station master whilst he took his companion to the Bell Inn, an old house which had been a busy and prosperous place in the posting coaching times of which he had spoken. It stood in the centre of a market place, which was alive and noisy with country folks once a week, but was now a desolate and well-nigh empty place filled with wind and driven snow. 
If you will rest here ten minutes, he said to her, I will come back as soon as I have seen the authorities and heard what they propose to do, and I will tell you if the lines are safe and the wires in working order. I am afraid you will find it very rough and uncomfortable, but they are lighting the fire and the landlady is a good soul. My cousins used to come and have some of her soup on hunting mornings. You will like her, I think. He held open the door of the only sitting-room, and as she passed within, bowed very low to her, and went out into the street again. As he reached the middle of the market-place, he heard his name spoken, and turning at the sound, saw her to his surprise coming towards him from the entrance of the inn. He went back a few steps to meet her. She was very pale still, and there was a pride which was almost aggressive in her attitude as she stood still on the slippery trodden stones and faced him. Pray do not come back to me, she said coldly. I can have all I need here till my woman can join me. But there is something I ought to tell you, and I ought also to thank you for all your good nature and courtesy. She paused a moment whilst he looked at her in silence and surprise. She was evidently speaking under the influence of some strong and personal feeling. It is to Vale Royal that I am going, she added with a visible effort. I am Catherine Massarine. The blood leapt up into Hurst Monceau's face. He was dumb with amazement and regret. He forgot utterly that he was standing bareheaded in a snowy, sloppy marketplace with a dozen yokels staring and grinning about the gates of the inn yard. He drew a very long breath. I beg your pardon, he said gravely and with great humility. I am shocked. You have no need to be so, she replied. I quite agreed with your views, but I cannot alter my father, nor you your world. She stroked the uplifted head of Ossian and turned to go back to the door of the Bell Inn. He strode after her and reached her side. I am extremely sorry, he murmured. I, I am shocked at my gross indiscretion. I cannot look for your forgiveness, but pray do let me beg of you to take off those pretty velvet boots at once and let the woman rub your feet with spirits of some sort, failing eau de cologne. I wish I had thought to take your dressing bag from your woman. Thanks. She looked at him in a moment as she said the word and he thought there were tears in her large serious eyes. Then she went inside the old posting house and he saw her no more. That cat's daughter, heavens and earth, he said to himself, as he brushed the men aside and hastened across the marketplace. He scarcely knew what he said to the frightened station master and the obsequious mayor and the bustling town clerk and all the good people who crowded to welcome a live lord and hear of a railway accident. He was intensely surprised, disproportionately irritated, and sincerely vexed with himself for having spoken so incautiously. He knew that every one of his words must have cut like a knife into the sensitive nerves of this woman whom he had admired and who had looked to him so thoroughbred. He had felt more attracted to her than he had ever felt to any stranger, and to receive this shock of disillusion left him colder than he had been all day in the mists and the snow. Suddenly it flashed across his memory that she must be the heiress whom Mouse had desired him to marry. Suspicion awoke in him. He had not known her, but it was very possible she had known him when he had entered the railway carriage. She had spoken of his likeness to his sister. Her avoidance of any hint as to who she was or whither she was going appeared to him to suggest design. Why had she not disclosed her name until the very last moment? Though a poor man for his rank, he had been a great deal run after by women on account of his physical beauty and he was wary and suspicious where women were in question. She had caught him off his guard, and he repented it. If she were in truth William Massarine's daughter, she probably knew the share which his sister had so largely taken in the sales of Vale Royal and Blair Aaron, and in the persuasion of society to accept the purchasers. He did not know the details of his sister's diplomacy, but he guessed enough of them for him to burn with shame at the mere conjecture. When his own kith and kin were foremost in this disgraceful traffic, what could his own condemnation of it look like? Hypocrisy? Affectation? Subterfuge? What had possessed him to talk of such subjects on a public road to a stranger? He never by any chance gave himself away. 
Why had he done so this day merely because he had felt as if he had known for years a woman who had beautiful feet in fur-rimmed boots and a big bouquet of violets? He was furious at his own folly, and he had told her that story of the fox too, which he had buried so closely in his own breast as men like him do secrete all their best impulses and emotions of which they are more ashamed than any of their sins and vices. He had never been so incensed and troubled about a trifle in his whole life, and all the high breeding in him made him feel the keenest regret to have so cruelly mortified a woman about her own father and her own position. To a gentleman the knowledge that he has insulted a person who cannot punish him for it is a very dreadful thing. He had said no more than he meant, no more than he felt, and nothing which he would have retracted. But he was extremely sorry that he had said it to the daughter of the man Masserine. To the man himself he would have had the greatest pleasure in saying it. What was I about to walk across country with a stranger and talk so indiscreetly to her? He asked himself in self-reproach, as sincere as it was useless. She asked herself the same question as she dried her snow-wet clothes before the fire of the Bell Inn, and offered all the notes and gold in her purse to have an old post-chaise got ready at once, and the shoes of two horses roughed. End of chapter 12《Chapter Thirteen of the Masserines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Richard Ship. The Masserines by Ouida. Chapter Thirteen. When she reached Vale Royal, which she did late that night, after a dreary and dangerous drive of fourteen miles, at a walking pace, over frozen roads, she told her parents of the detention of the train by the snowdrift, but she did not tell them of her meeting with Lady Kenilworth's brother. She was tired and chilled, and went at once to a hot bath and her bed, whither her mother brought her a cup of boiling milk with two spoons full of cognac in it. It ought by rights to be milked on to the brandy, said that good lady, but that can't be done here, though there are half a score of beautiful Aldenies standing on the home farm only just to supply the house, and such a dairy, my dear. Chiny the walls is, and marble the floors, only I don't hold with their method of churning, and the wenches are much too fine. I showed em how to turn out butter one day, and I heard em say as I come away that my proper place was the kitchen. Well, good night, my dearie, sleep well. Uh, good night, dear mother, said Catherine with unusual tenderness, for she was not demonstrative, and her parents to her were almost strangers. Oh, it's not her fault, she thought, if we are upstairs and interlopers in this place which Henry the Second gave the Roxalls. Then her great fatigue conquered her, and, the branded milk aiding, she fell sound asleep, and slept dreamlessly until the chimes of the clock tower sounded eleven in the still, sunny, frosty noonday air. Then she awoke with a sense of something odiously painful having happened, and as she saw the withered bouquet of violets which she had told her maid to leave with her gloves and her muff on a table near, she remembered, and the words of Hurstman so came back to her mind with poignant mortification in their memories. How right he was, oh, how right he was, but how merciless, she thought, as she looked through the panes of the oriel window of her chamber, out on to the white and silent park. She saw the huge old oaks, the grand old views, the distant mere frozen over, the deer crossing the snow in the distance to be fed. The bells of a church unseen were chiming musically. In the ivy beneath her windows, two robins were singing in friendly rivalry. Above head was a pale, soft sky of faintest blue. In the air there was frost. It was all charming, homelike, stately, simple. It would have delighted her if, 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 there were so many ifs, she felt sick and weary at the mere thought of them, and the innocent tranquillity of the scene jarred on all her nerves with pain. It was late in the morning before she could summon strength to go downstairs where she found her mother lunching alone in the Tudor dining hall. 
Her father had gone away early in a sledge to attend political meetings in an adjacent county, and the large house party invited was not due for two weeks. "'Who are coming, mother?' she asked. "'Oh, my dear, I never know. I scarce know who they are when I see them. replied the present mistress of Vale Royal. "'Lady Kenilworth has arranged it all. She brings her friends.' Catherine coloured at the name. "'As she would go to the Hotel de Paris at Monte Carlo or the sanatorium at Hot Springs,' she said bitterly. "'Well, I don't know about that. She'd have to pay for them in those places,' said Mrs. Masserine seriously, not intending any sarcasm. "'Don't you eat nothing, my dear?' asked her mother anxiously. "'I can't say as India have made you fat, Kathleen.' She smiled involuntary. "'Surely you do not wish me to be fat, mother?' "'Well, no, not exactly, but I'd like to see you enjoy your food.' "'Did she go through the form of showing you her list?' "'No, my dear, she didn't. Your father knows who is coming. "'I did say to her as how I wish she'd bring her children. "'They are such little ducks. "'But she gave a little scoffing laugh and didn't even reply. "'How can you tolerate her? You should turn her out of the house.' "'Oh, my dear Kathleen,' said Mrs. Masserine in an awed tone, We've owed everything to her. If it hadn't been for her, I believe we shouldn't have known a soul worth speaking of to this day. That old Chris, though he's a real prince, is somehow down on his luck and can't get anybody anywhere. You've made fine friends, to be sure, and they didn't cotton to us. And your Lady Mary, whom you've just come from, they say isn't what she should be. Is Lady Kenilworth? Lord, she must be, my dear. Why, she comes on here from Sandringham. She's at the very tip-top of the tree. She stays at Windsor and she sits next to the Queen at the Braemar gathering. What more could you have? And though she does bite my nose off and treat me like dirt, I can't help being took by her. There's something about her carries you off your feet like. I don't know what to call it. Fascination. Well, yes, I suppose you'd say so. It's a kind of power in her, and grace and beauty and cruelty all mixed up in her, as tis in a pretty young cat. Your father's that wrapped up in her, he sits staring like an owl when she's in the room, and I believe if she told him to hop on one leg round the Houses of Parliament, he'd do it to please her. Does he not see how ridiculous she makes him? My dear, said Mrs. Masserine with solemnity, a man never thinks he is ridiculous. He says to himself, I'm a man, and he gets a queer sort of comfort out of that as a baby does out of sucking its thumb. Catherine smiled absently. Does Lady Kenilworth ever speak of her brother, her eldest brother, Lord Hurstmanso, she said, in an embarrassed tone which her mother did not observe. Yes, she says, he's a bear. He's brought her brothers-in-law and a good many of her relations, her people, she calls them. But her own brothers, none of them ever. This place belonged to her cousin. Did it? I never knew anything about it. William came in one day and said, I bought a place in the Shires. Go down there this afternoon. That was all. I was struck all of a heap when I saw it, and the housekeeper, who had stayed to go over the inventory, drew herself up when she met me, stiff as stiff, and said to me, I shall be glad if you will release me of my charges, madam. I have always lived with gentlefolks. Well, those were her very words, Kathleen. A fine set-up, glum-looking woman she was, dressed in black-watered silk, and she went off the next morning, though we had offered her double her price to remain under us. That's just, you know, what Gregson the courier said once, or rather, he said he wouldn't live with gentlefolks because they were always out of pocket. Catherine moved restlessly. Words rose to her lips, which she repressed. And when I go in the village, continued her mother, there's nothing but black looks and shut doors, and the very geese on the little common screech at me. The rector's civil, of course, because he's an eye to the main chance, but he's the only one. And I'm afeard it's mostly because he wants your father to give him a peal of bells. They seem to think your father should pay the national debt. Catherine sighed. Poor mother, que de couleuvre en vous fait d'avaler. Don't talk French, Kathleen, I can't abide it, said Mrs. Masserine, with unusual acerbity. When we first set foot in Kerosene City, a few planks on the mud as t'was then, a little nasty Frenchman had an eating shop next to ours, and he undersold me in everything. 
and made dishes out of nothing and such pastry light as love my best was led beside it she continued to recall the culinary feats of her gallic rival whose superiority had filled her with a gallophobia deathless and pitiless as that of francesco crispi and her daughter's thoughts wandered away from her to the low-lying white fields around greater thorpe and to the remembrance of the dark blue eyes which had met her only so frankly through the misty air would you mind very much mother she said at length if i did not appear whilst these people are here i could go to lady mary's or to brighton mrs masserine was startled and alarmed oh my dearie no not on any account your father would never forgive it you have been so much away it has angered him so and as for your views and your reasons he'd never see them my dear no more than a blind man can see a church clock pray don't dream of it child people say it is so odd you went to india they will think you have some skin disease or a light in your head unless you are seen now at home Catherine sighed again. "'I think you do not understand,' she said in a low, grave voice. "'I utterly disapprove. I utterly abhor the course which my father takes. I think his objects contemptible and his means to attain them loathsome. If you only knew what they look to persons of breeding and honour, society laughs at him whilst it uses him and rules him. He is not a gentleman. He never will be one.' A complacent premier may get him a knightage, a baronetage, a peerage, and a sovereign as complacent may let him kiss her hand. But nothing of that will make him a gentleman. He will never be one if he live to be a hundred, or if he live to entertain emperors. I cannot alter his actions, I cannot open his eyes. I have perhaps no right to speak thus of him. But I cannot help it. I despise the whole miserable ignominious farce. I cannot bear to be forced to remain a spectator of it. This place is Lord Roxall's. All the money in the world cannot make it ours. We are aliens and intruders. All the people whom Lady Kenworth will bring here next week will go away to ridicule us, plebeians as we are masquerading in fine clothes and ancient houses. My dear, my dear, cried her mother in great trepidation, you make me all in a cold tremble to hear you. All you say is gospel truth, and I've felt it many a time, or like to it myself, but it is no manner of use to say it. Your father thinks he's a great man, and nobody will put him out of conceit of himself. It's true that as he made his pile, he's the right to the spending of it. Don't you talk of going away, Kathleen. You're the only creature I have to look to, for I know full well that I'm only a stone in your father's path and a thorn in his flesh. I can't kill myself to pleasure him, for twould be fire everlasting, but I know I'm no use to him now. I was of use on the other side, and he knew it then, though I can't call to mind one grateful word as ever he said to me, but he knew it, and wouldn't have got along as fast as he did without me, and nobody kept ledgers better than me, nor scrubbed a kitchen table whiter. That's neither here nor there now, however, and I'm in his way now with fine folks, and looks like em I never shall. But you, my dear, you do look like em, and talk like em, and carry yourself like em. I would call you like an empress, only I saw an empress once, and she was a little old hodmedod of a woman in a Shetland shawl, and she was cheapening shells on the beach at Blankenburg, and you are grand and stately, and fine as a lily on its stalk. I want them to see what you look like, my dear. And they won't laugh at you, that's certain. As for the house, it's been paid for, so I don't see how you can say it's Lord Roxall still. He can't eat his cake and have it. And, my dear Kathleen, she continued, changing the subject with great agitation, they say you mustn't know Lady Mary. She, she, she isn't respectable. There is something about her boy's tutor and about a painter, a house painter even, they say. Catherine Masserine coloured. Dear mother, I know Lady Mary is not all she might be. She is light and foolish. But when you sent me to that Brighton school, a little frightened, stupid, miserable child who could not even speak grammatically, Lady Mary noticed me when she came to see Enid and May, her own daughters, and told them to be kind to me and asked me to spend the holidays with them 
and they were kind, most kind, and never laughed at me, and took pains to tell me how to behave and how to speak. And I assure you, my dear mother, that Lady Mary might be the worst woman under the sun, I should never admit it, and I should always be grateful to her for her goodness to me when I was friendless and common and ridiculous, a little vulgar chit who called you Ma. Mrs. Masserine was divided between wrath and emotion. I am sure you were a well-brought-up child from your cradle, and pretty behaved if ever there were one, she said with offence, and I dare say you knew as how your father had made his pile and had an eye on it. Oh no, oh no, said Catherine with warmth and scorn. Lady Mary is not like that, nor any of her people. They are generous and careless and never calculate. They are not like your Kenilworths and Carsteins. She is a very thoroughbred woman, and to her, novi homine are novi homine, however gilded may be their stucco pedestals. Happily, the phrase was incomprehensible to her hearer, who merely replied obstinately, Well, they tell me she's ill spoke of, and I can't have you mixed up with any asses. But if she was kind to you, my dear, and I mind me well you always wrote about her as being such, I'll do anything to help her in reason. You know, my dear, she added, lowering her voice, for the utterance was treasonable, I have found out as how all of them great folks are all hollow inside, as one may say. They live uncommon smart and whisk about all the year round, but they're all of them in Queer Street, living by their wits, as one may say. Now I be bound your Lady Mary is so too, because she's a duke's daughter, and her husband came into the country with King Canute, him as washed his feet in the sea, at least the book says so, and anything she'd like done in the way of money I'd be delighted to do, since she was good to you. Oh, my dear mother, cried Catherine, half amused and half incensed, pray put that sort of thing out of your mind altogether. Lady Mary has everything she wants, and if she had not, she would die sooner than say so. And indeed, they are quite rich. Not what my father would call so probably, but enough so for a county family which dates, as you rightly observe, from Knut. Mrs. Masserine sighed heavily. She was bewildered, but she was obstinate. Diamonds, then? she said tentatively. None of them ever have enough diamonds. One might send her a stand-up thing for a head in diamonds, Tyra, I think they call it, and say as how we are most grateful, all of us, but you can't be intimate because virtue's more than rank. Catherine rose with strong effort, controlling the deep anger and the irresistible laughter which moved her. We will talk of these things another time, dear, she said after a moment. Lady Mary will not be in London this season after Whitsuntide. Enid and May go out this year with their grandmother, Lady Chillingham. That's just what she said, cried her mother in triumph. She said Lady Mary couldn't show her nose at court, even to present her own girls. Who said so? Lady Kenilworth. Lady Kenilworth, a purist. I fear she could give my poor Lady Mary a good many points. What do you mean? Lady Kenilworth knows the world. Well, that no one doubts, and I dare say she would take the tiara, my dear mother. I don't understand you, and you have a very rude way of speaking. Forgive me, dear, said her daughter with grace and penitence. I do not like your guide, philosopher and friend, though she is one of the prettiest women I ever saw in my life. Well, you can't say she doesn't go to court, cried Mrs. Masserine in triumph. I am quite sure she will go to court all her life, replied Catherine Masserine, an answer on which her mother pondered darkly in silence. It must be meant for praise, it could not be meant for blame, and yet there was a tone in the speaker's voice, a way of saying this apparently acquiescent and complimentary phrase which troubled its hearer. Her answers for all the world like a pail of fine milk spoilt by the cow having ate garlic, thought Mrs. Masserine, her mind reverting to happy homely days in the dairy and the pastures with blossom and bee and buttercup, where courts were realms unknown. Catherine was silent. She felt the absolute impossibility of inducing her mother to make any stand against the way of life which to herself was so abhorrent, or even to make her comprehend the suffering it was to her finer and more sensitive nature. Her mother disliked the life because it worried her and made her feel foolish and incapable. 
but she could not reach any conception of the torture and degradation which had appeared to Catherine. If she had possessed any power, any influence, if she had been able to return in kind the insolence she winced under and the patronage she so bitterly resented, things would have seemed different to her. But she could do nothing. She could only remain the passive, though indignant, spectator of what she abhorred. To her the position was false, contemptible, infamous, everything which Hurstman so had called it, and she was compelled to appear a voluntary sharer in and accessory to it. The house, beautiful, ancient, interesting as it was, seemed to her only a hateful prison, a prison in which she was every day set in a pillory. All the underlings of the gardens, the stables, the home farm, the preserves showed the contempt which they felt for these unwelcome successors of the Roxall family. One would think one had not paid a single penny for the place, said Mrs. Masserine, who, when she asked the head gardener at what rate he sold his freesias, was met by the curt reply, We don't sell no flowers here, Mum. Lord Roxall never allowed it. But my good man, said his present mistress, Lord Roxall's gone for ever and I. He's naught to do with the place any more, and to keep all these miles of glass without making a profit out of them is a thing I couldn't hold with anyhow. "'Nobody's so much money that they can afford waste, Mr. Simpson, "'and what we don't want ourselves must be sold.' "'That must be as you choose, Mum,' said the head gardener doggedly. "'You'll suit yourself and I'll suit myself. "'I've lived with gentlefolk and I hain't lived with traders.' "'At the same moment, Mr. Winter, who had of course brought down his household, "'was saying to the head keeper, "'Yes, it does turn one's stomach to stay with these shoe blacks. "'It's a social democracy, that's what it is. "'But the old families, they're all run to see like your oxals. "'They expect one to put up with double-bedded rooms and African sherries. "'I am one as always stands up for the aristocracy, "'but their cellars aren't what they were, nor their tables neither. "'That's why they're always dining themselves with the sweeps and shoe blacks. In happy ignorance that his groom of the chambers was describing him as a sweep and a shoe black, William Masserine, with a marquis, a bishop and a lord lieutenant waiting him, was driving to address a political meeting at the chief town of South Waldshire. When he got up on his dog-cart, correctly attired in the garb and the gaiters of a squire of high degree, and drove over to quarter sessions, he felt as if he had been a justice of the peace and the master of Vale Royal all his life. He really handled horses very well. His driving was somewhat too flashy and reckless for English taste, but the animal had never been foaled which he would not have been able to break in. He, who had ridden broncos bare-backed and raced blue-grass trotters, and this power stood him in good stead in such a horsey county as Waldshire. The snow was gone and the weather was open. There was the prospect of political changes in the air and, in the event of a general election, his chiefs of party desired that he should represent his county instead of continuing member for that unsound and uncertain metropolitan division which he did actually represent. To feel the way and introduce him politically in the borough before there should be any question of his being put up for it, those who were interested in the matter had got up a gathering of county notabilities on a foreign question of the moment, which was supposed, as all foreign questions always are, to involve the entire existence of England. He had been told what to say on these questions, and although it seemed to him awful rot, like everything inculcated by his leaders, he said it obediently, and refreshed himself afterwards by some personal statements. Amongst men, on public matters, he always showed to his advantage. He was common, ignorant, absurd very often, but he was a man, a man who could hold his own and had a head on his shoulders. That mastery of fate which had made him what he was gave meaning to his dull features and light to his dull eyes. No one, as modern existence is constituted, could separate him altogether from the weight of his ruthless will and the greatness of his accomplished purpose. He stood on a solid basis of acquired gold. Before a fine lady he shook in his shoes and before a prince he trembled, but at a mass meeting he was still the terrible, the formidable, the indomitable, bulldozing boss of Kerosene City. His stout hands gripped the rail in front of him while their veins stood out like cords, and his rough rasping voice made its way through the wintry air of England as it had done through a blizzard on the plains of the West. "'I've been a working man myself, gentlemen,' he said amidst vociferous cheers, 
and if I am a rich man today, it's been by my own hand and my own head as I've become so. I've come home to die. A voice in the crowd, you'll live a hundred years. But before I die, I want to do what good I can to my country and my fellow countrymen. Vociferous cheers. Blood's thicker than water, gentlemen. The applause he was so deafening that he was forced to pause. This phrase never fails to raise a tempest of admiration, probably because no one can ever possibly say what it is intended to mean. I know the institutions of my country, gentlemen, he continued, and I am proud to take my humble share in holding them steady through stormy weather. I have lived for over thirty years, gentlemen, in a land where the institutions are republican, and I wish to speak of that great republic with the sincere respect I feel. But a republican form of government would be wholly unfitted for Great Britain. Why so? asked a voice in the crowd. Mr. Masserin did not feel called on to answer so indiscreet a question. He continued as though no one had spoken. The foundations of her greatness lie embedded in the past and are inseparably allied with her institutions. The courage, honour and patriotism of her nobility, the Marquis with a gratified expression played with his watch chain, the devotion, purity and self-sacrifice of her church, the prelate patted the black silk band on his stomach and purred gently like a cat, the examples of high virtue and wisdom which have adorned her throne, the Lord Lieutenant looked ecstatic and adoring as a pilgrim of lords before the shrine. All these, gentlemen, have made her what she is, the idol of her sons, the terror of her foes, the bulwark at once of religious faith and of religious freedom. The great glory of our country, sirs, is that poor and rich are equal before the law. Yeah, for a rude man below and that the roughest, most friendless lad may, by probity and industry, reach her highest honours. I myself left Queenstown, gentlemen, a young fellow with three pounds in my pocket and a change of clothes in a bundle, and that I have the honour of addressing you here today is due to the fact that I toiled honestly from morning till night for more than thirty years in exile. It was the hope of coming back, sirs, and settling on my native soil which kept the heart up in me through hunger and thirst and heat and cold, and such toil as here you know nothing about. I was a poor working lad, gentlemen, with three pounds in my pocket, and yet here I stand today, the equal of prince and peer. The Marquis frowned, the bishop fidgeted, the Lord Lieutenant coughed, but Mr. Masserine was en ballet, and he did not these hints of disapprobation. What do you want with republican institutions, my friends, when under a monarchy the doors of wealth and honour open wide to the labouring man, who has had sense and self-denial enough to work his way upward? They open to a golden key, damn your jaw, cried a vulgar being in the mob below who by honesty and economy and incessant toil has come to put his legs under the same mahogany with the highest of the land you talk of golden keys sir the only key to success is the key of character before i give my hand sir whether to prince or pauper i ask what is his character dear me dear me this is very irrelevant murmured the lord lieutenant much distressed damned inconvenient murmured the marquis with a chuckle the bishop folded his hands and looked rapt and pious, but the mayor of the borough with desperation plucked at the orator's coat-tails. Order, order, he murmured, with a clever adaptation of parliamentary procedure. And Mr. Masserine, whose ear was quick and who was proud of his knowledge of the bywords of the benches, understood that he was irrelevant and on ticklish grounds, and brought forward a racy American anecdote with ready presence of mind and extreme success whilst the crowd below roared with loud and delighted laughter. The gentleman at his elbow breathed again. There had been, in a ducal house of the countryside, a very grave scandal a few months earlier, a scandal which had become town talk and even been dragged into the law courts. It would never do to have the yokels told their character was a patrician or political saint qua non. On the whole, the speech was a very popular one. The new owner of Vale Royal was welcomed too egotistic in places and too unpolished in others. It was vigorous, strong and appealed forcibly to the mob by its picture of a herdsman with three pounds in his pocket become a capitalist and a patron of princes. 
to his own immediate and aristocratic supporters its effect was less inspiriting it gave them distinctly to understand the quid pro quo which he gave and expected if he don't get what he wants from our side he'll rat as sure as he lives thought the lord lieutenant and the mayor thought to himself that it would really have been better to have left the metropolitan division its member ungrudged what a fearful person said the lord lieutenant a tall slender man with fair hair turning grey and a patrician face blank and dreary in expression though many years of conflict between a great name and a narrow income his speech was quite radical i really did not know how to sit still and hear it whispered the bishop in a tone of awe and horror the marquis lighted a cigar never mind that it took with the yokels he'll vote straight for us he wants a peerage gladstone would give him a peerage of course but gladstone's peerages are like gladstone claret unpleasantly cheap besides our man loves smart folks the liberals are dowdy our man loves property like the northern farmer and the liberals are always nibbling into it like mice into cheese besides mouse kenilworth's godmother to this beast she has put him in the way he should go i wish he would write his speeches for him said the bishop took with the yokels took with the yokels repeated the marquis ain't that what speeches are made for people who can read don't want to be bald at man will do very well and we shall have him in the lords he'll call himself lord vale royal i suppose ha <laughs> ha poor roxall the lord lieutenant could not accept the social earthquake with the serenity of his friend shivered and went to his carriage i shall go and ask our candidate for some money murmured the bishop whose carriage is not quite ready the marquis grinned nothing like a cleric for thinking of the main chance he said to himself the bishop hesitated a few moments looked up at the steps of the hotel and hastened across the market-place as rapidly as his portly paunch and tight ecclesiastical shoes permitted mr masserine was standing on the top of the step with three of his supporters the churchman took from his pocket a roll of thick vellum-like paper evidently a memorial or a subscription list for the rood screen he murmured a transcendent work of art and the restoration of the chauntry dear mr masserine with your admirable principles i am sure we may count on your support william masserine with his gold pencil case between his thick finger and thumb added his name to the list on the vellum-like scroll the lord lieutenant was on that list for twenty guineas lord roxall for ten guineas William Masserine wrote himself down for two hundred guineas. "'Back the church for never forgetting to do business,' said the Marquis, with a chuckle to himself, and he too mounted the hotel steps as his ecclesiastical friend descended them, after warmly and blandly pressing the candidate's hand and inviting him to dinner at the Episcopal Palace. "'Booking a front seat in heaven, Mr Masserine,' he cried out in his good-humoured, contemptuous voice." well come do something for earth too you haven't subscribed to the thorpe valley hounds got to do it you know hope you'll sound about pug the marquis had been master of the pack for a dozen years i'm no sportsman said his victim who had no notion who or what pug was but if it's the custom in the county of course it's the custom of the county roxall poor fellow was a staunch friend to us you mustn't be otherwise will draw vale royal coverts for cubs next october mind your sound about pug um, may i ask what lord roxall subscribed fifty guineas said the m f h truthfully mr masserine planted his legs a little further apart and thrust out his stomach i'll give four fifties to the dogs he said with grandeur the dogs ejaculated the marquis but he restrained his emotion and grasped his new subscriber's hand cordially the kennels in the cathedral got the same measure he thought with amusement as he nodded good-humouredly to the crowd below and entered the hotel to get a nip of something warm deuced clever of the bishop i shouldn't have thought of making the cad part what an eye the saints always have on the money-bags he thought as he drank some wrong punch but being a cheery person who took the world as he found it he said to his wife when he got home from that day go and call at vale royal anne the man's a very good fellow no nonsense about his origin he told us all he began life with three pounds in his pocket don't like going to see him in roxall's place oh lord my dear that's sentiment if roxall hadn't sold the place they couldn't have bought it could they but why should we know them 
said the lady, who was unwilling to accord her countenance to new people. "'Because he's promised two hundred guineas to the dogs,' said the Marquis with a chuckle, "'and because he's a pillar of the Tory democracy, my dear.' "'Tory democracy, a contradiction in terms,' said the lady. "'You might as well say angelic anarchy.' "'We shall come to that too,' said her spouse. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of The Massarines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Massarines by Ouida. Chapter 14. The snow was gone, but it was still cold and unpleasant weather when the ruler of Mr. Massarine's fate accompanied by a score or more intimate acquaintances, who had been persuaded to patronise Billy, arrived in the dusk of Vale Royal with an enormous amount of luggage and a regiment of body servants and maids. "'You needn't have come to meet us. I know my way about here better than you do,' was the ungracious salutation with which the host, who had gone himself to the station, was met by the object of his veneration. She never flattered him now. She had got him well in hand. It was no longer necessary to do violence to her nature. When one likes the use of the spur, one does not humour one's horse with sugar. She thought the spur and the whip salutary for him, and employed them with scant mercy. She mounted as lightly as a young cat to the box of the four-in-hand brake, took the reins and drove her mesmerised, trembling yet enchanted victim through the dusky lanes and over the muddy roads which were familiar to her, the lights of the lamps flashing, and the chatter and laughter of the other occupants of the brake, bringing the labouring people out of their cottages, as the lady whom they knew so well flew by them in the twilight. Seems kind of heartless like in Lady Kenny to go to the great house now, the poor lord's in it no more, him her own cousin and all, said a young woman to her husband who was only a hedger and ditcher, but a shrewd observer in his way, and who replied as he looked after the four white stockinged bays, Lady Kenny aren't one to cry for spilt milk. She knows where her bread is buttered. Lord gal, twas she made Roxall sell, and I'll take my oath as I stands here that most of the blunt went in her pocket. All the people for forty miles round were of the same opinion and owed her a grudge for it. Roxall had been a very popular landlord and employer. His tenantry and labouring folks mourned for him, and despised the new man who stood on his hearthstone. Quite indifferent, however, to the Vos Populi, she drove safely through the familiar gates and up the mile-long avenue as night descended, and went into the library, looking very handsome, with her blue eyes almost black, and her fair face bright and rosy from the chilly high winds of the bleak April evening. She pulled off her sealskins and threw them to one of her attendant gentlemen, and then walked forward to the warmth of that great Elizabethan fireplace. "'Well, my dear woman, how do you like it?' she said good-humouredly to Margaret Masserine, as she threw off her gloves and took a cup of tea before the hearth, where a stately fire was burning for its beauty's sake. The great room was heated by hot water pipes. Margaret Masserine was in that dual state of trepidation, anxiety, offence and bewilderment into which the notice of her monitress invariably plunged her. She murmured some inarticulate words and glanced timidly at the bevy of strangers, but Mouse did not take the trouble to introduce her friends to their hostess. Some of them were already acquainted with her, but some were not all with equal and unceremonious readiness ignored her presence and descended on the teacups and muffins and caviar sandwiches with the unanimity of a flock of rooks settling down onto a field mined with wire worms. "'Always had tea in here in Gerald's time,' said one of the men, staring about him to see if there was any alteration made to the room. "'I don't think you know my daughter, Mrs. Masserine, summed courage to murmur with a nervous glance towards Catherine, who stood at the other end of the wide chimney-piece, 
a noble piece of fine oak carving with huge silver dogs of the Stuart period and the Roxall arms in bold bosses above it. Mouse, looking extremely like her brother, flashed her sapphire eyes like a searchlight over the face and figure of the person in whom she had by instinct divined an antagonist and desired to find a sister-in-law. So glad, she murmured vaguely as she put down her cup and held out her hand with a composite grace all her own. At once charmingly amiable and intolerably insolent. Catherine merely made her a low curtsy and did not put out her hand in return. How sherry and bitters, asked Lady Kenilworth, marking but ignoring the rudeness. Amusing creature, isn't he? Bored to death, I suppose, in India. It would be difficult, I think, for the most stupid person to be bored in India, replied Catherine briefly. Lord Framlingham is not stupid. Lady Kenilworth stared. Then she laughed, as it was so very comical to find Billy's daughter such a person as this. I saw from that bust of Dalou's that she wouldn't be facile, she reflected. Looks as if she thought pumpkins of herself. She's cheeky to me. It will be the worse for her. Catherine was very cold, very pale, very still. The men did not get on with her and soon abandoned the attempt to do so. The ladies, after staring hard, scarcely noticed her or her mother, but chattered amongst themselves like sparrows on a house roof after rain. With swelling heart, she felt their gaze fixed on her. Two of them put up their eyeglasses. She wore a plain silver-coloured woollen gown, but their experienced eye recognised the cut of a famous faiseur, and the natural lines of her form were unusually perfect. Très bien mise, très simple, mais très bien, said a Parisian, Duchess of saint avite quite audibly, gazing at her as if she were some curious piece of carving like the fireplace. Elle n'est pas mal du tout, returned a foreign diplomatist, quite audibly also, as though he were in the stalls of a theatre. Sullen, is she? thought Mouse, toasting one of her pretty feet on the fender. Gives herself airs, does she? That's old Fram's doing, I expect. Ignoring her as an unknown quantity, to be seen to at leisure and annihilated if needful, she turned to her host, who was standing awkwardly behind the brilliant throng. Got my telegram about the bird rooms, she said sharply. She would have spoken more civilly to a hotel keeper. The bird rooms were a set of three rooms, bed, dressing and sitting room, their walls painted with birds and flowers on a pale blue ground, their silk hangings and furniture of corresponding colour and design, and many birds in Chelsea and Battersea, Majolica, Terra di Pipa, and other china and pottery on the tables and cabinets. She did not care a straw about the birds, but they were the warmest, coziest rooms in the house, facing full south, and were detached from observation in a manner which was agreeable and convenient. She had sent a brief dispatch that morning to command their reservation for herself. Country houses were always selected with regard to their conveniences for innocent and unobserved intercourse. The bird rooms were duly assigned to her and Mr. Masserine himself had walked through them that morning to make sure that they were thoroughly warmed, that the writing table was properly furnished, and that the rarest flowers had been gathered for the vases on the table. He, with eagerness, assured her that her word had been law. "'I hope you haven't altered anything there,' she said, taking up her gloves. "'It's very absurd, you know, to put Turkish screens and lamps in an old Tudor room like this.' They've smartened the place up, she said to her friends, looking about her. That open-work cedar wood screen wasn't across that door in Gerald's time, nor those great bronze lamps hanging over there. Where'd you get them, Billy? They look like Santa Sophia. But she did not listen to Billy's reply. She was looking at the mulberry-coloured velvet curtains which replaced in the windows the somewhat shabby and frayed hangings of her cousin's reign. I wish I had come here last year, she said to her discomfited host. You should have touched nothing. A place like this doesn't want Bond Street emptied into it. I don't know what Gerard would say. He'd be dreadfully angry. Masserine thought that Lord Roxall had parted with his right to be angry, but he dared not say so. He murmured that he was sorry, 
whatever there might be that was not suitable, should be removed. Can't you see how wrong it all is? said his tyrant impatiently. He regretfully confessed his utter inability to see it, was grieved that they were incorrect. They should be moved tomorrow. Lady Kenilworth is a purist, said his daughter in clear, cold tones. New people who come into old houses are, of necessity, eclectic. Her father frowned. He did not know what eclectic meant, but he supposed it meant something vulgar. His guest stared. If Billy's daughter were cheeky like this, it would be necessary, she thought, to take her down a peg or two. But she was forced to confess to herself that the daughter of the house did not look like a person whom it would be easy to take down, either one peg or many. Would you like to go to your rooms, ma'am? murmured her hostess when the tea had been drunk and the chatter had ceased for a minute, and the sound of the first dinner gong boomed through the house. My dear woman, replied Mouse, I know the place better than you do, but really, if I shall find Pekin mandarins on oak banisters and Minton plaques on Tudor panels, I shall not have the strength to go up the staircase. Do she mean, murmured Margaret Masserine. She means to be insolent, replied her daughter, and the reply was not in a very low tone. But Lady Kenilworth was, or pretended to be out of hearing, going out of the library with two of her special friends, and calling on others to come with her and see what the vandals had done. The gong was booming loudly. William Masserine was inexpressibly mortified, the more keenly so because if he had listened to Prince Chris two years before, he would not have had Bond Street and the Rue de Rivoli emptied into a beautiful, hoary, sombre old Tudor house. Mouse felt no qualms whatever at seeing the new people in the old house. She had been able to understand why Roxall could not himself come with her. But some people were so whimsical and faddish and sentimental. They spoiled their own lives and bothered those of others. She thought it was good fun to see William Masserine in the old Tudor dining hall and his wife in the beautiful oval Italian drawing room. Roxall would not have seen the fun of it, but men are so slow to catch a joke. They are so deliciously ridiculous and incongruous, she said to one of her companions. She had brought a rattling good lot with her, smart women and cheery men, who could ride to hounds all day and play back all night, or run twenty miles to see an otter worry and be as fresh as paint next morning. People with blue blood in their veins and good old names, and much personal beauty and strength, and much natural health and intelligence, but who by choice led a kind of life beside which that of an ape is intellectual, and that of an amoeba is useful. People who are very good-natured and horribly cruel, who could no more live without excitement than without cigarettes, who were never still unless their doctor gave them morphia, who went to Iceland for a fortnight and to Africa for a month, who never dined in their own homes except when they gave a dinner party, who could not endure solitude for ten minutes, who went anywhere to be amused, who read nothing except telegrams, and who had only two cares in life, money and their livers. They came down to Vale Royal to be amused, to eat well, to chatter amongst themselves as if they were on a desert island, to carry on their flirtations, their meetings, their intrigues, and to arrange the pastimes of their days and nights precisely as they pleased, without the slightest reference to those who entertained them. What would you like to do tomorrow, their host had ventured to say to one of them, and the guest had replied, Oh, pray don't bother, we're going somewhere, but I forget where. They had brought a roulette wheel with them and cards and counters, for their leader knew by experience that the evenings without such resources were apt to be dull at Vale Royal. William Masserine, indeed, had provided forms of entertainment, such as were unattainable by the limited means of the Roxall family. He had caused admirable musicians, good singers, even a choice little troupe of foreign comedians to be brought down for this famous week, in which the azure eyes of his divinity smiled upon him under his own roof-tree, but there was one diversion which he considered superior in its attractions to anything which tenors and sopranos, viols and violins, or even Palais Royal players could give her, and that diversion she took without asking the permission of anybody. There was a withdrawing room at Vale Royal, which was always known as the Italian room, because some Venetian artist of no great fame 
but of much graceful talent, had painted ceiling and walls, as was proven by old entries in account books of the years 1640 to 50, contained in the monument room of the Roxalls. In the third night after their arrival, when they were all in this Italian room, after a short performance by the Parisian comedians, a long table of ebony and ivory was unceremoniously cleared of the various objects of art which had been placed on it, and the roulette wheel was enthroned there instead by the hands of Lady Kenilworth herself, and the little ball was set off on its momentous gyrations. She was looking more than ever like a lovely flower, with a turquoise collar round her throat, and real forget-me-nots fastened by diamonds in her hair. For some minutes, William Masserine, who had slept through the French comedy, and was still drowsy, did not become sensible of what was taking place in his drawing-room. But when the shouts and laughter of the merry gamblers reached his ear, and he realised with difficulty what was taking place, a heavy frown, such as Kerosene City had learned to dread, stole on his brows, and a startled horror opened wide his eyes. Play? Play under his roof? All his Protestant and Puritan soul awoke. A large portion of his earliest gains had been made by the miners and navvies and cowboys who had gathered to stake their dollars in the back den of his shop in Kerosene City, and later on he had made millions by his ownership of private hells in larger towns of the United States and the very thought of gambling was odious to him, because he felt that these were portions of his past on which no light must ever shine. He felt that he owed it to the conscience which he had acquired with his London clothes and his English horses to prohibit all kinds of play, however innocent, in his own drawing rooms. He crossed the room and, nervously approaching the leader of the band, ventured to murmur close to her ivory shoulder, you never said you meant to play, Lady Kenilworth. You can't have any play. I can't indeed. In my house. His tone was timid and imploring. He was frightened at his own temerity and grew grey with terror as he spoke. She turned her head and transfixed him with the imperious challenge of her glance. What are you talking about, my good man? She said in her clearest and unkindness tone. It is not your house when I'm in it. But I cannot allow play, he murmured with a gasp. It's against my principles. Don't talk rot, Billy, she cried with impatience. Who cares about your principles? Keep them for the hustings. Then she turned the ivory shoulder on him again, and amidst the vociferous laughter of the circle of players, William Masserine, feeling that he had made a fool of himself, hastily and humbly retreated. The merriment pealed in louder ecstasy up to the beautiful painted ceiling as she cried after the retreating figure, You go to bed, Billy, go to bed, or we shan't let you dine with us tomorrow night. You're rather rough on the poor beast, Lady Kenny, said one of the players who was next to her. Billy's like a Cairo donkey. He must feel the goad and be gagged, replied Mouse, sweeping her counters together with a rapacious grace, like a hawk's circling flight. Then the little ball ran about in its momentous gyrations and the counters changed hands and the game went on all the giddier, all the merrier, because Billy thought it improper. Catherine rose from her seat by the pianoforte and came to her father's side. Indignation shone in her lustrous eyes while a flash of pain, of shame and of anger burned on her cheeks. Father, oh father, she said in a low, intense murmur, send them away. They insult you every hour, every moment. Why do you endure it? Turn them all out tomorrow morning. Mind your own business. Do I want any lessons from you, damn you? said Masserine in a sullen whisper, more infuriated by her perspicuity than by the facts on which her appeal to him was based. His daughter shrank a little, like a high-spirited animal unjustly beaten. Not from fear, but from wounded pride and mute disgust, she went back to the pianoforte and opened the book of Lohengrin. He threw himself heavily into an armchair and took up an album of Karen Dash drawings and bent over it, not seeing a line of the sketches and not being able to read a line of the jests appended to them. All he saw was that lovely figure down there at the roulette table with the forget-me-nots in her glittering hair 
and at her snowy bosom and the turquoise collar round her throat. Billy! No one had ever called him Billy since the time when he had been a cowboy, getting up in the dark in bitter winter mornings to pitchfork the dung out of the stalls and chop the great swedes and mangolds and break the ice in the drinking trough. Never in all her life had his wife ever dared to call him Billy. He knew the name made him ridiculous. He knew that he was the object of all that ringing laughter. He knew that he was made absurd, contemptible, odious. But he would not allow his daughter, nor would he allow any other person to say so. He was hypnotised by that fair patrician who threw the mud in his face. The mud smelt as sweet to him as roses. It was only her pretty, airy, nonchalant way, the way she had de par la grâce de Dieu, which became her so well, which was part and parcel of her, which was a mark of grace like her delicate nostrils and her arched instep. When she had tired of her roulette, it irritated her extremely to see the large, gorgeous form of Mrs. Massarine dozing on a couch and waking up with difficulty from dreams, no doubt of cowslip meadows, and patient cows whisking their tails over the dew, and the erect figure of her daughter sitting beside the grand piano and turning over the leaves of musical scores. "'Why don't you send your women to bed, Billy?' she said to him very crossly. "'It fidgets one to see them eternally sitting there, like the horse guards in their saddles at Whitehall. "'Politeness? Oh, is it meant for politeness? Well, I will give them a dispensation, then. Do tell them to go to bed.' I'm sure good creatures like those have lots of prayers to say before they go to bye-bye. Why don't you and your mother go to your rooms? We are all of us very late people, she said directly as she passed Catherine Masserine. You are my parents' guest, Lady Kenilworth. I endeavour not to forget it, was the reply. What does she mean by that? her guest wondered. She thought she meant some covert rebuke. She did not at all like the steady, contemptuous gaze of this young woman's tranquil eyes. "'Oh, my dear, how dreadfully old-fashioned and formal you are!' she cried, with an impatient little laugh, and the daughter of the house thought her familiarity more odious than her rudeness. She perceived the impression she made on the young woman whom she meant to marry Ronald. "'You see, I feel quite at home here,' she added by way of explanation. "'Of course you know it was my cousin's house.' I wonder you like to come to it, said Catherine, as she paused. It must be painful to see it in the hands of strangers. And those strangers, common people. How droll you are, cried Mouse with another little laugh. I'm sure we shall be great friends when we come to know each other well. Catherine was silent, and Mouse, slightly disconcerted, bade her a brief good night, and took her own way to the bird rooms. For once in her life, she had met a person whom she did not understand. Ronald shall marry her, but I shall always hate her, she thought, as she went to the bird rooms. However, everybody always hates their sisters-in-law, whoever they may be. The young woman seemed intolerably insolent to her, so cold, so grave, so visibly disapproving herself. It was quite insupportable to have Billy's daughter giving herself grand airs like a tragedian at the Francais. But for her intention to make Ronald marry the Masserine fortune, she would have expressed her surprise and offence in unequivocal terms. Really, these new people are too absurd, she thought, as her maid disrobed her whilst the chimes of the clock tower rung in the fourth hour of the morning. Too infinitely absurd. They must know that we don't come to their houses to see them, and yet they will stay in their drawing rooms like so many figures of Tussaud. It is really too obtuse and ridiculous. She was, however, too sleepy to reflect longer on their stolid obstinacy, or to decide how she should, on the morrow, best teach them their place. End of section 14